Welcome to Cobalt Fairy YouTube channel. If you like our channel, please subscribe and make sure to click on the bell icon so that you won't miss any future audiobooks we'll upload for free each week on YouTube. The Highlander's Alluring Spy by Eloise Madigan Chapter 1 The Meeting There was no male heir to the Elphinstone estate. Lady Magnolia Winterbourne, daughter of the Earl, was more acutely aware of this with every passing day. She had never married and never birthed children, and at six and twenty, the marriageable age had likely passed. Magnolia had no male cousins, no brothers, no nephews, nobody to take the burden from her shoulders. Magnolia felt the pressure of the airship more heavily than any boy in her position would. Though she would not change her service and loyalty to the crown for anything, she had to concede to a certain amount of pressure to prove herself. That was why she was struggling not to snap at her coach driver to hurry, as the cab trundled along the road at a snail's pace. She must reach the meeting hall, and soon, or it would be disastrous for the reputation of Elphinstone and the Winterbourne name. The sun seemed to be speeding across the sky, each passing minute, admonishing her as it reached its peak. I cannot believe that this would happen today of all days. Can't this carriage go any faster? It was no fault of the driver that she was late, but her own, she had been waylaid in her visit to her childhood friend and her new son. Magnolia had known that the meeting was at noon, but she'd foolishly let cooing over the babe take up most of her morning, and now she was going to be late. Timothy, is there any way? The old mares are trotting as fast as they can, my lady. Tim assured her. We'll make it, dinna ye worry. Trust me. She'd known Tim, a Scottish transplant who held firmly onto his accent, since she was born. He'd been her mother's favourite driver, and now he was Magnolia's, too. She did trust him, but Magnolia worried anyway. She should never have been invited to this meeting at all. Her father's reputation was already on the ropes, thanks to his insistence on her induction into the order. Yes, she'd proven herself finally, but this was a step up. A secret meeting, even within their secret society. I cannot believe that I would be invited to such a thing. Father claims it was the Marquis' idea rather than his own, too. Magnolia had served in many roles since the death of her mother. She was a member of the Order, a dutiful daughter, and now the acting Countess. Some might say it was too much for a young maiden like her. Many did speak so, in not so subtle whispers behind her back. Let them whisper, though. Magnolia did not care for their whispers, just as her mother had always taught. They may say what they will, out of jealousy or suspicion, but it does not change who I am or what I am doing. My wish is to make my father proud, and show my loyalty to the crown and my country. Nothing more. Now, if only the horses could go faster. Daniel Winterbourne had sported the title of Earl of Elphinstone for four and thirty years, ever since his fifteenth birthday. Since that day, he had served as one of the crown's most loyal servants, taking pride in his rank and his heritage in a way that benefited his station most greatly. The Winterbourne name was discussed in the courts with high esteem. Lord Winterbourne's services were more profound than merely land ownership and noble duties. Though few knew of it, and those who did rarely spoke of it, he was a critical member of the Royal Order of the Red Blossom. His duties encapsulated many covert missions, but he was especially well known for his work against the threat of the Scots. The realm existed in a time of peace now, but Daniel had seen too much war to ever truly relax. The Scots and the English, when they attacked one another, were merciless. It is an ugly thing. I pray from my heart and in the name of my late wife that I should never see such a conflict again. I hope to God it is avoidable. He had given everything to the crown, risking life and limb, and love, too. For his sacrifices, he had returned with more successful missions than any other member of the order. It was the central pride of his heart, and he would not change it for the world. His work had not come without great personal cost, however. As was his duty, 
he married at the age of sixteen to the daughter of a local lord. The girl was a few years older than him, and while it was not a love match, he had grown to love her deeply. The esteemed Lady Eleanor, Countess of Elphinstone, had been a wife as beautiful as she was dutiful. Though the two knew nothing of each other, they became fast friends. I still do not know who was more nervous, Eleanor or me. Neither of us had so much as courted another before, and here we were, expected to be married. But married we were nonetheless, and we found happiness. Love. Many cannot say the same. When Daniel joined the order, he had trusted in Eleanor when he had no other confidant. She had steadfastly kept his secrets, and smoothed the running of the estate in his absence. She was a delicate woman, though, and as the years passed without children, and his absences grew longer, whispers started at court. And how they loved their whispers. They have not changed. They would claim she was barren. That I was uninterested in my wife. That we were cursed. They said all sorts, didn't they, Eleanor? It was a way he often spent his spare time, talking to his beloved late wife in his mind. He knew she could hear him. Sometimes, he even imagined her responses. Eleanor had responded then and would respond now in the same way. Let them whisper if they will. Why should we waste our care on what they have to say? At least this means they find us interesting compared to their lives of boredom. Daniel was nineteen when his son was born but the boy passed a day later before he even had a chance to be named. Eleanor was devastated but determined to provide her husband with an heir. She became pregnant thrice more over the following years before she was able to carry a child to term. Daniel had not known of her last pregnancy, until he returned from a mission, aged twenty-three, to find a six-month-old daughter waiting for him. Daniel paced back and forth, remembering the moment he'd seen the baby for the first time. His heart had shattered into a million pieces that had reformed into an organ that beat only for her. He smiled. His daughter, their daughter, had grown much since then, looking devastatingly like Helena. You'd be so proud of her, and what she has grown to accomplish, he assured his wife. Eleanor survived their daughter's birth, but it became apparent then that there would be no sons, as the doctors informed her that she could bear children no more. It is every man's wish to teach his son and heir, but though Daniel could not hide his disappointment, his heart was soon lost to this small replica of her blonde-haired, blue-eyed mother. She was named Magnolia, for the gentle white blossoms Eleanor adored so much, and she breathed new life into Elphinstone. And everyone adored her right away. She was our daughter, but she was a gift to all of us. He loved his daughter dearly, but those first few years had been especially precious. He thought of her little face and smiled. The sweetest babe in the world. Pretty and quiet and perfect. I am so glad that, at least, you got to spend those moments with her. I am pleased that she has memories of you. Magnolia had grown astute, kind and as beautiful as her mother. She was a loyal daughter, tending to her mother and obeying her father in every word. She loved fiercely and had a quick wit about her, that made her popular with the young men at social events, though she demurely turned each away. At the age of fourteen, she confided in Daniel that she wished never to marry. Shocked, he had questioned her and been astounded by the shrewdness of her answer. Well, father, it is quite simple. Why should I marry and allow some lesser noble to take Elphinstone from our name, when the Winterbourne bloodline has sustained it and served the crown for generations? Proud but troubled, Daniel had spoken with Eleanor, who promised to converse with their daughter on the topic. She did, though Daniel never heard the result, he was told that it was a matter between women, not an earl's affair. And you never did tell me what you told her, my darling. She continues to turn away suitors, even now. Six and twenty and she cares little for matters of marriage. She's such an unusual child. Shortly after, Eleanor contracted scrofula, while Daniel was once again away on service. Mercury treatment did not work as hoped, and young Magnolia had been the only one present at her mother's death. 
Daniel stopped in his reminiscing for a moment, the pain still lancing through him like a fresh wound even all these years later. It felt like a physical hurt, making him flinch against it. My Eleanor. Sometimes I still expect to come home and see your darling face. When I walk in to see your empty chair, my heart breaks all over again. But at least Magnolia is strong. More robust than me, I think. She had only been fifteen, just as young as Daniel had been at the demise of his own father. Magnolia had borne her grief as well as any son, even though her father was still away. She had gone so far as to take it upon herself to pen the letter that had brought him the terrible news. She claimed that it was simply not right for anyone else to tell him. When he returned, broken and lost and grieving, Magnolia told him that she would serve as Countess now, and do her best to fulfill her mother's responsibilities. And she was quite determined, too. She was barely more than a child, but she slipped into your role with ease, even in her state of mourning. I am the most blessed father in England. Magnolia excelled in her education and in her duties. She learned by her father's side, and her loyalty toward and knowledge of the workings of the crown only grew. As she matured, she continued to turn away every suitor, and Daniel began to consider something unheard of for a daughter. He argued much with his cohort about it, but he refused to back down. Magnolia was placed under many tests of loyalty and ability, without her knowledge. She passed every single one with ease, impressing everyone involved, and making her father gratified beyond belief. She performed so well that, eventually, an agreement was reached. At the age of 18, Magnolia Winterbourne was inducted into the Royal Order of the Red Blossom. Her projects over almost nine years of service had been comparatively small. Still, she had worked diligently and efficiently and gained the trust of the organization. She was the first woman to do so, but she did not let that swell her sense of self-importance. Well, father, I may be a woman, but I am your daughter, and a servant of the crown before that. Why, in the future, I believe that many women will be permitted to serve and help England to thrive. She told him. Daniel had not thought of, and still could not think, of a single reason to refute her. She knew of her many naysayers, but she simply ignored them. She was determined to follow in the steps of her father, and give everything she had to the country she loved. Magnolia had been genuinely committed throughout her whole adult life, and Daniel wanted to reward that. That was why he had now placed his reputation on the line. The Marquis had first suggested her name, but Daniel had given everything to make sure the plan was followed through. He had spoken against her many detractors to convince their leaders that Magnolia was the correct choice for the mission ahead. It was top secret, limited knowledge even within the order. She was young, she was a woman, she had never been on such an important mission before. All of this was true, but Daniel knew she would not fail. I staked everything on it, my darling. But I would do it again, for her. For you. She is my daughter, but she does you credit most of all. Not that the Viscount or his friends would agree to that. The Viscount of Mitred, Lord Peter Cole, was particularly virulent against the idea of Magnolia being brought into the fold. He claimed it was because she was a woman, or because she was young or inexperienced, but Daniel knew better. Cole had three reasons for his obsession with her failure. The first was that Magnolia had rejected his suit only a year previously. The second, and most pressing, was his preoccupation with proving himself to the crown. Third and final was the man's enduring hatred of the Scots, and fixation on showing personal and national superiority over them. He was not the only one. James Reed, Earl of Westenford, and Lord Paul Jenkins had also been strong detractors of his daughter. By no coincidence, they were also two of the suitors Magnolia had turned away. Jenkins would do anything to prove himself to the crown. He longs to get away from his Welsh heritage and establish himself as English as any of us. I know he holds anger towards our daughter even now. And as for Reed, his pride would lead him to do anything. I shudder to think of the revenge he's plotting in his small mind, even if he never acts upon it. 
The arguing had been bitter, but Daniel and the Marquis had won out. Now he paced nervously before the doors of the meeting room, the three privileged men already inside waiting for him. Or, more accurately, waiting for Magnolia. He glanced anxiously at his pocket watch. She was not yet late, but it would reflect poorly on him if his daughter was delayed after such an argument. More importantly, it would reflect poorly on her. He stared out along the hallway, as if he could see her. He silently urged her to hurry to avoid the scorn of lesser men on their house, and, more critically, on her own admirable self. Timothy hadn't even the time to dismount and open the door for her, when Magnolia sprinted out of the carriage, her braided hair bouncing against her back. She hurried to the court steps, waving behind her in a gesture of thanks. She was too conscious that she was still in her day dress rather than court clothes, but there had been no time to change between Lizzie's house and now. She was thankful that she'd chosen a well-bodiced gown for her trip, so she would not look out of place. Well, no more out of place than usual, anyway. Dress restrictions bothered her, but she also was more than aware of their importance at court. As a woman, she needed to prove herself more than anyone. Both for her own sake and for her beloved father. She hurried up the marble steps, exchanging a friendly smile with the young doorman who winked at her on the way past. Her flat shoes clicked on the tiled floor, and her skirt hindered her from moving faster. She rather reminded herself of a horse galloping to a goal but held back by its bridle. Her father waited at the end of the third hallway, and the relief that echoed from his face as he saw her approach was more than palpable. I'm sorry that I am late, father. She told him, with a little polite curtsy. Lord Winterbourne did not expect such formality in his address with his daughter. Still, Magnolia wanted to do everything correctly, when she knew that today she would prove herself to the crown. Forgive me. Worry not, daughter. Her father said with the gentle, proud smile she loved so much. Your arrival is perfectly timely. Come, the gentlemen await. She followed, keeping her expression clear and her chin high even, as the nerves threatened to overwhelm her. She held herself steady even as she noticed the men in the room, and could barely believe that she was in their presence, in a closed meeting such as this. Duke Barton and Marquis Conley were the leaders of the order. The former was in his sixties, with salt and pepper hair and a severe, square jaw. The latter was a round, cheerful man who had blonde curls almost as light as his official white wig. Despite looking like polar opposites, both men were equally kind and equally merciless when it came time to protect the crown. I do like these men, but they do make me exceedingly nervous. What could such powerful men possibly want with the likes of me? What can I do for them? Will I do my father's name justice? Her father's counterpart in the order, the Viscount of Mitred, was the only other man in the room. He was tall and slender with brown hair and spectacles, younger than the other men but cunning in a way that had shot him through the order's ranks. Magnolia was intimidated by all of them, even knowing of their friendliness and courtesy. Still, she did not let it show at all as her father guided her to the table. The Duke, the Marquis, and the Viscount all stood as Magnolia's father held out her chair. Thank you, father, she said politely, sitting. When she did, the four men sat too. It was a synchronized movement, showing they were all used to acting as one, and it made Magnolia even more nervous. Can I fit here? I am so different already, and they are already so used to each other. She didn't have much time to ponder, though, as the Duke started his briefing immediately. There have been rumors. The Duke said in his gravelly voice. Rumours that the Scots are gathering and preparing for an ambush. Magnolia started suddenly, shock filling her at the very idea. But I thought we were in a time of peace? All eyes turned to her, and Lord Cole spoke in a gentle tone. There was warmth in it, and she was pleased he did not hold her rejection against her. My dear lady, I know you have not been educated in warfare, but I do assure you that the Duke knows his business. There was a pause. Magnolia felt somewhat condescended to, despite his kindness, 
but she did not speak up. It would not do to let her emotions cloud her judgment now. The Duke spoke to her with a deferential nod. That is correct, Lady Winterbourne, he said. Your astuteness does your father credit. However, peace is fleeting, and if the Scots attack and we are unprepared, it could be deadly. The Marquis nodded. Quite. Which is why we must send one of our agents to retrieve information. We know from past work that they will likely gather around the laird of the McFoyle clan. We need someone to go into his castle and find out what they are planning. Lord Cole straightened in his chair. Your Grace, I know of Naha Ravin. I would be happy to. Which is why? The Duke's words cut across him. Lord Winterbourne has invited his daughter here today. We believe that you, my dear, could be instrumental in preventing this new war before it begins. Magnolia took a moment to understand precisely what the Duke had just said. Forgive me, but... Me? Why not Lord Reed? Lord Jenkins? Or here, the Viscount himself has just offered. The Duke smiled and opened his mouth to answer her. Your Grace, I must object. Lord Cole interrupted. Lady Winterbourne is no doubt extremely skilled and talented, but we must not forget ourselves. She is a woman still, no matter her wit, and unwed at that. Should we risk her safety in such an endeavor? The Scots are barbaric. Magnolia knew that he was only attempting to protect her, but she felt a shudder of irritation, nonetheless. Keeping her face smooth, she glanced at him and said, Why, my lord, is not our queen an unwed woman? An expression passed Lord Cole's face too quickly for Magnolia to process, but he nodded and said, in that same polite tone. Indeed. But her divine majesty is an exception to many rules, while you are the daughter of our most loyal earl, and a proven agent in her own right. The Marquis finished mildly. And, therefore, an excellent candidate for this role. Reed and Jenkins are talented in their ways, but they are too hot-headed for this mission. Magnolia is the one who will do it. Both Cole and Magnolia were silent for a moment, then Cole held out his hands in defeat. Of course. I simply wish what is best for the lady. You are very kind, Lord Cole. Magnolia told him. It was true. He may be misguided but it still warmed her heart that he would try to protect her in such a way. Indeed. Most kind. Magnolia's father agreed. For some reason, he sounded somewhat amused. My Lord Marquis, if you would continue? Marquis Conley smiled and addressed Magnolia. The Laird of McFoyle has a young daughter. He has been searching for someone to care for her since the death of his wife. My lady, if she would could infiltrate the castle as a nanny. It would make her inconspicuous, and we have been presented with a cover story that cannot be questioned. When Magnolia took a long moment to answer, the Marquis turned to her father and added, What say you, Lord Winterbourne? I am entirely in support of the idea. I have no doubt of my daughter's capabilities or loyalties. Her father said with a nod. Though I defer to her in the final decision. Magnolia felt a surge of almost overwhelming excitement at the idea. Such a critical mission, and for her? A chance to serve the crown in full and prove my detractors wrong at last. However, she spoke with caution as she answered. I am flattered, my lords, your grace, but... Even if I am to use an alias in Scotland, shan't it seem suspicious here in court, that my esteemed father would send his only heir as a nanny? The Marquis grinned. Oh, you are a clever one. But we have thought of all of that. Tell her, Daniel. Winterbourne smiled at the girl. My cousin, your Aunt Mary, is with child. He informed her. And she assures me that she expects a son. Assuming this is true, then the boy would be my heir. Legally. Magnolia could not tell if this was a ruse. Assuming that it was not, she was not entirely sure how to feel about the news. 
If Aunt Mary was really with child, then that was wonderful news, of course. Yes, it would mean giving up the airship if the baby was a boy, but a new family member was a blessing. So why do I feel so uncertain about it? Am I so uncertain of myself? Of my place? Do I not know who I am, regardless of my duty? That thought unsettled her more than she would like, and so she turned her focus once more to the mission. She was silent for a long moment, all eyes on her. When she spoke, it was slow and considered. Of course, my first duties are to my father and to the crown. How would this project be organized? The duke glanced at the marquis, who fixed his glasses and recited. You will apply for, and hopefully be accepted for, the job. You will send one letter to your father, in code, to inform him you have been accepted. It will be under a false name. He glanced at the parchment in front of him. You will live with the laird as his daughter's new nanny, for a month of at least four weeks from the moment of hiring. After the month is complete, you will submit a report, and you will return home while the matter is dealt with by our men. She nodded, and the Marquis continued. You may flee if discovered, but if you are caught, you will deny any knowledge of the order or the workings of the crown. Anything urgent must be reported immediately. You will leave in two days and have that much time to settle your affairs, and gather what you need to leave. Lord Cole looked worried. If they catch her, she could be hanged. The Scots are savages. Her pretty face won't save her, nor will her esteemed and genteel manners. You are risking Lord Winterbourne's only child. Much better that you dispense with the nanny plan altogether, and send in an experienced agent. Magnolia hesitated at the thought. Is that true, father? I could be hanged? Lord Winterbourne's face was grave. Yes. I will not lie to you, daughter, this is dangerous. You are to have no contact with your family, or the organization, for at least the first month. You will be entirely on your own. Nobody can help you. But, the Duke added, if you do this for us, the Crown will personally owe you its gratitude. As will I, my lady, and all members of the Order of the Red Blossom. She paused again mulling it all over in her mind. Such a task. Such an honor. Such an overwhelming responsibility. Am I truly ready for this? Am I prepared to leave my friends, my family, everything I know behind and travel into the great unknown? Two days? Magnolia asked. And no more. The Marquis confirmed. It's a long journey up north, and we need to start soon. You will use an alias. As long as you are in Scotland, you will hold no title but that of the Nanny Magnolia Limor. Your history will mean nothing. She swallowed, feeling her nerves rise as her eyes met his. She could feel them all looking at her. The Duke, the Marquis, Lord Cole. And her father. All focus was on the girl as the Duke said. So, dear Magnolia. What do you say? Chapter 2 The Journey I cannot believe you're going all the way to Scotland to seek employment, Magnolia. Lizzie said, for what must have been the thirtieth time during this visit. To be a nanny, no less. Aren't there children enough in England to keep you entertained? Look, there's one on your knee now. Magnolia bounced the baby on her lap, a soft smile on her face as she did so. Little John had been named at his baptism today, and Magnolia was eternally honored to have been chosen as godmother. It did, however, make leaving all the harder. Lizzie, I simply must. She told her friend. I have barely seen anything of the world. If I am not to inherit Elphinstone after all, then why should I not see some of the world? But Scotland, Magnolia. They are barbarians up in those parts. Lizzie leaned forward and lowered their voice. I hear they don't even bother with real marriages. They steal women from their beds and get them with child, so that the poor woman is bound to them. That's nonsense. Magnolia said sharply, though secretly she was unsure. 
She knew a little about Scottish customs, but the further north, the less in-depth her knowledge. Lizzie was a gossip, but she always had a way of making Magnolia think twice about things. What do I really know about the Scottish Highlanders? We are in a time of peace, but we have fought wars a plenty. My father and the Order dedicate much of their time defending our borders from their spies. What am I getting myself into? But it did not matter, not really. Magnolia looked down at the baby in her arms, her little godson, and brushed his wispy dark hair gently. I will go regardless. To protect you, John, and to please my father, and to serve our crown. I will ensure you and all like you grow up in a country of safety and peace. She could not speak of any of this to Lizzie, of course. Instead, she continued with her disapproving correction, as though she really knew of what she spoke. The Scots are human, just like you or I. They may be less civilized in some respects, but I will be perfectly safe at the home of the respected laird. Unless he has me hanged as a spy, of course. You will write, though? Lizzie asked, as Magnolia reluctantly handed John back to her. You will keep in touch? I shall endeavor to do so. She promised, even though she knew her opportunities would be minimal. Do not worry. Focus on your husband and your son. I will write as soon as I am able. She buttoned her coat. I must go now, I have many preparations to see to, and very little time in which to make them. Take care of yourself, Lizzie. The two women embraced carefully so as not to squash the infant, and then Magnolia headed for the door. She paused in the doorway as Lizzie called her name once more, turning her head. Lizzie looked hesitant as she said. Why do I feel like I shall never see you home again? Magnolia shook her head and forced a smile, though it felt like Lizzie had dropped a stone into her gut. You worry too much. She told her. Be safe. And then she walked out, leaving her friend and the baby behind. Two days was too short a time for a father to have to say goodbye to his daughter, but the day of her leaving arrived regardless. He journeyed north with her, as far as Edinburgh, where he would meet with one of his liaisons after he passed her onto the coach to the Highlands. They sat together in a small tea shop, sipping at their cups, and Daniel found himself at a complete loss of words. His daughter sat there in her travelling clothes, looking calmer than he ever remembered. Is this an act? Is she trying so hard to make sure she does not leave me upset? Would that I could read her mind and see her worries for myself. Would that I could take on this burden for her. Magnolia. He said after a reasonably long stretch of silence had passed. My dear daughter. I hope you know that you are still free to change your mind. If you felt at all pressured into this, I do not wish. I don't feel pressured, father. Magnolia replied. She had the same decisive smile on her face, that Eleanor had worn whenever she decided an argument was won. I know my duty as well as you. Will you please relax? For my sake, if nothing else? Daniel smiled. My brave little girl, he said. Though not so little any more. Have I done right by you, involving you in all of this? Should I have kept you from the order and valued your safety more? She leaned over the table and took his hand in her own. Father, she said firmly, you have always done right by me. Since mother died, you have served as mother and father both. You have trained me, and educated me, and allowed me freedoms that many women of my rank could never dream. Never doubt yourself on my behalf. Daniel felt a swell of pride and love threatened to overwhelm him, and tears pricked at his eyes. Promise me, child, that you will do everything in your power to remain safe. I love you, father. She told him earnestly. I love my country. I love the crown. I will return with the information we need to help our country protect itself. He watched her, the passion and enthusiasm and seriousness in her expression, and had never been so gratified. Or so worried. That isn't what I asked. Magnolia, he thought but did not say. After all, 
it was ye who had raised her this way, country before self, crown above all. Later, they walked together through the streets of Edinburgh, and Daniel marvelled, as he always did, over how similar it was to home but with a different flavour. It was a city indeed, not all that different from any in England except, of course, London. The Scottishness was here, in the flags that flew and the way they spoke, but it was similar enough to feel comfortable. Isn't it amazing, father, how everything changed at the border? Magnolia asked him, looking around with a half-smile on her face. Daniel gave her a questioning look. How is it that she sees something so different from what I see? It seemed that this was always the case, ever since Magnolia was a child. She'd always had a unique take on otherwise simple ideas. She spoke the kind of thought processes that, if she were a man, would have her lauded as a great philosopher. He remembered the first time this had stood out to him, and made him realize how different his daughter really was, compared to other girls of her age and time. Father, mother. She'd once asked them both over dinner, aged just nine. When my brother died before I was born, did he go to heaven? He was not baptized. He told her, truthfully, a sad note in his tone now. It was something that often worried him, deep in his soul. I do not know. We did not even have the chance to name him. Magnolia had tilted her head and said, I think he is there, with all the others who were never born. After all, God already knew the name of his heart, even if we didn't yet. Eleanor had burst into tears and embraced her, and Daniel had never known such love as he felt for his clever little daughter at that moment. Back in the present, Daniel asked. Different in what way? My dear? Magnolia gestured vaguely to the air. Surely you can see it too, father. The grass seemed more alive the second we crossed. Greener, somehow. I suppose it is all the rain they get here in the north. Even this city, which isn't all that different, there's something odd in the air, isn't there? Daniel nodded slightly. He couldn't deny that. I suppose so. You seem to feel it much more intensely than I do, though. She shrugged. Maybe. Is it so? Strange as all of this up in the Highlands, too? No. It's like nothing you've ever seen. I don't even know how to begin to prepare you. But all Daniel said was. It's different up north. Magnolia just nodded, smiled trustingly at him, and took his arm. They walked together like that until they reached the carriage stop. Magnolia embraced her father tightly before she boarded. Do not worry, father. I will be quite all right. I know you will. Danielle told her. He helped her on board then kissed her cheek through the open window. Then he stood back, and with a final wave, the carriage took his daughter from him, away up to the wild north and the unknown. He watched the horses trot away with the carriage until it turned a corner, and then he could see no trace of it anymore. It was as though it, and Magnolia, had never been here at all. As a lord, he could not be more pleased with the opportunity his child had been offered and accepted. As a father, though, he could not be more afraid. The journey from Scotland's civilized capital to its wild north, took longer than even the one from home to Edinburgh. Magnolia began to wonder if she would ride in this carriage for eternity. They stopped nightly for rest and refreshment at whatever inn they could find, but the further north they travelled, the sparser the inns became. She noticed the change, just as she'd seen it when they had crossed the English-Scottish border, when they left what she knew as civilization behind. Extraordinary, Magnolia thought to herself as she watched, entranced, I would never have imagined a place such as this. The grass grew wilder, the birds sang louder. As they trundled along a hillside road, Magnolia could see nothing but Scottish mist for miles around. The drizzly fog gave the whole world an ethereal quality, which both unsettled and excited her. On the days when the mists were less thick, or when they travelled at a lower dip, the view outside the window was spectacular. It did rain a lot, more than she was used to, but when the rains finished, they just seemed to have enhanced the landscape rather than diminish it. 
The trees were taller than any magnolia could remember seeing before in her life, towering over them like towers or castles. Once, when they traveled directly through a forest, the dense pines seemed to completely block out the sun. It is like an illustration from a manuscript of children's fairy stories. Like an evil witch or a clever pixie could jump out of the darkness at any moment, and spirit me away forever. Magnolia shivered at the thought, and though, of course, she did not believe in such things, she retreated from the window until the forest had passed. When they passed farmland, even the animals seemed different. The sheep were sheep, though they appeared to frolic more here than on the farms in England. The cows she spied, though, were like creatures she had never imagined. They were not the standard dairy cows and bull studs she knew, but rather another beast altogether. They were roughly the shape of a cow, and their size too, but they had broader shoulders, longer horns, and perhaps most strangely, they were covered in thick, shaggy brown hair. The first time she saw them, she didn't even realize that they were cows at all. They had stopped for the night at a small cottage. She and the driver were eating together out in the garden when she pointed to the animals in the field across from them. What kind of beast is that? She asked. I have never seen its like. The driver, a hardy Scotsman in his fifties, burst into laughter. That's a Highland coo, lass, he said. That's what coos look like up in these parts. She'd spent enough time with him now that she understood that he meant Highland cow, but it seemed so strange to her that these creatures should be the same as the farm animals back home, or even further south. On pleasant days, she'd spy flowers she'd never seen before in her life, and sometimes the driver would stop so she could pick them. She was entranced by one she'd never seen, a strange spiky plant with a brilliant purple flower that displayed as thousands of little hairs on top. When she pointed it out to him, he simply laughed, though not unkindly. That is near flower, miss. It's just a weed. But it's so beautiful, she said surprised. The driver shrugged, and she moved deeper into the field, her skirt catching on the high grass as she walked past, the smell of the fresh air almost too sweet in her lungs. She knelt next to it and carefully reached out a finger to brush the tiny violet petals. Och, Dinny. The driver started, obviously alarmed. Ouch! She exclaimed, withdrawing her hand in surprise. The petals were prickly. It hadn't hurt so much as surprised her, the leaves had looked so delicate. Are ye hurt? The driver asked her. No, not at all. She said, shaking her stinging hand. She covered her hand with the cloth from a layer of her skirt, and reached out again, carefully plucking the flower. I still think it's beautiful. What is it? He chuckled. It's a thistle, me lady. The National Flower of Scotland. A thistle. She mused. She tucked the little flower into her bodice, and together they headed back to the carriage. I wonder if the laird of Clan Macfoyle will be as prickly as this flower? Or as easy to tame in the end? Somehow, she doubted the latter very much. As the carriage trundled away from the wild field, she couldn't help but think the same thought to herself over and over again. Would this end with her triumphantly returning home with the information the crown needed from her? Or would she get stung, and this time not so lightly? Chapter 3 The Hiring Daddy Elaine shrieked as she found him again, hiding just behind his favorite rocking chair where he'd sit to read to her at night. I found ye, Daddy. I'm the winner. Naha laughed scooping his little daughter up in his arms. Ye surely did. Dinny ye ever forget, me precious wee heart, ye'll always find me when you need tay. Eh? Ye're awfully silly. Elaine giggled, patting his cheek through his vivid red beard. Och, silly, is it? Naha grinned. He sat down heavily on the floor of her chamber, pulling her down with him. He held her in her lap tickling her belly until she shrieked, kicking her little legs and flailing her arms in false protest. Who are ye callin' silly? There was a knock at the door, 
and Naha stopped tickling Elaine long enough to call for whoever it was to come in. He smiled pleasantly as he saw her. The young maid was only nineteen, with tightly curled brown hair and shocking blue eyes. She was as common as dirt, and Naha liked that about her. Her mother was the castle's cook, and her father an earnest farmer for the clan. When they'd asked Naha to hire her, he hadn't even considered doing otherwise. Her name was Betty, and she had been a real gift from God above. She was one of Elaine's few playmates when Naha was busy, which was far too often of late. Elaine loved her dearly, and Betty loved her in return, which had been a blessing when Elaine was younger and just needed some company. The child brightened when she saw her. Betty. Have ye come to play wee me and daddy? Betty smiled and nodded her head at the child but spoke directly to Naha. Me laird, I'm right sorry to interrupt, but there's a posh English lass here asking to speak wee you. Naha stood, Elaine still in his arms. She's an English lass, ye say? That was very strange. I am nay accustomed to visits from the English, even in this so-called time of peace. And a woman travelling alone from the southern country is fair strange, to say the least. Betty was waiting for his answer, so he asked. Day we ken her? The maid dipped her head and replied. She says her name's Lee Moore, me laird. I dinny ken the name. It is near one of any of the English ye've met with that I recall. Should I tell her ye're busy? He shook his head. Nay, I'll see what she wants first. Naha replied. Thank ye kindly for telling me. Elaine pouted. But daddy, it's our playtime. Ye promised. Betty stepped forward. Should I take Elaine? She smiled at the pouting child. We can play that chase game ye like. He was about to hand her over, then shook his head. That's all right. She's gonna be the lady of the castle one day. She can come to meet our visitor. A right way ye, me took? Elaine nodded solemnly and said. But ye have to play wee me later, Betty, a right? Betty promised, and Naha laughed. He placed Elaine on his shoulders, and like that, the two followed Betty down into the kitchens, where the mysterious visiting girl awaited them. The lady standing at the foot of the dais was very pretty. Elaine had only ever seen pictures of her mommy, but this woman was at least as lovely as those portraits. Mommy had been dark, but this visitor was fair, with bright blonde hair and even brighter blue eyes, and the kind of skin that looked like she'd never spent much time out in the sun. She had a sweet smile when she looked at Elaine and Naha. When she spoke, though, her voice sounded very strange. The words weren't quite what Elaine was used to. Even those that were familiar were pronounced in an odd fashion. It was like she didn't know how to speak correctly. Naha put Elaine down in a chair at the head table on the dais and said to behave while he talked to the lady. Well, then. Welcome, visitor. Naha said, turning away from Elaine. My lad. The lady said in that funny voice of hers. Thank you for seeing me. Of course. Naha said in his polite voice that he only used with visitors. What can I do for ye? The lady lifted the front material of her skirt and gave a short curtsy. It was very fancy, much more so than the one Betty sometimes did. My name is Magnolia Limor. I'm a nanny by trade. My previous family's children have outgrown me, and in my travels, I heard that you were looking for someone to work with your daughter. Oh, I? Naha asked, leaning casually against the table. And how long have ye been nannying? Ten years, my lad. I started at sixteen. That was a lot of years, even Elaine knew that. Cook had taught her to count when she was permitted to help in the kitchen sometimes. But she looked at the pretty lady suspiciously now. She knew nannies, she'd had a lot of them. They kept leaving, and that kept making Daddy sad. They were supposed to teach her, not cook. They were supposed to read to her rather than Betty and the other maid. 
There always seemed to be some reason they didn't work, and then they'd leave. Elaine didn't understand it, but she knew she hated it when they left because Daddy always got sad. Excuse me, lady. Elaine said, folding her arms. Both adults looked at her. How do you wish, pet? Naha told her. The lady shook her head. It's quite all right. You can call me Magnolia if you like. What's your name? Magnolia? Elaine asked, tilting her head. Me name's Elaine. The lady smiled. Elaine, is it? That's a beautiful name. My mother was named Eleanor, you know. It's nearly the same thing. Maybe that means we'll be friends? Elaine stared at her. If that was true, it was exciting. She had never met another Elaine or Eleanor before. That was almost like fate. But she was still suspicious. Miss Magno. Magna. Maggie, are ye gonna make my daddy sad? Magnolia seemed amused by the nickname. What's a DOD? she asked in her strange accent. Ah, so clearly she didn't know very much. That was all right. Elaine would help her. Elaine was very good at helping people. She was patient as she explained. Daddy is what I call my Atha. Magnolia frowned. And your ah hair is your? That'd be me. Naha spoke up. Her faith. Uh, she's speaking in Gaelic. My Weechuk is well educated already. Can you keep up we her? Magnolia gave Naha a look that Elaine didn't understand. She didn't look mad or sad, but she didn't look happy either. I'm sure Elaine and I can teach each other a lot. I find that working with my charges rather than dictating to them tends to go over much better. And look, she's taught me a new word already. Elaine looked at Naha and was thrilled to see he was smiling. I must have made him smile because I'm helping Maggie to learn. Elaine gave her father a huge bean to show she was pleased, too. If her helping Maggie was helping Daddy, then Maggie could stay. Maybe. Naha gave Elaine a brief grin in return then looked back at Magnolia. Tell me, Miss Lee Moore, how well do you cook? We've got a cook, of course, but if she's no available, or we're away from the castle, how would ye feed Elaine? Naha asked. He had a thoughtful look on his face. Ye look highborn. Nay really the type to be slavin or a hot stove. Highborn enough to be educated in the arts, my lad, and no more. Magnolia replied pleasantly without so much as a pause. I am pleased to prepare food in most any circumstance. I would happily find out Elaine's likes and dislikes, to make sure I can cook something we all enjoy if need be. I can act the role of maid and cook as well as a nanny. Whatever my lad requires. Nahan nodded, looking thoughtful again. Elaine looked between him and Magnolia, then decided that he obviously needed some help. She wriggled down off the chair, and, with a little difficulty, down off the dais, too. Daddy didn't try to stop her, but she felt him being nervous behind her. Elaine marched right up to Magnolia. Magnolia smiled at her and crouched so that their faces were level. Warmest greetings to you, young maid, Elaine. Did you have something to ask me? Elaine pulled herself up to her biggest height, making sure that Maggie knew that she was the maid of McFoyle, and therefore she was in charge. She nodded. I, I day have a question. She said. Day ye can any good games, Maggie? Games? Magnolia blinked a few times, then laughed. I know hundreds. Do you like marbles? She reached into her right pocket, and pulled out a shiny white ball. It was beautiful, but... I have a load of marbles. Do ye can anything else? Elaine asked her. If she didn't have anything other than that, then what was the point? Magnolia thought about it for a moment, then her face brightened. Have you ever played Handy Dandy? What's that? Elaine asked, curious. 
she'd never heard of such a game. Magnolia closed her hand around the ball and stood up straight, then put both arms behind her back. After a moment, she said. What hand is my marble in? Elaine pointed. That's easy. That one. But when the right hand was extended and opened, it was empty. Is she using magic? Is she a witch? Elaine was uncertain. Then Magnolia showed her the ball in her left hand. I switched it. Let me try. They played with the marble for a while, and Elaine knew her daddy was watching. She hoped he was pleased. She wouldn't mind if someone fun like Magnolia stayed for a wee while. He hired her almost immediately, promising at least a month of employment before they reviewed her staying more permanently. She'd been surprised at that, but when she asked why he hired so quickly, he shrugged and told her that if she was good enough for Elaine, she was good enough for him. Magnolia couldn't quite believe it had gone so well and that she'd been hired immediately. Still, she thanked him as graciously as she knew how, over and over again. As Magnolia was shown through the stone-walled hallways towards what would be her rooms by a young maid, though, she couldn't help but feel suspicious. Yes, she's a sweet child, and the laird seems to care for her deeply, but he wouldn't hesitate to have me hanged. She could feel a phantom pain around her neck already. It was as though the rope was measured and tightening around her neck. She was more than aware of the danger ahead of her. It felt strange to her that she should be hired so quickly. It felt like he was plotting something. It was almost as if he'd known the whole time what game she was playing. Does he suspect something? If so, then surely he would not have involved his daughter? She frowned to herself. She didn't know anything about this man. But the way he interacted with Elaine. Thinking about it made her smile. My father looks at me in the same way as he gazes at that little girl. Whatever else he is, whatever else he's plotting, he loves her. Just like my father loves me. And Elaine adores him, too. The little girl looked remarkably like him. She had his bright red hair and freckled features, though her eyes were a deep grey that sparkled like silver in her excitement. She wore her hair neatly in braids, and she had dimples on both cheeks. Her father was like a wild version of her. Naha's hair really was a flame, wild without being messy as it bounced around his head, and down to his shoulders, with a matching fiery beard. His eyes were a brilliant green she had never seen in a person. They looked like they belonged to a ginger cat. Intelligent, shrewd. As though he is a half-wild Tom who has seen much, and he is prepared for anything. He was tall at least a head and a half taller than she if her estimates from the floor were correct, and though he dressed modestly, it was clear he had hard, toned arms and legs under his lordly clothing. And he is rather handsome, I suppose, in a barbarian sort of way. He was the kind of attractive that screamed danger and warning, but intrigued sillier girls than Magnolia, nonetheless. His freckles, noticeable and thick all over every visible part of his sun-darkened skin, added a layer of the unexpected. Especially those dotted on his cheeks and over his nose. When she thought of how they looked. Well, they're rather adorable. The second the thought came to her mind, she shooed it away. That was absurd. The Scottish air must be getting to her mind. She shook her head, alarmed by the turns of her daydreams. No. She could not become caught up in such sentiment now. She must remember that everyone here, the maid, the cook, even her four-year-old charge and especially her charge's handsome father, was a potential threat. If she was caught, she could be hanged, and now her would be the one to give the order. Even now, he could be planning an assault against the crown and country she and her father loved so much. No number of freckles could soften her against such as that. No soft beard, no muscles, could make a monster less of a beast. This is Yarum while you're here. The maid told her. It's a made up. His lairdship hastily changed it since the last. Well, it's a year's, now. Magnolia gave her a small smile. Thank you. She said. 
she opened the door, and the maid turned to go. Magnolia reached out and touched her shoulder. Wait. What's your name? I never asked you before, which was very rude of me. I apologize. The maid's cheeks blushed bright red, and she nervously brushed some of her dark curls from her face. Ye didn't need to apologize to the likes of me, miss. I insist. Magnolia pressed. We shall be working together, shall we not? Please give me your name, so that I may thank you better. The color in the maid's cheeks blossomed into something gentler, and more pleasant. Well, if ye insist. Me name is Betty Mississippi. Betty is short for Elizabeth. I. Me mother is an Elizabeth, too, but she's Eliza. Magnolia gave her a genuine smile. This young woman, at least, seemed harmless. My best friend at home is also Elizabeth. We call her Lizzie. She said. I hope this is a good sign that you and I will get along well together. Betty returned the smile a little awkwardly. Well, that'd be fair pleasant, miss. She shrugged. There are really many young folk Karoon here. It'd be nice to have someone for talking to, miss. Thank you, Betty. For introducing yourself, and for showing me here. Magnolia said. And, please, call me Magnolia. Aye, all right. Betty agreed. It's been really nice to meet ye. Magnolia. Betty curtsied and left. Once she was gone, Magnolia entered her room. She closed the door and was surprised by the generous size of the chamber. There was a large bed with a beautiful pattern quilt and an abundance of soft pillows. In the corner was an ornate oak dresser, and along one wall sat an elaborate writing desk with an elegant matching chair. There was plenty of floor space without making the room look empty. There was even a rather delightful rug, patterned with an astoundingly beautiful unicorn. Magnolia walked to the large window and opened the shutters, and what she saw almost took her breath away. It did not just look like she was in another country. It looked like another world. There were greenery and trees as far as the eye could see. She'd seen them on the way here, of course, but seeing them from above was astounding. Is this what a bird feels like when it soars above the forests? Many of the homes of the McFoyle clan could be seen in the near distance, but they blended with the natural landscape rather than disrupting it. They looked almost as natural as the trees did, even the faint moving dots she guessed were the clan's people going about their evening duties. Between the castle and the start of the village and forest, there was a considerable body of water. It was a glistening clean lock, Magnolia knew, of the sort that she could only imagine in the south. It was more beautiful than even the lakes that were famed in the borderlands. I cannot see, but that lock must be teeming with fish and wildlife. It really did look like some celestial other world. Do the fish look the same as those at home? Do the birds sing the same way? Somehow, this thought seemed overwhelmingly lonely, and a sob rose unbidden in her throat. Her eyes started to itch. She let no tears fall and no sound out, though. Why am I so upset all of a sudden? Why do I suddenly feel so melancholy? I am here on a mission. I must not get emotional before I have even started my work. She closed the shutters tight, holding them closed for a few seconds and taking some deep breaths to steady herself. Easy, now. Breathe, Magnolia. Breathe. She moved away from the window and focused on the necessary tasks immediately ahead of her. She unbuttoned her overgown, determining that now was as good a time as any for a rest. She kicked off her shoes and lay down on her bed after loosening her bodice, staring up at the pretty pattern on the ceiling, then closed her eyes. I must stay focused. I have a mission. I must be alert and keep my suspicions at the forefront of my mind. I have no access to my father, my friends, the crown's protection. I am on my own and responsible for my own choices and fate now. This place she would call home for the next moon turn was foreign to her, in everything from the building to the fields to the smell of the air. 
she was under threat of death or worse if she misstepped even once. She was simply an earl's daughter, and this was like no task she'd ever completed before. But I can do this. I will do this. More than that, I must. For my country, for my queen, and for my father. When she thought of all that green, of the trees outside, the scent of fresh grass, the daisy chain Elaine wore around her neck, a particular pair of eyes, it made her wary. She was not very far from home, but she may as well be entirely outside the earth. It does not matter. I am brave. I am strong. Magnolia repeated it like a chant in her head, taking from its strength and comfort, hearing her father's voice as she did. No matter how brave and strong she was, though, she was alone and scared, and though she would never admit it aloud, afraid of this strange new world and its bizarre inhabitants. She could not help but feel frightened, that this alien world may be the last thing that her eyes ever saw. The girl was lying about her name. Naha knew that much, and he pondered it as he crept out of Elaine's chambers while the child slept. Magnolia was more highborn than she wanted him to believe, and he knew of no Lemore family. As clan chief, he made a point of knowing the top English names, in case they should attack again. He'd never heard of Lemore, nor anything close to it. Even besides that, though she'd smiled prettily enough, there had been a hint of something in her eyes. Something he didn't quite know. But ye hired her anyway, Naha. Why? Well, there were a thousand reasons a noble lass could be fibbing about her own surname. It needn't be anything sinister. Perhaps she was on the run from her father. Mayhaps she had been involved in a marriage gone wrong, those kinds of unfortunate situations were undoubtedly common enough when people were wed without love. He knew that the English could be particularly restrictive of their women, even the southern Scots were sometimes guilty of that. Perhaps she had tried to change her identity, simply to escape the life she'd left behind. There was no denying she was good with Elaine, either. Elaine was precious, pleasant, and bright, but she never took to anyone so quickly as she'd taken to Magnolia. If she could keep Elaine amused, safe, and educated, then she was already miles ahead of any of the nannies he had tried to retain so far. And the lass answers to me questions were sharp without disrespect in me and me position. She's got a cleverness about her, a wit combined we a strange kind of kindness I have any seen since. Well, nay since Katrina. Naha entered his own chambers, sighing as he shrugged off his overwear and then his undershirt, his muscle chest bathed in the moonlight. He smiled faintly at the tiny miniature portrait he kept on his bedside. It was of his beloved late wife with her shining black hair, and those shining grey eyes she'd given to their daughter, along with her life. Four and a half years had passed since Katrina's death, but he would never stop missing her. Or feeling guilty that she was gone. He moved to his wash basin, soaking his face and splashing water on his arms and torso, as was his nighttime tradition. It had been unimaginably complicated, balancing a newborn babe with his duties as laird and chief. He hadn't even been able to grieve, torn between his duties and fatherhood. Naha only wanted the best for Elaine, but he had never been able to spend the time with her he liked. When she was young enough for wet nurses, they had cared for her, but since she was weaned, it had gotten much harder. Too smart for her own good, me weech ook. Too curious. Too eager to ken the world and how it works. A million questions that me and mine did me and still didn't have the answers to gee her. The child was remarkably intelligent, with a voracious hunger to learn even at her tender age. It had been too much for many of the nannies that Naha had previously hired. Many had resigned, and many more simply abandoned their post without explanation. I, and then my heart broke or and or as the Ben kept asking me if it was her fault. It's me own fault for no being careful enough. The maids and the cook had stepped in. All the servants loved the child as though she was theirs, and Elaine loved them in return. But it wasn't enough, she was approaching five and needed an education. Not just any education, either. 
It was unlikely that Naha would ever produce a son, which meant Elaine would one day be the sole lady of this castle. There was no telling when that would happen. So yes, this English lass may have her secrets, but perhaps that was just another sign of her intelligence, and he could use that when it came to his daughter. Besides all of that, though he would never admit it, he was growing desperate. His duties required more and more of his attention, and he lived in fear of leaving Elaine to become lonely. Naha knew loneliness better than most. The last thing the laird wished was to burden his little daughter with it, too. He'd lost his parents at a relatively young age, and his wife was gone now also. The other lairds treated him with deference, which sometimes made them forget to treat him as human. Apart from William, his army commander, he sometimes felt like he had nobody at all. Magnolia Leemore, or whoever she indeed was, would care for his daughter he was sure of that. She would stave off the loneliness from the girl, at least. I'll just have to make sure I'm keeping my eye out on her. He lay down on his bed, glancing once more at the miniature of Katrina. Katrina Kelton, the woman he'd married for love when everyone had suggested a more political alliance. He hadn't regretted it for a moment. When Katrina was alive, she'd given him hope. She'd given him life. She'd given him Elaine. What would she say about all of this? He knew already. Ye need to learn to trust, Naha. She'd said that to him in their blissful years of marriage, more times than he could remember. Perhaps she was right, even now beyond the grave. Perhaps now, with this strange English girl, was the time where he would finally permit trust back into his life. It had always been a problem for him but it was undoubtedly in scarce supply since Katrina's death. But as he drifted off to sleep, Naha had to wonder. Could he truly place his trust in a strange woman, when that which was entrusted to her was more precious than any gold? Or would she just be another break to Elaine's heart like all the rest? She had better nay. For Elaine's sake, for mine. And for her own. Chapter 4 The Mission Ye can he catch me. Elaine shrieked, her high little voice sending bluebirds flying from the trees in alarm, as she tore through the neatly maintained gardens of the castle. Magnolia chased after her, careful not to trip over her own skirts. She kept her speed slow enough to make it a game, but quick enough that she could intervene should the child suddenly veer off course towards the lock. You're a fast one, that's true. Magnolia called after her taking a sharp right turn. She would surprise Elaine by getting the head and jumping out in front. Instead, she tripped directly over a crouching gardener who was pruning a rose. The old man yelped and fell sideways, and Magnolia instantly reached down to help. Oh, forgive me, sir, I did not see you there. Are you quite all right? I'm so very sorry. The gardener righted himself without her help and when he was on his feet again, he gave her a toothy grin. Och, it's nay every day and all ye and let me get sick of bonny lass fallin for him. He laughed heartily. Dinna ye worry ye pretty heed. Magnolia was glad he was fine, but his thick accent took her by surprise. It was much thicker than Elaine's or even most of the maids, and she was having a slightly hard time understanding him. You aren't hurt? Ye'd huff take it up we early take clock ma old he doof ma shudders, he said. Magnolia couldn't help but giggle. He's speaking English, I'm sure, but it sounds like a foreign language. I think he said he's unhurt, but I barely recognize any of those words at all. He seemed immensely pleased by her laugh and grinned again. Me name's Sandy. And you're the Miss Maggie we Elaine keeps Twitter in a boot? She felt absurdly pleased with herself for understanding him this time. I am called Magnolia, really, but yes. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Sandy. Ock. Ock, a oh, war we the misters. Pleasures all mine, I'm fair share. He tipped his hat and was about to return to his work, when Magnolia realized that this was only the third time in as many days, she'd managed to get someone alone. Yes. The ancient gardener was probably no warmaster, 
that much was clear, but Sandy had the full operation of the castle's land. If there was plotting afoot, he'd know, or at least, he would be able to point her in the correct direction. Mr. Sandy, she said, in as sweet and diplomatic a voice she could manage, through her sudden excitement at possibly finally getting somewhere. May I ask you a question? I am still very new here, you understand, and I would very much like to get to know my new home. Sandy gave her a critical look from beneath his fluffy grey eyebrows then shrugged. I, well, I'll be more than happy to let ye ken what I can. I'm just a gardener though, mind ye. Perhaps it would be a little more challenging to extract information than she'd hoped. Sandy seemed lovely, but the friendlier he got, the less she could understand. Still, she pressed on. Magnolia couldn't know when she would get such an opportunity again. Elaine took up much more time than she had bargained for, and it had been three days with almost no information at all. Well, I was just wondering. Does the laird of the castle receive many visitors? He looked at her speculatively, and for a second, she was afraid she had been too direct. Then he grinned again and said, Och, nay. We laird now has no been the most social the lad since his bonny lass passed. Magnolia blinked, taking a second to estimate precisely what he'd said. Laird Naha. You mean Laird Macfoyle, yes? Sandy chuckled. Och, och, ya sharpian. Aye, I mean that to be fully share, but I've kenned the ben since he was nay bigger than a mallard and made twice the racket. Magnolia took a moment, then slowly translated the old man's extraordinarily heavy accent in her head. I'm fairly certain, he just told me that Naho has been unsocial since the death of his wife, and that Sandy here has known the laird since he was a noisy child, no bigger than a duck. What a strange and whimsical man. She felt absurdly pleased with herself for working that out, and smiled as she asked her next question. I see. So, then, nobody visits? Sandy shrugged. The only folk that visits Thon Castle nowadays are the other clan chiefs, fur politics and the like. After another quick mental translation, Magnolia was filled with nervous anticipation. This was it. This was finally the break she'd been looking for. She eagerly asked. You mean the other clan chiefs visit often? Tell me, do. She was interrupted, though, by a loud splash and the high cry of a child screaming for help. Her stomach dropped, and I seemed to fill her veins and freeze her brain as she quickly worked out what was going on. The lock. Elaine. She rushed around the corner as fast as her skirts would allow with old Sandy limping behind her, and she was horrified by what she saw when they reached the water's edge. Elaine's red hair was floating on the surface, then her little face splashed up, screaming a gurgling scream before she went under again, flailing her arms and legs wildly. She must have fallen directly into the point where the bed dropped, and though the child could swim, she was panicking. She's going to sink. She's going to drown. Sandy was staring with wide, frightened eyes. Get the lad. He cried. Get. There's no time. Magnolia hollered. All questioning was forgotten as her ears were drowned by those terrible screams. She tore at the lace of her bodice and heavy overskirt, allowing them to crumple to the ground as she kicked off her shoes too. She could faintly hear Sandy calling behind her, but whether he was talking to her or crying out for help, she didn't know or even really care. Then she sprinted to the water, sending a silent prayer of thanks to her late mother for teaching her to swim, and dived directly into the ice-cold water. It was a shock to her system as it danced around her skin, though it felt more like kisses than bites as it nipped at her. The water was more transparent than any she'd ever swum in, and for a moment she was hypnotized as a small silver fish darted right by her open eyes. Then Elaine screamed again, and Magnolia's heart leapt. With powerful strokes, she cut through the water towards the sound as quickly as she could. Elaine's bright red shoes kicked manically in front of her, as the little girl lost the battle against shock, but as she got closer, they suddenly went limp. No. 
Magnolia kicked her legs harder and reached Elaine just as the child's head began to submerge fully. She caught her in her arms, pulling them both above the surface and back swimming as quickly as she could to get to the edge. The waterlogged child was heavier than Magnolia had expected, and Magnolia's limbs ached with sheer exhaustion. Still, she swam on, determined they would both get to the shore alive. She would not give up now. She would not. Hang in there, Elaine. Hang in there, we'll make it. She'd never felt such respite as when her head bumped against something hard, and a pair of strong arms reached under her armpits and hoisted them both onto land. Magnolia lay there, her eyes closed as she caught her breath, and she felt the weight of Elaine being lifted from her arms. Panic threatened to overtake her, but it quickly faded as she heard the child coughing. Alive. Awake. Magnolia had saved the girl. Relief flooded her, and even though her body shivered in the cold, it was the most enormous relief she'd ever felt. Are you all right, Chuck? A gentle, soothing voice echoed in her ears, speaking to someone other than her. Magnolia opened her eyes to see the laird himself holding Elaine close, anxiously checking her over for injuries. Are ye hurt? Elaine coughed a few more times, but when she spoke, her voice sounded blessedly normal. Nay, Daddy. Maggie saved me. Magnolia was suddenly caught in Naha's intense green stare. She did, did she? Naha asked slowly. He turned and handed Elaine to a maid standing next to him, who looked pale and shaken. Go get the bend dried aff, and changed into something dry, please. The maid nodded. Magnolia struggled into a sitting position as Elaine was carried away. She saw old Sandy standing a little further back, anxiously watching, and tried to give him a reassuring smile. Still, her eyes were drawn back to Naha almost instantly. He shrugged off his cloak and handed it to her. You're in your under things. He said, sounding a little embarrassed. Despite everything, she chuckled. It felt very odd that such a great, brawny laird should be frightened by some petticoats. Still, she was grateful for the warmth as she wrapped the cloak around her body, and she allowed him to help her to her feet. His hand was warm, secure, and a strange comfort flowed through her at his touch. Thank you. She told him. I am so sorry, my laird. I took my eyes from her for just a moment, and I thought. Hush. He told her. No apologies needed. Ye saved me daughter's life. I should be the one thanking you. Are ye grand? Grand. Magnolia couldn't help but smile slightly. She loved these strange Scottish expressions. Yes, I'm quite all right. She replied. I think we were all just given a fright. They stared at each other for a moment green into blue, and there was a sudden free sun off. Something. Magnolia felt herself get lost in those eyes, in the mystery they hid, in the love they unabashedly showed for his daughter. She suddenly wanted to know more. She wanted to know everything. That was when it hit her. Why should she not know more? Questioning servants and the staff was clearly getting her nowhere. Perhaps the best course of action was to befriend the source directly. If she happened to find him rather visually appealing while she worked, well, that was only an additional perk. Her mission still played clearly on her mind. Handsome or not, Naha was potentially a threat to her home. To her father. So yes, she would play nice for now, and then she'd find out all the secrets this Scotsman was trying to hide. She would make him her friend to find out if he was actually her enemy once and for all. They were caught in each other's gaze for a moment longer, but then Naha looked away. I need to go check on the ban. Take the rest of the day off. As thanks. And as the morrow is Sunday and I've got the day off for once, I will need need ye. She shivered as he looked away, feeling strangely like something had been torn from her as his eyes left hers. She realized what an astounding gesture he was offering her. A whole day and a half to herself. 
she could get so much done in such a significant amount of time, and only three days after she had started to work. She smiled at Sandy, who was still watching nervously, and then back to Naha. I appreciate it, my lad. Thank you. Naha glanced at her one more time, and then put out his hand as if automatically, removing a strand of wet hair from her face, and tucking it behind her ear. Magnolia swallowed, as the gesture seemed to resonate all the way through her. I told ye. Nay thanks. He said softly. Their gazes burned into each other for the most prolonged moment of Magnolia's life. Then he coughed a little awkwardly and dropped his hand. A wing get dry, Miss Magnolia. He turned away, walking over to say something to Sandy, and Magnolia stared after him. It was the first time he'd used her first name. She shook her head. Water must have logged in her brain to be making her think in such a manner. She pulled his cloak tighter around her, and made her way back to the castle, where warmth and safety awaited in her rooms. Naha couldn't stop thinking about her. He hadn't since the moment he'd seen her from the dais, and it was only getting worse. He couldn't understand what it meant, or what he was supposed to do about it, or why he felt quite so guilty. Magnolia was a fair, bonny lass, but he'd seen lassies like that aplenty in his life. His late wife had been the bonniest of them all. There had been no shortage of opportunistic daughters of Laird since Katrina's death. They'd often visited, trying to win the place of the next lady. He'd turned them all away, though. Pretty faces did not interest Naha, not any more. So it wasn't that. That wasn't why Magnolia wouldn't leave his mind. And I, she's got a pleasant wit about her. She kens how to be amusing but no cross that line into crassness. And she's nay half charm in the castle staff, as well. Especially after her lock rescue yesterday. Everyone who mentioned her seemed to have something positive to say, a first for the many nannies Naha had tried to retain for his beloved daughter. Magnolia was intelligent and pleasant, they told him, and gentle too. Kind. Happy. Easy to talk with. Fitting well into the castle despite her odd English twang. More than that, perhaps most importantly, there was the way she was with Elaine. He'd never seen his girl take so suddenly to anyone else, but she could not stop talking about her Maggie with a strange accent. Every night as he tucked her into bed, she'd excitedly tell him stories about the fun things they'd done that day. She'd talk endlessly of the strange and fun English games Magnolia kept introducing, of the new toys she'd show and the stories she'd tell. It felt odd to say, but in only four days, he'd felt some sort of mothering instinct from the young English girl. He was sure, at least, that her care for Elaine was utterly genuine. Not many noble women would strip to their underclothes and dive into a lock, instead of fetching help. She seemed to make Elaine happy, and she kept her safe, and what more could a father wish for? However, it was none of that which kept Naha's mind occupied with her delicate features whenever he lay down to rest. It wasn't her beauty or her kindness that kept his thoughts straying back to her over and over. Nay, more than that, more than any of that, it's whatever she's hiding from us. I want to ken what it is. That, and whether or nay it's a threat to me, Ben. The girl had a secret. He had known that from the first day when he deduced that her name was false, but it was more than even just the lie she was telling. Those blue eyes are hers. They're always guarded, always wary. They're hiding worlds from us. Even as Magnolia was outwardly open and friendly, something hid within those eyes. Just below the cerulean surface, there lived a grim determination Naha could not understand. Something scared her. Something kept her steadfast even as she ran from it. She had a whole life of secrets he knew nothing about. What surprised him more than any of that, was how much he wanted to find out what scared her. To help keep her safe, if need be. He ran a hand through his hair. Enough of this. Elaine was having a nap after the long trip to the Kirk this morning, followed by a large lunch and games with the clan children. Since she slept, and the people were occupied with their Sabbath rest, Naha had some unexpected free time. 
he would use it like he always did, in the library. He used to spend his free time there with Katrina, facing each other in their leather chairs by the fire, taking turns reading the best excerpts from their books. I miss your company among thon books, Katrina. He couldn't let himself get melancholy, however. Elaine suddenly having a nanny once more had freed up much of his time for the matters of lairdship. He had spent much time of late poring over books, trying to prevent a repeat of disaster in case war should befall them once more. Some of his people were poor, dreadfully so, and when fighting happened, the poor were always the first to die. He never let his army fight alone, but many a time even he had barely escaped each battle with his life. Then it was his duty and Williams to return home, and inform grieving widows and countless children, that their only source of bread had perished. Despite that, the clansmen had proven resilient, doing twice or thrice the work to make up for the deficit of workers. It had been a dark time. The McFoyle clan had barely survived. Naha would not have been surprised had they cursed his name, but instead, they welcomed him into their homes and onto their fields. He and William had spent many days working side by side with the young farmers who remained. The clan recovered, and was slowly building itself back into something resembling its old strength over the last three years. Naha felt pride for the sons and daughters of his people like he did for his own daughter. In a way, they were all his children, and it was his duty to care for them well. So, he would read of warfare, of battles successful, of the food provisions and the employers of the ancients, and he would help his people. He did not yet know how, but his land would flourish. For Elaine, and for his clan. For all of Scotland. But as he walked along the corridor, he was ashamed to admit that it wasn't his people who resided at the forefront of his mind. As he always did on this walk, he envisioned the ghost of his dark-haired, gentle-voiced wife walking alongside him, her grey eyes knowing his thoughts. He could imagine her speaking even now. Magnolia's in your thoughts near as much as me these days, Naha. What does that tell ye? Naha answered out loud, but quietly, glad nobody was around to hear him talking to an imaginary ghost. It is me like that, cat. She's got a secret. I need to ken what it is. To keep Elaine safe. The image in his mind's eye smiled with those soft red lips, a spark in those grey eyes. And that's who it is, I? I. He said, a little more firmly. I, that's who it is. As you say, love. Katrina's voice seemed to dance around his ears as the image disappeared. It was barely more than a whisper as she added, but Denny forget what I'd want for ye. For both ye and our Elaine. What she'd want. What she'd want was to be there with him. Instead, she lay cold and dead under the ground, and he'd put her there with his carelessness. He should have found a better doctor, should have returned home sooner, or? He cleared his throat and emptied his mind of fancy and fear. There was no time for it now. He moved through the final large wooden doors into the library. He was surprised as he entered to see it was already occupied. Magnolia was in a casual day dress, the kind women wore when they weren't planning on traveling at all, and her hair was tied in a pretty knot on the top of her head. She stood immersed in front of one of the shelves, a book already in hand, scanning for others. He approached quietly but spoke at a standard volume as he said, Well. I was nay expectin' to find ye here on your day off. It's nay often I find another woman who likes to read. Magnolia jumped, obviously frightened by the sudden words, and spun to face him. She relaxed visibly as she realized who he was, but only marginally. He could still feel the tenseness in her as she responded. My mother taught me, my lad. She said, bowing her head deferentially. My father bolstered my education after she passed. Naha considered her for a moment. Perhaps that was true, but it wasn't the whole truth. If she was here to read for pleasure, this was a very strange shelf to select for browsing. Eh? He asked. And will you teach me we Elaine how to day it in turn? I hope so. Magnolia agreed. She's a very bright girl. 
she already told me she would like to teach me some Scots and maybe even Gaelic, too. I would love to learn with her. I think it would be fun. He smiled despite his skepticism. Magnolia really did care for his daughter. He almost let himself get distracted by it, until he glanced at the thick book in her hand, and saw how she moved it ever so slightly behind her back. His suspicions raised once more. What's that? A book, my lad. She said, a slight bite to her still deferential tone. She moved it further behind her back, confirming only that he was right to suspect. If you'll excuse me. She pushed past him, but he spun and caught her arm. Whatever she was doing, this was his castle, and he needed to know. Now. I didn't excuse ye, actually. What book? He demanded. He could hear a rough edge to his words, but he didn't care. He just needed her to answer. He needed to be able to trust her. He was entrusting her with his daughter. She wrenched her arm free, glaring at him. What does it matter? Am I not free to read what I wish on my day off? He folded his arms as if letting her go had been his idea. Ock, aye, but it's nay exactly customary to ignore the lad when he's asking ye a question. I am your employer if ye recall. Her cheeks went pink, but she didn't seem embarrassed. In fact, she looked offended at what Naha had said, and it showed in her voice. You do not need to question me, my lad. Or have I not already proven my loyalty to my job and to your daughter? Only yesterday, I risked. Dinny gimme me that. He snapped. Dinny ye throw a lane in me face like that. I told ye already, ye've got me eternal gratitude for what ye did for me ban. That doesn't mean you're exempt fae the rest of the castle rules. You're still my employee, Miss Leemore, Anne? What happened to Magnolia? Her temper had definitely flared now. The sting in her voice had turned into something sharper, and he was surprised by the heat he felt radiating from her as she stepped closer to him in anger. Even more surprising to realize was that it wasn't all just rage. He stared down at her. What are you talking about? He asked, his throat suddenly dry. She scowled. You were happy to call me by my name yesterday. Was that just some sort of reward? She let out a disgusted huff. I suppose as a nanny, I'm too low for your esteemed attention, given how you have barely said a word to me since I got here. He gaped at her wordlessly. She took the opportunity to turn on her heel and storm toward the door in a fury. She tried to leave, but he took a few bounds so that he was next to her. He grabbed her, pinning her against the door. Her back was to the wood, and her head tilted up her blue eyes wide, and her pretty pink lips slightly parted as she stared up at him. All he could hear in the world was the sound of his own heart pounding, much more quickly than it should. Thump thump, thump thump, thump thump. Is hers doing the same? He gulped silently, though he didn't let the sudden change in his mood show on his face. His whole being tensed, and he could feel his heart thrumming in his chest, his blood rushing around his body so hard he could almost hear it sound in his ears. It had been more than four years since he'd been this close to a woman, any woman. Nobody since Katrina had been pinned against a door by his arms, staring up into his eyes with mingled submissiveness and excitement. Nobody but she had been fully enthralled by the game they played, where the laird took his woman as his own. Magnolia's eyes widened as he stared into them. He could feel her watching as his gaze travelled from her eyes and down her long, pretty neck, to the neckline of her dress, stopping just north of the bodice. Only Katrina had waited for him to inch his fingers down her bodice, hike her skirt up slowly with his knees, claim every part of her as his family had once claimed the land. The two of them had always started just like this, standing just as he stood with Magnolia now, and all he'd do was lower his lips to hers and... But Magnolia was not Katrina. Even more, she was his employee, and she was behaving suspiciously. I need to stop this. I need to stop it immediately. He blinked a few times to clear his head, 
and lowered one of his hands carefully to take the book from her. He backed off, his eyes not leaving her until there was a safe distance between them, then looked at what he'd taken. It was an old book, but its leather binding was in pristine condition, mostly because it was the kind of book nobody wanted to read. It was filled with diagrams and blather about the building of the castle, the closed-off passages, the dungeons, and gardens. A whole lot of technical nonsense that was best left to the builders. A right strange choice for a young woman. It is a right peculiar choice for anyone, really. She looked at him without any shame or guilt, her cheeks still pink with anger, as he flipped through the pages. What would she want with something like this? I feel myself falling asleep just glancing through it. How on God's green earth was she planning on reading it? He snapped the book closed. I'll be keeping this. He grumbled in a low voice. He couldn't imagine what Magnolia was doing with it, but he didn't want her to just walk away with it. If nothing else, it would be embarrassing after the scene he'd just created. She glared at him. Do what you like, my lad she said tightly, then turned and left the library. He stared after her, then down at the book. Just what, exactly, is this strange English girl trying to hide? Chapter 5 The Fair Folk Elaine was only four, but that didn't mean that she didn't know much. She was very good at understanding things. She knew, for example, that something was wrong with her Arthur and with Magnolia right now? For the past few days, they'd both been acting really strange, like something terrible had happened. When Elaine asked them, though, they just told her everything was fine. Something else Elaine knew was that sometimes adults lie to make children feel better or feel safe. I wish they would knee. It makes both of them look awfully silly. As if I didn't care something's the matter. Elaine thought to herself, her little hands on her hips. Daddy had been avoiding Magnolia since last Sunday. Elaine had no idea why, but whenever they'd end up in a room together, he'd make up an excuse to be somewhere else. And Magnolia was no better, every time they played anywhere near where Daddy might be, Magnolia wanted to play elsewhere. Since they were being silly adults and pretending nothing was wrong, that meant it was up to Elaine to fix it. She couldn't do it alone, but luckily Uncle William was visiting today. Even though he is near my real uncle, I love it when he visits. Elaine waited in her room where he had promised to come to see her. He only lives in the village, but I barely get to see him. A knock came, and Elaine excitedly called. Come in. Uncle William was shorter than Daddy and a wee bit older too. He had blonde brown hair that looked like sand and dark grey eyes, just like Elaine's and her mommy's, that Elaine thought looked like the sea on a rainy day. He was less severe than Daddy, except when they talked about dangerous things like fighting. And they always sent her away for those anyway, so she didn't really know anything about them. Good day to ye, me wee doll. Uncle William said cheerfully, putting out his arms. Elaine ran towards him immediately giggling as he lifted her up in them. They talked for about a half hour, catching each other up on their goings-on. Eventually, Elaine got to the part that had been worrying her the most. There's something wrong with me daddy, Uncle William. Oh I? William asked. They were sitting on her bed, she on his knee. More than usual, you mean? She laughed. I. And me nanny is acting proper strange, too. I dinny ken what's the matter with them, but they're avoiding each other at the time. It's fair awkward for me. Uncle William got a strange look on his face at that. Do ye mean the Magnolia last year to sent me that note about? I, Maggie. She's real nice, Uncle William, even though she's a wee bit odd and English. Anyway, I've got a secret plan, but I need your help. Uncle William grinned. Tell me, wee button, but make it quick. I've got a meeting wee yerda in a few minutes. I've already been up here longer than I'm supposed to be. Elaine nodded. That's a right. I just need ye to talk to Daddy. 
Find out what madness is happening in his heed, and see if ye can sort it. I'll deal wee Maggie. Deal? Uncle William didn't laugh. She liked that, he never laughed at her. Just like Daddy and Magnolia never did. She hoped that between them, they could fix whatever the problem was. Uncle William held out his hand for Elaine to shake. She did, very solemnly, like she'd seen her father do with other lads. Deal. Uncle William said. William Candlish was only a year older than Naha himself. Still, Naha had taken every opportunity since their childhood, to tease his friend about that extra year, and William teased him about. Well, everything else in return. It was their way, and it was one of the few things that still made Naha feel carefree. How are you Farin, Aldian? He asked cheerfully as William entered his study without bothering to knock. Och, as fair as I can be when I'm dealing wi a whiny ben like your lairdly self. William replied. Both men laughed and moved towards each other, embracing tightly before parting. William sat down on one of the chairs at the desk, and Naha went for his bottle of whiskey hidden away in the secret cabinet. I have only seen me best friend in months, and such an occasion calls for a wee nip or two. He poured them both a small glass and sat down across from William. So. Are you here as yourself or as my army commander? Just so I ken what kind of mood your visit should be putting me in. William laughed and threw back his whiskey in one shot. He made a happy face at the burn, then said. Ye ken the answers both, Naha. It's always both. Naha grunted, but he couldn't exactly argue. True enough. Let's get the politics out of the way first, then. What can I do for ye, Commander Candlish? The English are unsettled. William told him immediately, in the same tone as someone informing Naha that water was wet. Someone's been spread in all sorts of misinformation again, and they're a wound up and champing at the bit for some fighting. Now has scowled, sipping at his whiskey. Well, they are really getting it for me. He said. The McFoyle clan has seen more than enough of war. The whole of the country has. The lowlands already play nice with the English. Even the royal families are mixed. What else can they possibly want? What do they want from us up north? William shrugged. Didn't he ask me how the English mind works, Naha? I just report what my intelligence agents tell me. Ye ken that. Ye're the master strategist. I just ken how to get them to point their swords in the right direction. Now has snorted, though it was a sad sound. Master strategist, he says. Ye're a loyal friend, William, but your bias is showing. If I was half the strategist ye think of me, we wouldn't have lost so many good men in battle. So many fathers and sons and brothers, all gone because I could need protect them. So what day we need? He asked out loud. Are they sending an army? Day we need to prepare for war again? Please say nay. Please. I didn't ken that we can survive again. Nay. William said, and relief flooded through Naha. We didn't yet, at least. They're just mutterings for now. They haven't immobilized any of them and yet. The minute we hear something, ye'll ken about it. Naha drained the rest of his glass and poured them both another. I ken that. I trust ye we my life, and we Elaine's, ye ken I day. Thank ye for keeping me informed. I'll look into it from my end and see what's what. It's me job, me laird. William told him respectfully. Then he dropped the title and flipped back into his more informal, relaxed tone. I've another mission, Tay. Oh I? I. Your daughter's worried about ye. She says ye haven't been acting yourself as late. For some reason, as he said it, William had a remarkably sly smirk on his face. Naha blinked. He hadn't known what his friend was going to say, but he would never have imagined it was this. I'm worrying me Elaine. Why? What's she saying? 
She says she's worried that he had a fight with her nanny. Magnolia, was it? William asked. He leaned forward across the table. Been spending a lot of your time with Magnolia, have ye? Naha grunted. Shut your face, William. That just delighted his friend more. So ye did have a Barney wee the wee English lass? Why? Och, it was nay anything. Naha said, shaking his head. It was just a bad moment for the two of us. I'm sure she's forgotten her about it already. And as for Elaine, you tell her from me to keep her nose out of adult business. William raised an eyebrow. And is there any? Any a what? Any adult business? Naha reached over the table and lightly shoved at his friend's shoulder. Ye've always been one of the most ridiculous men I've ever kenned, Will. Stop talking nonsense. William gazed at him for a moment, his smirk still irritatingly in place. Whatever ye say, Naha. He said. He lifted his glass and held it up in salute. To Elaine. Naha chinked his glass against William's. To Elaine. He repeated. The both of them drank deeply, and Naha breathed easily, glad they'd moved on from. Whatever that bizarre conversational turn had been. Why was William talking about Magnolia anyway? The whole thing was absurd. Naha would need to speak with Elaine. He downed his whiskey. That's enough, Naha. There is any time for this kind of nonsense. So. How's your wife? The bands? He asked. For a second, he thought William was going to refuse to change the subject. Thankfully, though, he leaned forward, and the two started to talk about times, new and old. Hand in hand, Elaine and Magnolia walked together across the tended grass towards the wilder parts of the boundaries, where the back of the castle met the forest. It was the opposite direction from the castle than the village. In the whole week that Magnolia had been here, she had never once wandered in this direction. What did you want to show me, Elaine? She asked her charge, glancing back at the castle. She had the oddest feeling she was going somewhere she wasn't supposed to, even though they were still on castle grounds. Elaine pulled her hand and gestured for her to follow. Eventually, when they were close to the forest, Elaine pointed to a little hillock, where they could sit and look into the woods without actually crossing the boundary. Magnolia laid the blanket on the mound as requested, and the two sat together. Elaine beckoned her close, and spoke so quietly that Magnolia had to practically put her ear next to the little girl's mouth. Day ye ken about the fair folk, Maggie? She asked. Magnolia frowned, leaning back from her a little and speaking at an average volume. The fair folk? Elaine nodded seriously. There's a lot of them. They're magic creatures that ye shouldn't mess we, or ye'll get spirited away into their world. Some of them are kind enough, and some are naughty, but ye shouldn't get involved we either, nay unless ye really can how to communicate we them. Oh. Magnolia said. Old wives' tales of Cornish pixies, and the terrifying tale her Northumbrian nanny used to tell about the red cap, came flooding into her mind. You mean fairy? Elaine quickly put her little hand over Magnolia's mouth, stopping her from finishing the word. The child looked genuinely alarmed, her grey eyes wide with fear. Are ye mad? Didn't he say that word so close to the forest? They didn't he like being called that. At least they dinny where they can hear us day it. Ye need to be mere careful, Maggie. Magnolia could see how seriously the girl was taking this, so she didn't laugh. Instead, she nodded. I apologize. She said seriously. The fair folk, then. Yes, we have some in England, too, at least up north. I've never met one. I'm not so sure they visit us so far south. Elaine gave her a pitying look. This forest is filled with the fair folk. She explained. Ye need to ken about them if ye are to live here we us. I know some. Magnolia told her. 
I know that many are wicked and wish only to trick and damage humans. I, they're the unseelie. Elaine said wisely. They are really evil, but they can be right malicious. They'll bite ye as soon as look at ye. And then there are the scary ones who might frighten ye, but denny want to hurt ye. But there are good we folk, too, the seely folk. They're still mischievous, but they just want to help and love nature. Like pixies. Magnolia asked her. Aye, like the heather pixies and like the wee brownies that help out in exchange for some milk and bread. And there's a difference between the wee fair folk and their royalty, too. Magnolia leaned forward, fascinated. Oh? Do they have lads like your father among the fair folk? Ock, aye, and kings and queens besides. Their nobles are called the Aos Sith, and they've got a connection we nature that we humans can understand. They live in another world that lives on top of ours. Believe it or nay, one of the entrances to it is in that forest. Elaine pointed to the trees. Magnolia shivered, imagining a tall, stunningly beautiful creature with magic she did not know existing among the trees. Why are you telling me about this? She asked. Elaine thought about it for a moment. Ye said your mother's name was Eleanor. Is she did? Magnolia swallowed. It had been over ten years since her mother's death, but she still felt it in her heart at those words all the same. Yes. She said sadly. I loved my mother very much, but she died when I was just fifteen years old. Why do you ask? My mommy is dead too. Elaine said, sounding much more light-hearted than a child should when she said such a thing. It still makes my daddy sad sometimes. I never knew mommy, but I still love her very much. She died when I was born. Though she'd suspected as much, Magnolia couldn't help but feel an ache of sorrow at such a tragic loss. I'm very sorry to hear that. It's a right. If I ever miss her, I just come here. That's why I'm telling ye about the fair folk, Maggie. Ye seem sad, and when I'm sad, they always cheer me up. A smile played on Magnolia's lips. Oh yes? She asked. How so? Well, before me mommy died, she saw one of the Aos Sith in those woods. Elaine told her. It was a huge honor, and she told my daddy all about it. She wandered deep into the forest, to where the big pond is and she found the bean nigh washing some of her royal clothes, that she'd thought were lost. She was sad because she kenned what that meant, but the bean nigh told her to come closer, and she'd give her knowledge. What's a bean nigh a? Magnolia asked, proud at how well she managed to copy the pronunciation. One of the ish she, you said? Aye, that's right. She's a kind of bean Sith. They're Sith ladies that sing when they predict a death in the family. The bean nigh only appears, and washes the clothes of those who are gone e die in violence, so mommy was scared, but she asked for her fortune anyway. Elaine sounded much older than just for when she spoke staring out into the forest as though she could see all of this happening. Magnolia was spellbound. A banshee. She repeated. She thought she'd heard tales of those, perhaps from Irish visitors with similar legends. I see. So what did the bean knight tell your mother? She told her Tha she was gonna die when I was born, but that I'd be healthy and Tha because she was so good, her spirit could join them in the other world when she was finally free of her earthly bonds. So mommy left the forest and wore only green, until the day I was born and she died, ready to go on to the other world. Elaine turned to look at Magnolia again. But I think she's still stuck in the forest, and nay yet has she gone on to the world of the Sith. I think it's because Daddy is sad. Magnolia stared at her. What words to be coming out of a child's mouth? Was it wisdom or just a story? She certainly seemed earnest just enough, and it was more vivid than any childhood dream that Magnolia had ever heard. Stop being absurd, Magnolia. You are getting caught up in a children's story. That is a very bittersweet story, Elaine. She told her. The girl looked confused, so she clarified. 
that means it's both sad and happy at the same time. It's sad that your mother is gone, of course, but I am thrilled that you are happy and healthy here with me now. Aye, that's what daddy always says too. Elaine agreed. Listen, though, can ye do me a favor? Magnolia had learned from experience never to blindly promise anything. What sort of favor? She asked cautiously. Elaine turned and took one of Magnolia's hands between both of her small ones. Can ye please be me daddy's friend? I think it'd help make him happy, and help me mommy tay move on and get tie the world of the Sith. Why would your father want to be friends with me? Magnolia asked, not able to hide her astonishment. Quickly, she covered herself. I mean, he's a great lad, and I'm just your nanny. Elaine shrugged. Because ye're kind and nice and ye make me laugh. Ye're my friend, so I think ye'd be a good friend for me daddy as well. Will ye try? Please. Something about the way she asked just melted Magnolia's heart. She didn't understand exactly where this had come from, but the child was clearly set on it. Did she sense the awkwardness between us? Has the scene in the library affected us both quite that much? For some reason, the idea that she could have affected Naha so significantly made her cheeks warm. If Elaine noticed them changing color, though, she didn't comment, for which Magnolia was grateful. I suppose, Magnolia said, that I can try. But only as much as your father wants. I will not invade his privacy, Elaine. He is a very busy man. Och, I can that, Elaine said. But ye promise ye'll try? For me and for me mommy? Magnolia felt a little helpless, but she nodded. Yes, I promise that I'll try, she said. God above only knew how she could ever keep that promise and do her job, too. She would try, though. For Elaine. Perhaps, if nothing else, it would help dispel the strange feeling she'd had since she got here. She could both play at spy and be courteous. It wouldn't be that hard. The only things that were at risk were Elaine's happiness. And Magnolia's neck. Chapter 6 the library. Magnolia couldn't see a thing, which meant the blindfold was working. Elaine was darting around like a pup, calling her name from every which way, excitedly declaring that the nanny could never catch her. The child's laughter was more than charming. Magnolia was glad she had agreed to play blind man's bluff, even if she was apparently terrible at it. Elaine called out again and Magnolia hurried in the direction she was sure the child's voice was coming. Nay, Maggie. Or here. Elaine's voice was somehow behind her. Magnolia spun on her feet, hurrying back in that direction. I'll catch you. She proclaimed, receiving another slew of giggles for her efforts, as she lunged blindly towards the sound. She lurched to an abrupt stop as she walked directly into something. At first, she thought it was just a tree, but trees weren't so warm, nor did they smell of wood smoke and honey with a touch of lavender. Trees didn't have strong arms that steadied her, and trees didn't awkwardly clear their throats as she took a step away from them and removed her blindfold. Daddy! Elaine cried, hurtling across the garden and up into her father's arms. Naha held her close, kissing her hair, but his eyes were still on Magnolia. Magnolia felt the blood rush to her cheeks. It had been near a week since the events at the library, and a few days since Elaine's little speech at the forest. She had hardly seen any part of the laird since. She was confident that he was avoiding her, which was perfect for her, as she had no wish to interact with him now either. She knew what she'd promised Elaine, but the thought made her stomach swoop with uncomfortable anxiety. Every time she thought of him, all she could remember was the feeling of his breath against her skin, the proximity of his body to hers, as her back pressed against the polished wood door, the danger and excitement that had sparked between their eyes. The downside, of course, was that no matter how she searched or who she questioned in the meantime, she had found nothing. No proof of an invasion plan, no mutterings of an ambush. 
she would need to return to her strategy of befriending the laird, somehow. Ten days were already gone from her promised four weeks, and she was no closer to the truth. Plus, she'd made a promise to Elaine. So she gathered herself together, inclined her head as though nothing was wrong, and said, It's a pleasure to see you, my laird. Naha nodded back courteously, though he wouldn't meet her eyes. Why are you here, Daddy? I usually didn't see you till it's bedtime. Elaine asked him, her little arms wrapped around his neck. A dark look crossed Naha's face at that. I can that, Chuck. But I'm needin' to work this eve, which means I'm near gonna be able to tuck ye in. I needed to see ye, though. I need me daily sight a year we face. Elaine's face was an instant picture of disappointment. Och, that's nay nice. She said. Then she patted her father's cheek and added. But dinna ye worry. Maggie'll put me to bed just fine. He kissed her hair again, but though he smiled, Magnolia could sense that something was off. He's tired. His eyes are heavy, and his hair flat. He simply looks defeated, not in any way like I've seen him before now. She waited silently while Elaine and Naha talked. Eventually, Naha placed the little girl on the ground, and told her to go pick him a lovely flower to take to his meeting tonight. As she ran off excitedly, he turned to Magnolia. Miss Magnolia, I'd like to give you me apologies for... He started. She waved a hand, realizing the feeling in her stomach was not revulsion, but concern. We both behaved in an untoward manner, my lad. Forget it ever happened. In the silence that followed, she understood now what her father had meant after the meeting. The others were too old, he'd said. Too conspicuous. Not smart enough, frankly. They would not be able to take advantage of a situation when it appeared, not like she could. Here was one such situation delivered to her on a plate. The laird was clearly vulnerable. She could ask him anything she liked. Yet, it was her pity that drove her. Pity, and her promise to Elaine. She hesitated before saying, Are you... Are you quite all right? His lips twitched with an expression that wasn't quite a smile. He looked out to where Elaine was attacking the nearby flowerbed, and went so long without speaking, that Magnolia thought he might never answer. When he did speak, it seemed entirely unrelated to her question. Day you can, Magnolia, that I've been at this lading lark for most of me life, and nothing, nothing, will e'er make me understand man's obsessive, pointless need to go to war. Fear shot through her instantly as he turned his back on her and went to join Elaine at the flowers. War? Why would he talk to me of war? He was expressing disdain, is it a lie? Is he trying to cover something up? Magnolia stared after him, thinking hard. Are the Duke and the Marquis correct after all, then? Is this reserved, wild lad, who seemed to want nothing more than to be a father? secretly plotting against the crown and country I love. But no. No, that made no sense. What reason would Naha have to lie to her? As far as he was aware, she was nothing but a nanny, a lost little Lemur who had left England to start a new life in the Highlands. She had given nobody in the castle any reason to suspect otherwise, least of all him. She prided herself on her discretion. Stop it, Magnolia. It does no good to be paranoid. Paranoia would only lead her to see threats where there were none, and blind her to the real concerns. As Elaine hurried back to her with a bunch of flowers in her hands, now her strolling behind, she shook herself firmly and placed back on her best nannying smile. I just need to apply myself more. That's all. Tonight, after Elaine was asleep, she would go to the library and start her search anew. It was time to get her mind away from fairies, and games, and handsome men, and back into the reason she was here in the first place. Naha leaned over the table, 
his reading glasses pushed up on his face, as he tried to decipher the old-fashioned language in the letters. His meeting with the local lairds had run blessedly short, still too long to put Elaine to bed, but with the bonus of giving him enough time to return to his studies. This collection of letters had been languishing, half-forgotten, in a corner in the library even he rarely visited. The letters were old, from when his grandfather's grandfather was a boy, but they spoke of battles fought and won, and Naha was sure he could glean some knowledge from their yellowed pages. Aye, but that's only if I can work out what these old lads were trying to say. He was so absorbed in his work, that he did not even hear the usual telltale sign of the old wooden doors creaking open. He didn't realize he had company at all until Magnolia cleared her throat. He started, almost knocking over the candle in his surprise. Magnolia was standing uncertainly a few feet from where he sat, as though unsure if she should interrupt or not. I'm sorry, my lad. I didn't mean to frighten you. She said apologetically. I only wanted to let you know I was here. I am surprised to see you, though. Did you not have a meeting? He quickly got to his feet and brushed his hair out of his eyes, then turned to look at her. Magnolia's hair was loose, blonde waves careening over her shoulders, and she wore a simple dress with a cloth robe. She's in her night clothes. She must me have thought anyone would be here. The thought embarrassed him somewhat, but he pretended not to notice. He nodded his head. Aye, but lucky for me I got out quicker than anticipated he answered, averting his eyes from her clothing. She noticed anyway, and her cheeks went a rosy pink color. I forgive me for my attire. I did not expect it. What I mean to say is, it is so late, and... Didn't you worry? He said gruffly. You're entitled to your nightwear at night. Did me Elaine get to bed all right? Oh, yes. Magnolia replied. The awkwardness dropped from her face, replaced by a warm, gentle smile that tugged at Naya's heart. That a woman who was a stranger only ten days ago should care so much for his daughter. It boggled the mind, and not entirely in a bad way. His lips twitched in a responding smile, which seemed to gratify her greatly. She wandered off to the stacks, and he returned to his letters. No matter how hard he tried, However, his eyes kept tracing over the words, memories of Magnolia's voice interrupting him unbidden. On the fifteenth day of the sixth month. My name is Magnolia Limor. I'm a nanny by trade. On the fifteenth. Yes, I'm quite all right. On the. Do what you like, my lad. He scowled, shoving the letter aside. He'd now read the same sentence over and over, trying to move on with the document. But all that he could see was those damned blue eyes, and how they'd crinkled with pleasure at his smile, the care in them whenever they looked at Elaine, and how they'd flamed when they argued a week before. It had been all he could think about for days. Damn it to hell, Naha. What are ye doing? Do. You mind if I sit here? Magnolia's voice came from behind him. She was pointing to the chair next to him, a book in her hand. I thought it would be more prudent to share the candlelight than to light another. Naha blinked and looked up at her, temporarily forgetting how to operate his mouth. She seemed to take this as a refusal. Even in the low light of the flickering flame, Naha could see her blush. I'm sorry, my lad, forgive me for being so forward. I... Sit yourself down. He interrupted. His voice was low and rough, as though he'd only just learned how to talk. Nay point in waste in candles, you're absolutely right. There's plenty of room for both of us. Get yourself together, Naha. Ye sound like a confused old man. Magnolia nodded and slid into the seat. Without a word, she opened her book on the table in front of her and began to read. Naha tried to follow in her example, turning back to his letter. Where was I? On the fifteenth day of the sixth month of battle, Laird McCoyle said. Lord above, she smells of fresh apples and honey. He coughed awkwardly, shifting in his chair, 
angling himself so that he was tilted away from her. Did ye find something to read? He asked. Then he cursed himself, of course she had. What else was she doing right at this moment? He was surprised to see, when he chanced to glance at her, that she had taken a similar position to his on her chair. She was mirroring him, slightly turned away from his body, as if angling for distance. What did that mean? I did. She said politely. I found a history of the castle's forest. Elaine has been telling me all sorts of stories, so I thought I should find some in return. Och, that's grand. He nodded. Grand. There was a beat of silence, and then a hot, unexplained flush went through him. Was it just his imagination, or was the air suddenly thicker? The temperature had risen, for sure. Despite that, the hairs on his arms were standing on end, the skin covered in goose flesh. A fever, maybe? Certainly, it felt like a cold sweat. This is near an illness. Ye fool in neighbourly, least of all yourself. After a pause that seemed to last forever, Magnolia spoke. Her voice sounded slightly higher than usual. What are you reading? Och, just some letters. He replied, glad for the mundanity of her question. Gettin' me ladly duties done an all. So ye had nay trouble wee me wee chook at bedtime? Ye already asked that, ye fool. Oh yes. Magnolia told him absently. She hadn't even noticed the slip, apparently. She was staring determinedly at her book, not meeting his eyes even as she spoke. She was very well behaved. We sang a little song together, and then she went right off into her slumber. That's nice. There was no sound after that but for the rustling of pages, and the slightly sped up breath that now her couldn't seem to get under control. Ten minutes passed. Fifteen. All right. Read. On the fifteenth day of the sixteenth month. My lad? He looked up. Magnolia was watching him, her expression cautious, indecisiveness behind those eyes, and a slight tremble to her lower lip. Eh? Am I? Bothering you? Perhaps I should sit further away? She swallowed. Was she feeling it too? The tension? The heat? Indeed, she looked like she wanted to run away. Am I as bad as of that? What am I thinking? What would Cat say? Yarn ain't botherin' me. He lied. It was the least truth he'd ever spoken. He couldn't remember the last time he felt this bothered. Just read your book, didn't he worry? All right. She said with a small nervous smile, turning away. It has to be more interesting than the old castle logs anyway. He added. The way she looked at him told him in a second that this had been the wrong thing to say. Her mouth tightened, her eyes narrowed, and her whole body tensed. Why? Why would you bring that up? She demanded. There was an edge to her voice now that hadn't been there before. I thought we had moved past it. Or do you intend to continue bringing up a silly argument forever? Despite himself, a wave of frustration flooded his senses. There's no need to get so angry. He could hear the slight patronization in his tone, and regretted it, but really, did she have to start an argument right now? Don't you condescend to me, my lad. She snapped, getting to her feet. I already told you that if my company is not welcome, I will leave. He stood too, towering over her as he did. She was so small and delicate, and yet the look in her eyes as she glared at him was fiercer than any man at war. This woman was proud, and whatever she was hiding in her background was clearly weighing on her, fueling her. Her anger put pink in her cheeks and made her eyes wider, brighter. The way her hair swung around her sloping neck drew his eye. Her state of nighttime dress left her looking vulnerable. She was her own diametric opposite, though, as the fury vibrating from her also made her seem like a deadly, intoxicating poison that he could barely resist. That I didn't want to resist, if I'm honest. What is wrong wee me? 
Why are ye always spoilin' for a fight? He demanded. Are ye homesick? Is that it? Nobody asked ye to leave England behind. I'm not homesick. Magnolia snapped, though he got the feeling that was far from the truth. And you blame me? You started this, Naha. You are warm and cold at a moment's notice, and I am expected to keep up with you. Even Elaine. I've told ye before, didn't ye talk to me about me own ban? He growled. And who day ye think ye are calling Naha? Ye are my employee, and this is my castle, and my title is. Oh, I know what your title is. You expect me to curtsy and apologize and call you my laird, but as you pointed out, I am English. Nobody asked me to be here. Which means you are not my laird, sir. Her fists were clenched by her side, and she took a step forward towards him. A fact for which I am sure you are most grateful. The heat was flaming between them now, radiating from her like a hot fire. They were mere inches from each other her head tilted up to his. He had the sudden mad desire to wrap his arms around her waist, hold her back against the desk, show her a lad's real fury when he was tested. He would have her submit to him fully, willingly, and she would cry out his name in ecstasy as he took her, begging for more, pleading for him. Instead, he breathed in, feeling it shaking on its way back out, and said in a voice as even-tempered as he could manage. Why? He asked in a rough, deep tone, stepping forward and almost wholly closing the gap, showing her that he could not be intimidated by a mere slip of a girl. Why what? She snapped, not flinching away. Why do ye seem so sure of me distaste toward ye? What have I done to make ye see me like this? And why do ye even care so much? He breathed. His voice was more even now, steady but he could barely hear it over the pounding of his own blood in his ears, as it travelled through his body and downwards. Magnolia swallowed. Naha could see it bobbing in her neck. She had an eerie calm when she said, You act suspicious of me. You have done so since I arrived. I do my best to please you, but... He raised his hand without thinking, brushing some of her loose hair from her face. She didn't move away from his touch, but her voice faltered to nothing. I act suspicious to everyone. He muttered. He didn't lower his hand, frozen where he was, hovering just over the impossibly soft skin of Magnolia's cheek. I ask again. Why day ye care? And why day I care, too? She chewed at her lip, and he had a sudden urge to bite it too, feel his teeth against her skin, and his tongue grazing her own. My lad, she said softly. Your opinion matters much, much more to me than it should. Naha couldn't be sure if he moved first or she did, but the next thing he knew, her arms were around his neck, and he was holding her waist, pulling her up and closer as their lips touched. At last, crowed a triumphant voice in his head, at last. It was a soft, slow, sensual kiss starting with their lips closed and moving against each other, as his body ached to be nearer to hers. Then Magnolia's lips parted slightly, and his tongue darted in, just a little. He was rewarded for his daring by a slight moan against his lips, and her own tongue flicked into his mouth in kind. Her arms tightened around him, pulling him closer. He gave a low growl deep in his throat, one hand releasing her waist to travel up her back, and he readied himself to move. First, he'd kiss her cheek then her ear, and then he'd slowly run his tongue and teeth down her neck, until he found that spot in the crook of her neck that had always made Katrina mule like a kitten, and... He froze. Katrina. He dropped his hands as though she had burned him, pushing himself away, abruptly breaking the kiss and backing off. Magnolia was flushed, wide-eyed and panting, but there was a look of self-horror in her eyes, too. Ye shouldn't have done that, Naha. Ye shouldn't be feeling like this. They stared at each other endlessly, unable to pretend it hadn't happened, unable to talk about it. She swallowed again, then bent over the desk to pick up her book and hurried out of the library without a word. He stared after her, his heart still hammering, 
then slipped into his chair. His mind whirled with Katrina, with Magnolia, with soft lips and half-forgotten sighs, with guilt and lust and longing, and it threatened to drown him. He blinked his eyes, forcing the hot prickles away from them, and stared down at the letters. Katrina. Magnolia. On the fifteenth day of the sixth month of battle. Had any war general before him ever felt such a combined sense of victory and defeat as he did at that moment? And what in God's name was he to do next? Chapter 7 The Regret Magnolia opened her eyes as the sun streamed through the window. She'd woken from the most peculiar dream about her father, her mother, and her godson John. As she tried to recollect the details, though, the real memories of the previous night came flooding into her mind, erasing the dream almost entirely. Oh, no. What have you done, Magnolia? She recalled the heat of Naya's breath and the scratch of his beard. She could still feel the way the skin on the back of his neck had felt under her fingers, how his lips had been warm and pliant against her own. And how he'd stared at her, horrified, when they finished. Was it possible to die of embarrassment? She had half a mind to lay here forever and find out. Why did I do that? Why did I kiss him? It was not her first kiss. She'd kissed men before, on a bet or on a whim. Not many, but enough that she knew what it was like. She'd never had a lover, of course. It wouldn't have been proper, and besides, she'd been far too focused on her work, especially after joining the Order. She'd had offers a plenty, but hardly any interested her. A kiss here and there, for curiosity's sake, but nothing else. And that's all this was. Curiosity satisfaction. And now it's done. But she knew that this was a lie. She knew that this kiss had been building in her for days, more than a week, even. Naha angered and frustrated her, but she'd taken notice of Naha's appearance and his body the very second she'd walked into this castle. He was a threat, he was dangerous, but she had wanted him since the second she arrived, even if she didn't know it. And now look at you. A traitor to the crown. Miserable, she pulled the sheets up over her head. She couldn't fend off the daylight forever. She'd have to get up soon. She wished Lizzie was here, that she had someone to talk to, but Lizzie was Magnolia Winterbourne's best friend. She was Magnolia Leemore, the wanton nanny who was slowly signing her country's own death warrant. What would my father say if he knew what I did? What would my mother think of me from heaven? Tears burned at her eyes, and she allowed herself a moment of self-pity under the blanket. Magnolia had been so sure of herself for her whole life, and now. There was a tentative knock at the door. She ignored it. And it's not just now her either, is it? My heart swells when I see Elaine in the day. The child was sweet, kind, and gentle, and she would be her undoing. More than once, Magnolia had pictured herself with a little girl just as perfect as Elaine. Wise beyond her years and eager to learn, she reminded Magnolia of herself in a way that made her fill with pride. But she's the daughter of a threat to your home and to your father. She's no better than a princess from a warring country. Another knock, more insistent this time. Magnolia groaned, still under the blankets. Let them knock. Perhaps she would claim to be sick today. Elaine could spend time with the cook or the maids, and Magnolia could simply put last night's behavior down to a fever. Immoral. Failure. Traitor. A third knock, then she heard someone opening the door. She didn't lower the blankets, hoping whoever it was would leave. Then there were footsteps, and someone stood next to her bed. She cringed, fearing Naha's voice but the person who called her name was much softer. Magnolia? Betty's youthful, uncertain tone shocked Magnolia into paying attention. Are ye sick? Do ye want me to get a healer? Magnolia lowered the covers from her head at last. Aye. Why do you ask? Is it later than I thought? Betty shook her head. Nay, 
but the master is knew well, and he said he thought he might have caught it, too. He's spending the day in bed, and says ye are free today the same. Day ye want me to get ye anything? And denny ye worry, I'll take Elaine today. Poor, sweet Betty. So eager to be kind and helpful. Magnolia couldn't simply pawn the child off on her. Betty had her own job to do. And besides, who does now her think he is? Does he really believe that a single kiss from his lairdship is enough to set me off for a whole day? Never mind what she'd thought just that a moment before. She still felt offended somehow, and too proud to allow such a thing. Sick, indeed. No, she had a job to do. Two jobs. I'm not sick. Betty, she said. Thank you so much for checking on me. I suppose I may have overslept, but do not concern yourself. I am quite well. Betty didn't quite seem to believe her. Ask. We're friends, are we nay? Yes, of course, we're friends. Magnolia told her with genuine surprise. She sat up. Have I been rude to you? I sincerely apologize if so, Betty. I. Nay, nay, it isn't that. Betty assured her. It's just, well, I can see there's something that isn't right we. I haven't got all that many friends, ye can, but I can that friends talk when something's amiss. For a second, Magnolia hesitated. It would be nice, just for a moment, to just be a normal girl. To really be Magnolia Lee Moore, and really be a nanny with no other worries than inappropriateness with the master. If that was all, she could whisper it in Betty's ear, and they could giggle about it together. But she doesn't know who I really am. What I really am. A spy. An English woman who had no reason to be here other than for the good of her country. A silly girl who had already betrayed her homeland with a kiss. A disappointment of the woman who had let her father down, if she was honest, because it wasn't just a kiss. She felt something, something she'd never felt for any man. And beyond all that, she was a failed infiltrator who had already started to love a child so much, she feared she would never be able to turn against her when the time came. You would not be my friend if you knew such things, Betty. I'm fine. She said aloud. I apologize for concerning you, but I assure you that there is no need to worry. I shall be up and dressed soon enough. Can you stay with Elaine until then? Betty frowned. Of course. She agreed, but she sighed. But, Magnolia, just so you know. I'm not the only one who cares about ye. Elaine loves ye to bits, and me ma'am is fond of ye as well. The gardener, old Sandy, he sings ye praises every chance he gets after ye rescue at the lock. He thinks ye are an angel sent from above. Magnolia flinched internally, because she knew Betty was doing everything she could to make her feel better. If only her new friend knew she was just making her feel worse, much worse. I'm no angel, Betty. I'm from the South, here to prevent a war. A war she still had no evidence even existed. Probably because she had spent all her time playing at fantasy games with Elaine, and making moon eyes at the very lad she'd been sent here to watch. I just mean. Betty continued. Tha if you're feeling homesick, that's normal. But we can be like a second family to ye here, too. Magnolia's eyes itched with tears at that, but she'd learned from practice not to let them show. To Betty, it just looked like she was giving her a bright smile. Thank you, Betty. She said. And yes, I think. I think I am finding it much harder to be away from home than I expected. That, at least, was the truth. Betty smiled back at her and touched her shoulder in a friendly manner. Me and me ma'am will see to Elaine's breakfast. Dinny ye rush yourself, all right? Magnolia nodded, thanking her again. Betty smiled and turned to go. She hesitated in the doorway as if she had something else to say, but she seemed to change her mind. Betty closed the door behind her, leaving Magnolia alone. Magnolia waited until she was absolutely sure she was alone, before allowing a tear to fall. 
she let the downheartedness overwhelm her, just for a little while. At least this way I can clear it from my system. When she stopped crying, she wiped her eyes with her bedsheet, feeling rather silly, quite tired, and very sure that she had a lot of making up to do to her family and to the crown. She would put aside this silliness with Naha, and distance herself, as much as possible, from Elaine. Her eyes fell on the book from last night, abandoned on her desk, where she'd placed it just after entering in favor of hiding under her blankets. A Traveler's Guide to Clan McFoyle At least I did one thing correctly last night. She was rather proud of the quick thinking she had used when Naha asked her what she was reading. Even though she'd been oppressed by the awkwardness, and the closeness of his body, and her own mind had been clouded by foolish lust, she'd been able to think of something. It was true. The book did tell of the forest, but Magnolia was not reading it due to Elaine's fairy stories. No, it was written from a much more practical standpoint. If it came to war, her country would be able to use this tome for a tactical advantage in the attack. If it came to war. If. Well, her job was to avoid that, and now it was time to do something about it. Elaine had been asking for days to take Magnolia down into the village, and introduce her to the clansmen. Today was out, as she was already late and had to attend to Elaine's lessons, but tomorrow. Perhaps tomorrow, it would be time for a little excursion. Naha stared at the ceiling, at the curtains, at anything except the portrait of his wife that sat on his bedside table. He felt sure that if he glanced in its direction, he would see the accusation in her grey eyes, betrayal for what he'd done. I remember when we met, Cat. We were both so young, and we thought we'd live forever. And they had been. Young and in love. They'd had a courtship since childhood, before they'd even realized what they were doing. He still recalled the moment he'd laid eyes on Katrina for the first time. William's mother's sister had moved back to the clan after the death of her husband, and brought her nine-year-old daughter with her. Naha and William had been practicing swordplay with wooden planks, when the latter's aunt had walked in, holding the girl's hand. Ye already ken your cousin, William. Katrina's mother had told her. And this is Naha Irvin. Laird McFoyle the younger. We'll be in his service one day. Naha had only been eleven years old. He'd known nothing of women, of love, of the sweet agony they could bring. Yet he vividly recalled even now, that second when her shrewd grey eyes met his green for the first time, and she gave him a polite smile of greeting. It was like a flash of lightning, like a bolt from the sky waking something in him that he'd previously not known existed. All he'd known at that moment was that he'd do anything just to see that pretty smile one more time. A flash I thought I'd never feel again, but now. Guilt lanced through him, and he forced that thought away. Back then, young William had noticed too. He'd teased Naha about it almost every day, before either of them had really known what the teasing meant. Katrina had spent a lot of time with her cousin over the next few months and years, which meant that she also spent a lot of time with Naha. Naha was expected to marry a laird's daughter. So when he kissed Katrina for the first time at fourteen, William had been the only one to hear of it. His best friend had kept his secret, even joking in public about how he thought Naha was simply not the marrying kind. Those were sweet days. Katrina and William and my parents, all alive, all happy. He'd been just seventeen years old when his parents were both killed. They'd been visiting England for tense peace talks, and apparently had been attacked by highwaymen. Naha wasn't sure he bought that story, not when the lord they visited stood to benefit. Nay, Naha. Nay time for these conspiracies and wild fantasies now. He'd been devastated, barely more than a child, but the duty of the lairdship had now been his. So he'd set out to meet a wife, as a young laird must needs have a lady to help shoulder his rule. He remembered how Katrina had come to him one night, when she'd heard of his pending engagement. How she'd looked determined, the same determination he still saw burning in Elaine's eyes to this day. Ye asked me if I loved ye, Cat. Of course I said I, but that I didn't see how it mattered. 
But it had mattered. It had mattered more than anything. Katrina had asked him to wed her, rather than the traditional way around, and Naha had found it impossible to refuse. He dogged with his advisers, his uncles, everyone who thought they should have a say. But William stood by him, and Katrina had been steadfast and reliable, so married they were. They were supposed to spend the rest of their lives together. He had sworn it. And when ye died and left me we the bairn, I swore I'd never lose faith. He'd meant it. He had no intention of loving again. No woman could replace Katrina, no woman could come close. And yet when he thought of Magnolia's lips against his, of that bright spark in her eyes, in the way she made Elaine laugh and smile, everything felt a little murkier than before. Remember what I'd want for ye and Elaine. The apparition of Katrina had told him. She'd want them to be together. She'd wish for Naha to remember they were family. She wouldn't want him dallying with some English nanny and insulting her memory. She wouldn't want him to feel the complicated things he felt, every time he heard Magnolia's name. Naha grunted and turned to the side, finally looking at the portrait. Katrina's eyes stared at him, knowingly, as if she was reading his very thoughts. Forgive me, Katrina. Forgive me. Though God only knew if he'd ever be able to forgive himself. Elaine managed to slip away from Betty after breakfast, while the maid was talking to the cook. Elaine knew she didn't have much time, because Betty always caught her when she ran off, but she needed to get to the forest. Sorry, Betty. I hope I didn't get ye into trouble. She reached the little mound far enough away from the edge that the fair folk couldn't get to her and sat. She checked behind her, Betty hadn't come after her yet. Good. Elaine turned her focus to the forest and said, in as loud and clear of a voice as she could muster, Mommy, I need your help. Daddy is acting awfully strange, and Maggie is an all. She frowned. I didn't care what's the matter. She sighed, folding her arms. They were alright for a wee while, and now they're stranger than ever. Daddy is in his bed, says he is new well. Daddy is never unwell. And he says Maggie might be sick too, and I dinny ken what's wrong with them. I'm worried about. Elaine. A voice called from behind her, and she turned her head to see not only Betty, but Magnolia too, hurrying towards her. Betty looked very upset. Quickly, she turned back to the forest. Please, Mommy. Help me. Magnolia and Betty reached her side, and Magnolia said, You shouldn't run off like that, Elaine. You terrified poor Betty. Please apologize immediately. Elaine nodded, affecting a sad expression. I. I'm sorry, Betty. She said. That's all right, Elaine. But didn't he run off like that again? Betty replied, hugging her tight. I will nee. She promised. As she left with the maid and her nanny, she thought hard one more time. Please help me to help them, Mommy. Elaine had never heard her mother's voice, but the wind in the trees was gentle, and the way it sounded was achingly familiar. It almost seemed to say, I'll day me best, Mo Crea. Maybe she'd imagined it, and perhaps she hadn't, but Elaine felt stronger for it. She knew one thing for sure. For Magnolia, and for Daddy, Elaine had to do her best, too. Chapter 8 The Farmer's Widow Magnolia and Elaine wore matching deep blue dresses, as they made their winding way down from the castle into the village. Elaine had been very excited by the prospect of them going down together looking the same, so Magnolia had hardly been able to refuse her. We look like a real family. Elaine told her excitedly, clinging to her hand as they passed along the tree-lined path that led down to where the clansmen lived. Even as Magnolia smiled, she felt a lance of guilt. My father is my family. Your family is a threat, Elaine. That thought was the right thing, so why did that make her feel guilty, as well? She shook it off. 
she had much more important things to worry about than word choice right at this moment in time. Today would be the first day she had ever spent time alone in the clan's village. This meant that today she could talk to the ordinary folks and maybe, finally, understand what the Scots were planning. And at last, I may be able to get my mind occupied by something other than what happened in the library two nights ago. Maggie, look. Look. It's Bernie. Elaine said excitedly, squeezing her hands and drawing her out of her maudlin thoughts. Bernie. Hail, Bernie. Come and meet Maggie at last. A boy who had been playing in the garden looked up at the sound of his name. He was a little older than Elaine, perhaps six or so, and he had a round, ruddy face and frayed clothing that marked him out as a farmer's son. He brightened at the sight of her, and hurried out of his garden to meet them. Good morrow to ye. He said happily. I haven't seen ye in a while. Then he turned, nervously pulling at his tattered too big cap, and gave Magnolia a nervous little bow. And God's blessed greetings to ye as well, me lady. Magnolia couldn't help but smile at the formality of the child's gestures. A lady I am not, she said. At least, not here. Not now. I am just Elaine's nanny. You may call me Magnolia, or Maggie if you like. Are you a farmer? young man? Bernie straightened up, blushing bright red. Och, that's awfully kind of ye, he said with a bashful grin. Well, me lad, I mean miss, I'm Bernard Reed. Me mum runs the farm since me dad died in the fighting when I was just a baby. I day me best to help out. Bernie's me friend, Maggie, just like ye are, Elaine said proudly. His mam is always ready to gi me a piece and jam whenever I like. She makes the jam herself, too. She's just made breakfast, if you want to come in. Bernie suggested happily. She'd be more than happy to feed ye both. Magnolia was ready to refuse, she simply couldn't take food out of the mouths of what was obviously a poor family, when she realized that this was an opportunity. Before she had a chance to worry about the moral quandary. Elaine had solved it for her. Come on, Maggie. You've got to try this jam. She said, pulling impatiently at her hand. Inside, Bernie's mother didn't even seem surprised by the sudden guests. She just smiled and bid them sit, and busied herself fetching them bread. Elaine happily chewed on a slathered piece of bread and jam, making happy little noises as she did. Mrs. Reed, ye dinny half make the best jam in the world. Did ye grow these strawberries? Aye, I did. Mrs. Reed said, pleased. It's the right season for it, and I ken how ye and Bernie love it. I was gonna bring some up for Yerda, too, and Eliza and her Betty. Ye think they'd like that? They'd love it. Elaine told her. What about ye, Maggie? Day ye love it as much as I day? Magnolia took a dainty bite of her own bread, and was startled by the explosion of flavor in her mouth. The strawberries were somehow both sharper and sweeter than any she had tried before, and the jam was sugared just enough to emphasize, without overwhelming the fruit. It's delightful, Mrs. Reed. She gasped. Why thank ye, Miss Leemore. Please, call me Greta. Everyone else does. Greta told her with a smile. Why don't we let the bairns go play in the garden and we can have a talk? I haven't e got wine, but there's always ale. Ye must be fair starved for adult company up at Thorn Castle. Why, she's younger than I am. She must have still been half a girl, when her husband died and left her with Bernie. Magnolia felt a surge of sympathy for this woman. How lonely she must be. Yes, she might be able to get information from Greta, but it was more sympathy than cunning that drove her when she agreed. I'd love to have some ale with you, Greta. She said politely, though she'd much prefer wine. And please, know me as Magnolia. Greta beamed. The children were sent outside to play, once they were finished heating, and Magnolia sipped at the ale. She wasn't so fond of the taste, usually, 
but Greta's homemade concoction wasn't bad at all. The two women talked about this and that, finding each other's company surprisingly welcome. Magnolia realized after half an hour that, if she did not want to waste the day, she would need to push a little. So, Greta. You lost your husband in the war. I, Greta said gravely. I was barely a Ben myself, just one and twenty. He went off to serve alongside Laird McFoyle, and the next thing I kent, Commander Candlish is at me door with his hat in his hands. Bernie only met his father once, poor lad. Magnolia recognized the name, Commander Candlish had recently visited the castle, much to Elaine's excitement, but Magnolia hadn't met him herself. She tried to picture the scene, a woman of one and twenty with a tiny baby in her arms, opening the door to be told her husband would never return. Magnolia felt her eyes burning just at the concept, imagining how Lizzie would fare with little John if the same were to happen to her. But then, Lizzie was protected. Greta was poor, more bereft than anyone Magnolia personally knew. She seemed so happy, though, despite her misfortunes. That was both bizarre and beautiful. I'm sorry for your loss, Magnolia said, reaching out to gently touch the back of the other woman's hand. War is terrible. Aye, but after the English retreated, Milaird and Commander Candlish did everything they could to help us. Milaird, especially, is a boon to this village. I can he still feels guilt about how he could need help us more, but he did all he could. Greta said with a soft smile. Why, I think half the widows and orphaned daughters in the village fair fell in love with him, after it was said and done. She was joking, of course but her word choice made Magnolia flush a bright fiery red. In love? With Nath Laird McFoyle? I'd have thought him too reserved for the tastes of women. Greta shrugged. Och, he's reserved, that's true, but all he's hiding is a heart softer than a feather. Him and Commander Candlish both, they spent their time visiting us, bringing food to us and our bands. Me Laird emptied his own pockets, to make sure I could keep me husband's farm. That, and after losing his own wife so young. Magnolia stared at her, shocked by the gentle tone of voice the young woman used while talking about Naha. Had he really done all of that? Used his own money to fund the village? Spent his grieving time for the good of the clan? She thought of him and his gruff manner. But then she thought of his kind eyes, his gentle tone when he spoke with Elaine, the softness of his lips against Magnolia's. Enough of that. Enough. Greta was watching out of the window, looking at how the children played together. She had a pleased smile on her face. He dosni put on airs and graces either, does me eat lad? Greta said. His wee Ben has been friends wee me lad, since she was old enough to play. I didn't think she even kens the difference in their social status, except that she's gonna rule the castle one day. Is that right? Magnolia asked, turning to watch them too. Elaine was chasing Bernie in circles, both of them laughing wildly. Aye. Me Lady Katrina, God rest her soul, she was one of us. A wee bit higher, but still just the daughter of an old soldier. Milaird was told again and again that he was nay to wed her, but he did regardless out of love. He's got a big heart, that man. Greta said fondly. He loves his clan, all of us, like his own family. Magnolia's eyes itched, and she worried she might cry. In her mind's eye, all she could see was a young Ganaha. Lost and alone after the death of his parents, finding love and clinging to it treating his people the best he could with no experience. Despite knowing better, she felt a sudden rush of affection towards him, which alarmed her more than almost anything. Yes, there was a war, a war against my people. He may very well be planning another. That steeled her a little, and she said. Does his lordship often send his soldiers to war? Greta shook her head solemnly. Laird MacFoyle has never sent a soldier to day battle if he or his commander was nay right there in the thick of it with them. He detests war. He just wants us to be safe. The farmer's wife's eyes widened in alarm. 
Why day ye ask, Magnolia? Day ye can something? Ask. Are the soldiers coming back again? Fear shot across Greta's face. I can hear English. Dinny get me wrong, I can it is ne your fault. But we can e stand another attack. I can e bear to lose me boy as well as me husband. It's the last thing me laird wants, too. Nobody is coming. Magnolia told her soothingly, though she had no idea how true that was. What Greta was telling her made no sense. The way she described it was as though there was no plot at all. As if the McFoyle clan were actively looking to avoid war. It gave Magnolia a hard lump in her stomach at the thought. Could she have been in the wrong this whole time? Her father, the Duke, the Marquis, the Viscount, had all of them been wrong? I was sent here to uncover a villain. Are we perhaps the villains instead? But no. No. Magnolia could not let a momentary kiss, and the words of a loyal subject, turn her against her crown and country. She would not let these things turn her against her father. Magnolia was sent here for a reason, and it was still her duty to discover what Naha was hiding behind those forest green eyes. When Elaine came back inside and took her by the hand, insisting it was time for them to visit the rest of the village, Magnolia left with her gladly. She liked Greta a lot, rather too much, but being here was making her uncomfortable. The poor woman was too honest, too loving, too genuine to be lying. But she simply could not be telling the truth, because that would change everything, in a way that Magnolia could not begin to understand. As she and Elaine said her goodbyes, the nanny was deep in thought. Where are my loyalties? What do I do now? That wasn't a question at all. You keep going, Magnolia. That's what you've always done. The rest of the trip to the village had been one of the strangest experiences of her life. Some of the clan had looked at her with wariness or open spite due to her nationality. Still, even these people had warm words for Elaine and sweet words to say about Naha. The McFoyal clan simply seemed to be kind people in general, something that made that uneasiness gnawing at her conscience only grow. If Naha was plotting in secret with the other lads to attack Magnolia's home, then his people knew little or nothing about it. And yet, if it comes to war, these are the people who will suffer. Old men, widows, and children. But there were old men, widows, and children a plenty in England too. They were equally threatened by war, equally at risk from the fighting. She could not forget that. She would not. Magnolia and Elaine had barely entered the castle doors when the little girl let out a screech of happiness and cried, Daddy. There ye are. I was worried. Magnolia's cheeks were instantly pink again, and she cursed them for betraying her even as she curtsied. My lad. She greeted in a low mumble. She couldn't meet his eyes. This was the first time she had seen Naha since the kiss the night before last. To her shame, she could still feel the heat springing up instantly the second she glanced his way. Even when she wasn't looking, his presence loomed in her mind. He lives there now, in my mind. I don't know that he'll ever leave. Good eve, me Weechuk. Naha said, scooping Elaine up into his arms as usual and kissing her cheek as she laughed. And a better eve now that ye're here. Daddy, ye are really sick any more? Elaine asked, worried. Maggie hasn't been as sick as ye thought, but I was worried about ye. Have you experienced a touch of fever, my lad? Magnolia asked. Despite the awkwardness, she couldn't help but tease him slightly, and she was rewarded by his skin reddening to match his beard. He met her eyes then, and her heart lurched in a way she had to admit was not entirely unpleasant. He frowned. But there was amusement there at her playful taunting, too. I, he said. I, a fever perhaps indeed. I've been having all sorts of strange dreams. What kind of dreams, Daddy? Elaine asked brightly. She did not seem to notice the energy sparking from her father, as he stared at Magnolia, and the same from Magnolia as she stared right back. 
he cleared his throat. Magnolia watched him, her breath held as she waited for his answer. Naha's green eyes sparked with a meaningful look, and then he smiled at Elaine. Ok, all sorts. Ya fever daddy has been dreamin' about doin' things nobody in their right mind would be doin'. Magnolia knew she should feel relief at those words, but she couldn't help a shiver of offense anyway. Nobody in their right mind? She echoed, a little accusation in her tone. Naha met her eyes again over Elaine's head, but Magnolia couldn't make out what his expression meant this time. Aye. He answered. Dreams where a silly lad steps out of line and does foolish things nobody could excuse him for. So he regrets it, then. He thinks he acted untowardly. He should regret it. So should she. Why on earth was her brain behaving in such a maddening manner? Of course, my lad. I think the summer is affecting all of us in our common sense. Magnolia replied. Naha chuckled. Why didn't ye take the rest of the day, Magnolia? I'll stay with the ban. William's coming over again later, and Elaine would be right upset at me if I didn't ye let her play with her favorite uncle. That's very generous, my lad. Magnolia told him, once again taken aback by her surprise. And not necessary. I know that you are busy, and... I, but ye are busier the time, too. I never even saw this wee button yesterday. It's a right. Take the evening to yourself. Ye've had her all day out in the village, ye must be tired. He said softly. Oh, yes, Maggie. I'd like to go play with Uncle William. Please. Elaine asked, looking to Magnolia with those wide, silvery, pleading eyes. Magnolia couldn't help but laugh. Well, all right, then. I suppose I shall find some other way to occupy my evening. Thank you, my lad. He nodded at her. She walked forward to move past them, but as her body approached his, she was almost overwhelmed by a sudden, intense longing. She ached to touch him again, to taste his lips once more. She wished to run her fingers over the hard muscles and the deceivingly soft skin, to feel what it was like to be in his power, and to have him in her own power. Magnolia. Naho gruffly said after she had passed. She shook her head to clear those ridiculous thoughts before turning back to him. Yes? I will need be visiting the library this eve. Just so you can. Nah had told her. Then without another word, he turned and carried Elaine off into another corridor. Magnolia stayed where she was, staring at where he'd been. What was that supposed to mean? Was he talking about the kiss? About the books? Or about something decidedly more sinister? Just what was going on with this secretive lad, who everyone seemed to love, anyway. Chapter 9 the laird and the commander. Not for the first time, Naho wondered to himself what Magnolia was looking for. It was clear to him now that she was searching for something, but he hadn't a clue what. Did she wish for a new husband? A new home? Perhaps her old ones had been less than satisfactory. Or did she dream above her station? That was unlikely but possible. She is high-born, of that I am fair certain. Though maybe not as high as I thought. Perhaps she was looking for a rise in her social status. That would explain why a nanny had travelled all the way from the south of England to work in the Highlands. It was a far journey even for some Scots, never mind for such a foreign woman. Or maybe she simply wanted to be educated beyond what her parents had ever allowed. It wasn't entirely uncommon in women of her assumed status. She indeed spends a lot of her time in me library. Maybe it's learning she's seeking in all those dusty old tomes. One thing was obvious. Magnolia was more than just a traveling nanny. She had an agenda, one that was not yet clear to Naha. And yet, and yet, despite all that, he trusted her. He'd realized this to his shock and discomfort during his rest day after the kiss. Whatever her goal, it didn't matter. 
She cares about Elaine. She wouldn't hurt her. And it went further than Elaine. Naha cared about Magnolia, too. He still didn't know how he was supposed to feel about that. It felt like a form of unfaithfulness. He'd never felt anything close for any woman except for Katrina, and he felt as though he was betraying his wife's memory by lusting after the nanny. Ye were raised better than this. What would your faith have to say? If he was honest, he had no idea. He had not been old enough to really talk of women before his father was taken from him. Nothing would happen with Magnolia, of course. He would not, could not, push this any further. Better that he drew a line now before this could go any further. She probably felt nothing for him, regardless. Better I stop thinking of a soft wave to her golden hair, or the pretty way her skin dips where her neck meets her shoulder blades, or those remarkable bright blue eyes. Ye thinking about your nanny again, Naha? William's crude, playful voice interrupted his ponderings. Want me to get someone to fetch some cold water for ye ahead? Maybe we should splash it over ye, just to be safe. Naha scowled at him though he was secretly grateful for his friend's light-heartedness. She is Nimi Nanny, William. Quit your Japan. Aye, but ye were thinking of her. William teased. Or are ye gonna tell me that ye were ni? Shut your mouth, ye dobber. Naha replied. He picked up a piece of lint from his desk and flicked it in William's direction. Where it struck, William theatrically fell back in his seat. Ye've slain me, Laird Bampot. All hail your greatness. Tell me wife that me last words were, I only wish I could have bedded ye one last time. He dramatically recited, sprawled in his chair with closed eyes. Off he gobby for a dead man. Naha commented, rolling his eyes. I can't it was a mistake telling ye about what happened we Magnolia. It was a one-time thing. It will ne happen again. Mm, so ye say. William straightened up, clearly bored of being mocked dead, and leaned forward with his elbows on Naha's desk instead. Though what I didn't understand, is why are the fuss about a kiss in the first place? It is isn't like ye bedded her or anything. Naha stared at him, images he'd forbidden suddenly racing through his mind. Magnolia, dressed only in her petticoats, sprawled on his bed and waiting for him. Magnolia pinned against a desk in the library. Magnolia, as stark naked as the fair folk in the dewy night grass as she waited for him to take her. Magnolia, where Katrina used to be. The thought jolted him out of the pleasant images, leaving him feeling shaken, confused, and he shook his head. His voice was low and rough when he finally responded. Stop. I just. I canny. It would need be right. Says who? William asked, frowning a little. There is ni any wrong in being happy, Naha. Naha shook his head, too many feelings in his heart to concentrate on one at a time. Nay. Nay. Ye dinny understand, William. Katrina. Katrina is dead. William said, gentle but firm at the same time. She's been dead for years. She wouldn't want ye languish in a way like some. Ye didn't ken cat in the same way I did. Naha interrupted, more forcefully than he intended. Ye didn't ken what she would have wanted. Ye didn't. She was me cousin long before she was your wife, Naha. William reminded him. His tone was a little colder, and Naha instantly felt guilty. Dinny ye think for a second that I dinny miss her too. I day. She was the closest thing I'll ever have to a sister. Dinny act like you're the only one who got hurt when she passed. Naha let out a sigh and then nodded. William had been devastated, it was true. And yet, he'd also been the only reason Naha hadn't drowned in his own sorrow. They'd kept each other afloat. Ye right. Forgive me for doing ye such a disservice. I'm right sorry. I am. William grunted, but nodded tightly back to show that there was no harm done.
his expression was much stiffer than usual, though. The two sat in unnatural quiet for a moment, and Naha began to worry he'd done damage to the only steady friendship he had left. But then William relaxed and spoke more casually, if slightly more officially than before. Did you read my report about the food supplies? He asked. Naha's blood ran cold at the reminder, and he reached into his desk and drew it out. I did. I wish I did me. How sure are ye? William's expression turned from annoyance into genuine sadness and exhaustion. Naha knew it was mirrored on his own face. I'm fair certain. There are really enough able-bodied folk in the village to make enough storage for winter. And Laird McCullen has officially cancelled the supply run. Naha's fist tightened, and he banged it on the table. Why? Why does he want to leave me people to starve? Have any we gone to service and his own many times? Have any we been allies since the time of my grandfather? William nodded gravely. Aye, but your grandfather isn't in the seat any more. Neither is your father. It's ye he's got a problem we, Naha, ye can that. Naha scowled, resting his elbows on the desk and his forehead in the palms of his hands. Is this about young Agnes again? Tis. William confirmed. Didn't ye have her faith and her to dinner again two months back? Didn't they show any signs of this then? I did. Naha replied. Agnes McCullen was a fine girl of nineteen or so who, as her father kept hinting, had magnificent childbearing hips. But he never mentioned a cease in trade. Curse that man. He knew that Laird McCullen had expected him to marry Agnes when she reached eighteen the previous year. Naha knew how it seemed from the other Laird's point of view, he had spent close to four years in mourning at that point, more than enough time to fill requirements. What else could I want but a young, willing wife? Well, to start, one that is nee still half a child herself. Agnes was sweet enough, but she was very young and not entirely bright. Yes, she was exceptionally pretty, but even if Naha was to consider marrying again, that would never be enough to tempt him. He sighed. I didn't ken what I have to say, to convince his lairdship that both me and Agnes would be much happier, if he'd just leave her be. Naha grunted. And leave me be, Anna. William shrugged. I mean, ye could always just wed her. William. Och, didn't he get so righteous wee me? William replied, holding his hands up. I have any suggested fallen in love or even bed in the lass. Ye needn't even get her we a ban. Just arrange a wedding, treat her kind, and her the will open up our supply route again. Ye canny say Katrina would be averse to that. Naha ground his forehead with the heels of his hands. William was right. Strategically, it would be the best move. He would just have to marry Agnes on paper only, and her father would be satisfied. And then he could be sure that his people would be fed for another winter. Simple. In theory. But. Och, I dinna ken, William. It feels. Wrong. He said with a deep sigh. I can he explain it. I can it's a simple solution. But I just didn't think it's the right one for me, and for the clan. William tilted his head, examining him. There was no judgment in his friend's eyes. When William looked at him like that, Naha felt like the other man could see into his very soul. Ye can he explain it, I? William asked. There was no teasing to it this time. Are ye certain of that? I'm certain. Naha said firmly. It is ne about, there is ne. William raised his right hand. Whatever ye say, Naha. The point is, we still need to keep these people fed, regardless. What day ye have to suggest instead, your lordship? Naha straightened in his seat, grateful that William hadn't pressed any further. He gathered himself together, putting himself back into the mindset that was required of him as Laird McFoyle. What about our funds? Can we split them between the townsfolk? It worked last year, Anne. 
But William was already shaking his head. Your coffers are near empty, me lad. He said respectfully. He'd slipped back into commander rather than friend, as he always did when discussing important matters of strategy. It was one of the things Nahar appreciated most about him. Empty? Naha repeated as if hoping he'd misheard. Enough for standard village maintenance, keep in the castle and your staff, and keep in the soldiers fed and watered. There isn't much else left. Certainly isn't enough for the whole village. The thing about giving away all your money, Naha, is that when it's gone, it's gone for good. Naha groaned but gave an affirmative gesture to show he'd understood. What about the soldiers? Can we get them to work in the fields? I can most of the drafted are either under the ground or already back we their families, but your professionals. Aye, they're already doing what they can. It still isn't enough. William replied. There still isn't really anybody left but the old, the children, and the women folk. The lassies are trying as hard as they can. Ye can Greta Reed, she's running Rabbi's farm all by herself now. God rest his soul. And God rest her back, too. Naya added. He could feel despair settling into his bones at the thought. There Ben still off wee. What would he be now, six? Seven? Too wee to be much use in the fields. Aye, and the rest of the clan's bands, as well. There's just no enough of them to go around. Even we all the women break in their backs to help out and the old grandfathers till in the fields. William ran a hand through his hair. If you will ni marry Agnes, and I dinny blame ye if ye will ni, then we need to think of something else, and fast. Summer has a way of ending when ye least expect it. Aye. Naha agreed. That's what worries me. Magnolia had a book in her hand as she headed back to her bedroom. She couldn't stop thinking about Naha's comment about the library, and what message he had been trying to send. He'd been true to his word, she'd been there for close to two hours, and he'd never shown. And nobody needs to know of the slight disappointment you feel at that fact, Magnolia. Still, she felt like taking the book with her was safer than staying much longer as the night hours dwindled. Between this one and the forest tome, she'd have enough to draft up a solid plan of the area. She should send it along with her letter when the month ended, a time which seemed to be approaching more and more rapidly. What else did she have to show for it? Nothing. The clansmen loved their laird. The servants were pleasant and seemed unaware of any plots. Naha was an enigma, and Elaine was just a child. Have I wasted my time? Have I failed? So caught up in her thoughts was she that she didn't notice the man in front of her until he spoke, causing her to jump near out of her skin. Ye must be the famous Miss Lee Moore. The man said. I feel like we've been acquainted half me life already, the way Elaine and Naha go on and on about ye. May I call ye by your first name? Magnolia blinked, staring. He was very handsome, in a decidedly different way from Naha. A little shorter, a little more refined, and with a general colouring that made her think of the Scottish seasides which she'd passed on the way here. Perhaps, sir, but not until we are properly acquainted. She said. She may be playing a nanny now, but that did not mean that this man could take liberties. You know me? After a fashion. And a ye can me? He waggled his eyebrows, his grey eyes shining an easy grin on his face. Despite herself, Magnolia felt the corners of her own lips quirking up. This man was simply friendly. No mystery, no intrigue. No forbidden attraction. No deep longing which I can barely comprehend. He was handsome without being a threat, and she suddenly was glad she had run into him. He seemed like he would be pleasant to speak with even if she was fairly certain from the context how careful she would have to be with her words. Am I to assume by your mention of my laird and Elaine that you are Commander Candlish, sir? Magnolia asked. Me friends call me William. The commander said with a bright smile. And the lassies call me Will. He winked, 
then laughed. Dinny tell my wife I said that, or I'll be in for a scalpin. Eh? What? Magnolia asked, her amusement building at his japery. A scalpin. Ye can, what day ye call it, a right smack about the place. She'll box me ears for even suggesting such a thing, even though I wouldn't dream of even glancing at another woman when me Abby waits at home. He donned a pious expression that looked ridiculous on his face. Magnolia could not help but chuckle. I am sure Mrs. Candlish would never doubt the integrity of your church vows, sir. Och, I, I'm a man of God, well and true. He snorted. At least on a Sunday, or when the bents ask about it. Are ye on your way to see Naha, Miss Magnolia? Why would he think that? She felt a cold flush overcome her, and she couldn't tell if it was fear, embarrassment, or something else altogether. Whatever do you mean? William tilted his head, appearing innocent. Why, the lateness of the hour, it's awfully strange that ye should be walking along this corridor, if ye didn't intend to see him. His study is just three doors hence. Magnolia shivered. And why would I be going to visit his lairdship so late at night? I'm not sure I enjoy what you imply. William held up his hands. Ye misunderstand me greatly. All I meant was that I assumed ye had some business we are now. I can ye can ye get a minute to yourself. I assume ye've come to talk about your salary or such like. She felt herself cringe internally. Of course, that's what he'd meant. As if he would be implying. Good God, Magnolia. Get a grip on yourself. Magnolia managed to keep the embarrassment out of her face as she replied, though. Actually, I am just on the way back to my quarters. I spent some time in the library tonight. I had not realized quite how late it has grown until just now. She could feel William watching her. She wasn't sure why, but she had the oddest feeling that she was undergoing some form of examination, as his storm cloud eyes swept over her in consideration. I, William said. He still sounded casual but there was a layer to his tone that Magnolia didn't understand. Aye, that makes sense. Naha did say he liked to spend a lot of time in the library. He's quite the wee bookworm himself, too. Do you know what happened between us? Did he tell you? Mayhaps someday ye'll both end up in there alone together. I didn't imagine that'd be a problem, though, for a fine lady such as yourself. He gave her a mysterious grin. Aye. I'll perhaps see ye in the morning. Have a fair evening. William started to walk away, then paused. I think ye should maybe check in on me lad before ye go to sleep. He added. Magnolia was about to ask why, but by the time she'd gathered her mind, he'd already wandered away. Why on earth would I do that? But even as she thought it, she was moving three doors hence and knocking her knuckles against the painted wood. Naha looked up in surprise at the knock. Away we, William. Go and haunt the corridors and leave me in peace. The door creaked open. I'm sorry, my lad. Magnolia's slightly embarrassed voice came, followed by a peek of her face. Commander Candlish seemed to think I should speak with you. If you're busy, I'll go on to bed. Chagrin and irritation flooded Naha. He'd get William for this. Was this his friend's idea of a joke? Magnolia. Forgive me, I thought you were someone else. Magnolia hesitated, then pushed the door open a little further. She seemed wary of stepping inside, as if she wasn't sure what would happen if she did. I, and Namor am I. Whatever happened to me self-control? She hovered in the doorway and said. Is, uh, is everything quite all right? Naha just managed not to laugh. Aye, as grand as can be expected. Dinny ye concern yourself. Away and get some rest. She nodded, looking a strange mix of disappointed and relieved. Well, good night. She said. Sleep well. He replied softly, 
as she turned and closed the door behind her. He looked back down at his papers, but the words were suddenly swimming in front of him. Was it so late? Was he exhausted? Just distracted, ye old fool. He grunted. Maybe he should turn in for the night, too. But after his discussion with William, it felt wrong to stop working. He picked up the letter he'd been trying to write for an hour, pleading with Laird McCullen to be reasonable. She's awfully pretty, that lass. Came a familiar voice in his mind. He knew that if he glanced around, he'd see his constant companion, Katrina's apparition, once more. Agnes? He asked out loud wearily. Ye think I should wed her, then? Katrina's willowy laugh echoed in his ears. Didn't he play the fool we me, now her Irvin? William and I, we can both see it, plain as day. He grunted, not turning. If he saw Katrina's image, even in his mind, it might break in right now. Didn't ye worry, cat? I can what ye need from me. I'll remain unwed, unbound, and focus only on Elaine. The wind outside the window sounded like a sigh, and he could hear Katrina's voice once more. Och, naha. For someone who spends a his time talking to me in his imagination, ye sure dinny listen to a word I say. Naha straightened and turned despite himself, craving that glance at her, even if he was envisioning the whole thing. But the room was empty. There was no Katrina. No Magnolia. Naha was alone. Chapter 10 The Gilly-Doo Nighttime in the Highlands was an ethereal experience compared to home. The sky seemed darker, the stars brighter, and though the summer wind was cooler than she was used to, it was a sweet bite. Magnolia could hear the insects chirping and singing in the grass, as she wandered through the gardens. It was far too late to be outside, but Magnolia had been restless for days. Her search had proven fruitless once more, and her self-doubt was beginning to rise. She and Elaine had visited the village a few times, only for Magnolia to find herself unwittingly making friends and having the time of her life. Admit it, Magnolia, they're good people. You just don't know how to reconcile it with the truth. Or, rather, what she had believed was the truth. The whole mission, everything she'd held close to her heart. Nothing seemed certain any more. It was messing with her head, which was one of the reasons she'd wandered out into the grounds tonight. Two weeks, now. Half the time has gone, and what do I have to show for it? Little and less was the truthful answer. Magnolia sighed as she paced through Sandy's neatly kept flower beds, the full moon high above her illuminating her path. She heard a distant howl, were there wolves in the fairy forest? Perhaps the unseelie gnomes rode them into battle, while the seelie pixies mounted foxes? Smiling at that silly image, she walked on. She turned a corner, her back on the lake, into a more well-trimmed section of the gardens. It was the lawn where the laird sometimes laid out tables for his guests in the good weather. Magnolia walked a little further, now with a destination in mind. The air felt clean, breathable and she could hear and see much more clearly than in the gardens at Elphinstone. Was it the Scottish atmosphere, or had being here actually heightened her senses? She couldn't know for sure. In the centre of the area sat the ornate fountain, topped with a carved stone statue that was only made more majestic by its weather-formed age. Magnolia had often admired it on her walks with Elaine. Perhaps I shall go and sit at the fountain now. I may even toss a coin in for good luck. The statue was one of her favorite features of the McFoyle Castle grounds. Unlike most fountains, the figure it bore was a male, tall and disheveled but still strangely beautiful, with moss-carved where clothing would be on a normal man. As she reached the fountain, she continued to examine the statue and the water pouring from the jug in his hands. On closer inspection, she could see names scratched into the plinth at his feet some so old that real moss had all but filled their gaps. The most recent scratchings looked perhaps twenty years old, maybe a little less, and it was with a jolt she recognized three of the names. 
Katrina Kelton, Naha Irvin, William Candlish. She reached out, ignoring the cool splashing of water on her skin, and traced Naha's name on the damp rock. How long ago had he done this? Why? We call him the Gilly Doo, a voice said, startling her out of her thoughts. Only then did Magnolia notice that Naha himself was here, sitting on the other side of the fountain. Nath my lad. I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. Magnolia told him, giving him a little curtsy. It was true, Magnolia had no idea Naha was present until he spoke. He'd previously been hidden by the statue as he watched the stars, but now he was looking at her curiously. Day ye like him? He's beautiful. She answered, her eyes flicking between him and the statue. What does Gilly do mean? Naha smiled, getting to his feet and walking closer to her, also looking up. The Gilly do, the dark haired youth, is one of the Aos Sith. Do you ken of them? I do, indeed. Magnolia agreed. As he moved next to her, she felt a pleasant warmth deep in her bones, that had very little to do with the rather fresh summer air. Elaine has taught me several lessons on fey creatures since I arrived. The laird chuckled at that. Is that right, I? Me Elaine loves her fair folk, it's true. I know ye didn't call them by their more common name. Are ye superstitious, Magnolia? He's right. I didn't call them fairies like I usually would. How odd. She shrugged. I suppose I like to keep my bets open, my lad. Elaine seems rather certain I shall be cursed, if the folk hear me call them by that name. I see no issue in being cautious, even if I do not really believe something bad will happen. Naha nodded. Wise. He said. He turned to look at her for the first time, and she saw that his eyes were even more tired than before the dark circles thicker, the defeated angle to his shoulders more pronounced. Had he really been sick? Was he now ill? Magnolia couldn't help but feel a rush of concern. My lay. She started, but he interrupted as if he hadn't heard her start speaking. Has Elaine told ye the story of the Gilly Do? He asked. It was one of me favorites as a bairn. Magnolia was ready to protest but she saw a softness in his eyes at the mention. Maybe right now, a good fairy story would help more than any platitudes. I don't know it. She admitted. Will you tell it to me? Surprise crossed Naha's expression, but only for a second. He nodded, sitting heavily down on the fountain side once more, and beckoned she join him. She sat, a little nearer than him than she usually would or than etiquette would dictate. She told herself firmly that it was so she could hear him over the pouring water of the fountain. Naha began to talk, and she realized something she'd never known. He had a voice for telling stories, deep, rich, and robust, and as he spoke, she found herself spellbound. As I said, the Gilly Doo is a member of the Aos Sith, but he's kept separate from most of the other nobility. He likes to keep himself to himself. He lives in the mountains and forests, and makes his clothes from moss and bracken, and whatever else he can find, uninterested in the politics of the Fey courts. I see why you like him. Magnolia teased, and she was rewarded by a faint smile on his lips. Oh, I? He asked. Shall I tell ye the rest of the story, or are ye gonna just make fun a night? Magnolia laughed. My apologies, my lad. Go on. Naha seemed to relax more as he spoke, and Magnolia felt a shiver of pleasure that talking with her should be of such help to him. He glanced at the statue once more, then began to tell the story. Well, one day, long, long ago, the Gilly Doo found a wheel ass lost in the woods. Some call her Jessie, some Maggie, some Nancy. Whatever her name was, she was properly lost. She'd been missing from her wee village for days. Her mither and faith had half the clan out looking for her. How old was she? Och, around ages we are Elaine. Four, five, 
six at oldest. A skinny wee lass we nay business being out and about in forests all on her own. She got turned away trying to get to her aunt's house, so the story goes. Magnolia could picture it vividly, Elaine, with her bright red plaited hair, lost deep in the forest, calling for help where nobody could hear. The thought made her tremor with worry, even though she knew Elaine was safe. So, what happened? Well, it was awfully late, so he took care of her for the evening. Then in the morning, he led the wee lass through the forest and to the village boundaries, where her mother found her safe and sound. Naha smiled, and Magnolia could not help but notice how the moonlight highlighted his features, making his feline eyes shine, and his pale skin glow. He looked like an ancient marble statue, except for the wild hair and beard that marked him out apart from any other man she'd ever known. He's as smooth as he is dangerous. Beautiful. He is beautiful. This time, she didn't berate herself for the thought. She just kept looking as she asked quietly. Is that the end of the story? The smile slipped from his face, and he looked weary once more. Nay. Nay, it doesn't end so peaceful I'm afraid. See, people didn't like what they didn't understand. The clan where she lived was more focused on warring and hunting, than they were on the return of their ban. So once the wee lass told her story, they gathered the finest hunters in the clan and sent them after the gilly Doo. Sadness fluttered in Magnolia's chest, as she turned from Naha to the statue once more. The strange moss-clothed man looked proud but tired and sad, too. In fact, when she looked between the fairy's expression and the laird's, she could scarce tell the difference. Did they catch him? Naha shook his head. Nay, that they did me. He replied. They searched the woods for weeks and months and even years, but they never saw any part of the creature. And yet, whenever a child of the clan went missing in the woods, they'd always turn up again wee stories of a fairy man who led them home. They sat in silence when he finished talking, Magnolia turning the story over in her mind. The similarities between the laird and the fae man were more than just in their poise, she realized. Why are you and Commander Candlish's names on the plinth? I, and Lady Katrina's, too. He turned to trace his finger along the wet carvings. And this here is my faither, Sinead Irvin, and his faither and mother, Sherlock and Morag. Then there's my grandfather's faither, and his before him, and so on until he can he see them for their age. It was back then that me ancestor commissioned the statue, ye can. He said the Gilly had a lot in common we the men in our clan. You wrote your name out of tradition? She asked. Aye, so that if I ever went missing in the woods, the kind Sith would see his way to getting me back home. I insisted me friends be allowed to put their names, too, that's why William and Katrina are there. He laughed gently. Kat really believed she'd be spirited away with the fair folk, one day. Maybe she was right the whole time. Magnolia waited for a moment, gathering her thoughts. The chirping of the crickets and the gentle breeze, combined with the steady beat of the fountain were the only sounds in the world. She could picture the gilly do now. A benevolent creature, a protector of children, forced into hiding by men in their lust for war. Before she even realized what she was doing, she'd reached out one of her hands and rested it on top of Naha's. He flinched in surprise at the touch, but he neither moved away nor told her to stop. Instead, he looked up into her face, those green eyes filled with questions. Questions I can never give you the answers to. Not really. Instead, she spoke in a quiet voice she barely recognized as her own and said, I can deny it no longer. It seems strange to me, but you are extraordinarily kind, Naha. She waited, but when he didn't comment on her use of his first name, she continued. You value what many men do not. Family. Home. Your people. I have rarely met your like. He made a soft sound that was halfway between a groan and a whimper, but she could have imagined it for all it showed on his face. He continued to gaze at her, and when he spoke, his voice was gentle. Eh? And what day most men value, 
in year estimation. War. The hunt, as you said. Possessions and greed and domination. Magnolia answered without hesitation. At least back home, that is all that interests most. Not my father, though. And not you. You are just like the fey creature in this statue. Oh? You care for your people more than anything. You'd give them the clothes from your back, if you thought it would help. And your family, your Elaine. She's the world to you. Magnolia explained. Just like I am the world to my own father. His hand curled around hers, but he didn't say anything as he waited for her to continue. And as for war. You talk of war with disgust, like no man I have ever known. Naha breathed a laugh. I, well. It's less charming once your village has been raised again and again, while ye can day naught but watch. Magnolia stared at him. But that's simply not true. Greta Reed told me you gave them money from your own pocket. Owen Macduff says you and Commander Candlish have actively worked the fields with them. Nobody blames you, not for any of it. It was strange to her that she of all people should be defending this laird against himself, but Magnolia had been raised to believe in the value of truth. It mattered not what she might yet discover in her remaining time, right now, all she saw was a good man, and it was her duty to be honest. Naha had the oddest expression on his face. It wasn't entirely sad nor happy. It wasn't angry, and it wasn't embarrassed. His reaction to her words was one she could not name. Eventually, he sighed. Well, whatever rumors me people have been spreading, it is near enough. He said. It is as though the burden on his shoulders just got even more oppressive. He seems to physically shrink. She didn't move her hand from his and turned her body, so that she was facing him as fully as she could while still sitting. What isn't enough? He gazed down at their joined hands as he spoke. Summer ends, Magnolia. More harshly here than ye can ever imagine in your safe wee houses down south. Ye've met my people? Then ye can how poor they are. How thinly spread. Ye spoke a Greta Reed. Do you think her and we burn the Argonne be able to put enough away for the winter all by themselves? What are you talking about? There isn't enough money, and there isn't enough food. If I didn't need day something soon, me people are gonna starve. What kind of lair days that make me? The desperation in his voice tugged at Magnolia's heart. I'm running out of options. I wish somebody could just tell me what I'm supposed to day. The fountain water continued to rain down, and Magnolia kept holding Naha's hand in abstract comfort, as she faced the reality of what he was telling her. His people have not recovered from the previous war. They may not survive the winter months. What did that mean for the Order's suspicions? What did that mean for Magnolia's entire purpose of being here? What are your options? She asked him gently. Perhaps I can listen. Perhaps I may be able to help. He huffed another strangled breathy laugh. I've only got one that would work for sure. He admitted, still not looking at Magnolia. I didn't want to day it, but I'm beginning to think it's me only choice. For Elaine. For me people. What kind of lad would I be if I put myself first? What kind of faither? For some reason, Magnolia's heart began to pound more heavily at that, a strange heavy ache in her chest. With her free hand, she very slowly reached out. She paused once, twice, but eventually, her hand found his cheek. Her fingers brushed the bristles of his beard, and she slowly, slowly moved his face so that he was looking at her once more. You are an excellent father, she said. Of that, at least, I can assure you. Elaine thinks you are the world. He moved. For a second, she thought he was going to make her let him go, but instead, he leaned into her touch, closing his eyes as he did. They sat like that for a moment, and then Magnolia said. What is the option, Naha? He sighed and closed his eyes, still leaning against her hand. Commander Candlish thinks I should wed the daughter or a local laird. 
Agnes Father is closing off our supply routes out of spite that I remain single. It'd be the quickest way to solve all me problems in one fell swoop. Magnolia went still. Oh. She said, a new coldness in her voice. I see. What are you doing? Why are you speaking to him like that? She ground her teeth, forcing herself back to propriety. What I mean is, well, it sounds like a good option, even if not your favored one. Political marriages are made for worse reasons. It really is a dutiful way to solve everything. He opened his eyes, and Magnolia's heart fluttered as his fey eyes stared into her own. Dutiful, I. He agreed. So you think I should date it? Yes, of course. No. You can't. She shook her head against her own thoughts. What I mean, my lad, is that it sounds like the most prudent option for sure. They looked at each other, and then Naha asked. But? But what? Ye sound hesitant. Tell me your advice true, Magnolia. He said. There was a deep undercurrent to his voice now, one that made all the little hairs on Magnolia's skin stand on end. Ye think it's the most prudent option, but what? I. Ye dinny think I should wed the girl? I don't, Naha, I. His expression hardened, though in determination rather than anger. Why nay? And then Magnolia's hand tightened slightly, pulling his face towards hers, and she met his lips with her own once more. It was not like the library. This kiss had something to say, and though she didn't know how to put it in words, she put it all here. She let go of his hand, wrapping that hand around his neck, the one already on his face moving back and tangling in his strangely soft wild hair. Her fingers tightened, holding him close while her lips moved against his, desperate to send a message to him that she didn't even understand fully herself. Her nerves stood on end as he responded almost instantly, letting out a small growl and wrapping his arms around her waist, pulling her to him. His tongue demanded access, and her lips parted readily, eager for the closeness, for the feeling of him against her. She let out a little sigh at the warmth of his hands, his lips, and it turned into a reluctant whine as he drew back from her. But it was only to pepper and possibly light kisses down her cheek, her jaw, each featherlight touch sending spikes of heat and need she'd never known. She wanted to give in entirely. She longed to climb into his lap right now, give herself over to him, forget everything else. She wanted to simply be a woman with new, exciting feelings for a man who wanted her with none of the complications involved. His mouth was on her own again, and they pressed closer to each other. She could feel his desperation, too, and it thrilled her. But you do have responsibilities, Magnolia. Stop playing pretend. She pulled back abruptly, and they both stared, breathing heavily. Their bodies were still close enough to feel each other's heat, their arms even now around each other. Slowly, they stilled, and Naha seemed to lag, resting his forehead against her own. I admit it, I've been wanting that again for days. He murmured. But I'm sorry, Magnolia. I canny. I canny go any further than this. I shouldn't, I canny. She touched his cheek again, this time gently. Don't worry. No more can I. She replied quietly because she could not. She had two weeks remaining here at the castle. Even if she never found anything about any coming war, and, really, it looked increasingly likely that she would not, she would have to leave, and soon. And even if she didn't, what basis for a relationship was this? Any of this? He didn't even know her real name. Whatever fantasies she had started to entertain over the last few weeks, they could never come to pass. To her horror, she found tears in her eyes. Ask. Are you going to marry Agnes? She asked, sniffing. He put his arms around her again, this time in a gentle embrace. There's naught wrong we the girl, but I didn't want to wed her. I'm nay. I shouldn't be marrying anyone. It's the same reason I can't go any further we this. 
We. Elaine's mother? Magnolia guessed. He didn't say anything, but the wistful sigh was answer enough. She sighed too. I've. I've never been in love, Naha. I do not pretend to know what complex things you feel for Katrina. But I lost my mother, and to this day, it informs everything I do. I do not expect it. Even if I was able, which I am not, I would not expect you to abandon her. Nah has studied her, his arms still holding her. You're a rare one, Magnolia. Me Ben is lucky to have ye, whatever it is that brought ye here. She said nothing, merely leaning into his chest and allowing herself to enjoy his warmth. They sat in the embrace like that for some time, and then Magnolia spoke again. Let me help you. Oh? Let me. I don't know, come to the town with you. Help you plan how to speak to the other lairds, and to the people. I'm sure I can help you find a solution that doesn't require your discomfort. Magnolia said. I have been told I have a way with words. He actually chuckled. He moved back, wiping away a stray tear from her cheek with his finger. Aye, that ye dare and no mistake. He agreed. All right. Ye can help me if ye want. Magnolia smiled and leaned forward to kiss his bearded cheek. Then she sat back, looking up at the Gilly-Doo statue once more. Everything she thought she knew had changed. Everything she believed was upside down. Crown and country were still relying on her, but now Naha needed her too. Could she do both? I know one thing. I cannot let this infatuation transform into anything further. But. Are we friends now, then? She asked, turning back to look at him. Aye. He said with a tired smile. Aye, we're friends. And that will have to be enough. Chapter 11 The Widower Elaine didn't know what had changed between her nanny and her father, but she knew she was happy with the results. They still seemed a little awkward around each other, but it wasn't in the same bad way from before. Daddy even sometimes laughed at Maggie's jokes. I canny remember the last time Daddy laughed, and it was nay because of me or Uncle William. And Daddy seemed lighter in other ways, too. He was spending more time away from his study. He was still really busy, Elaine knew, but he made a point of seeing her more often. Today, for example, all three were taking a walk down to the village together. Hold me hand, Elaine. I didn't want ye getting lost. Her daddy said for the third time. Magnolia laughed. She's fine, Naha. She kens, I mean, she knows the way better than anyone. Both Naha and Elaine looked at her in surprise, and Elaine giggled with delight. The Scots word sounded so funny coming from Maggie's English voice. Naha was smirking, too. Och, I, ye can, de ye? He teased. Magnolia rolled her eyes. A slip of the tongue, I assure you. Elaine grinned. You're picking up Scots just by being here, Maggie. You'll be speaking forlorn Gaelic like me and Daddy can before ye can it. With a gentle smile, Magnolia said. I'm not so sure about all of that. Je parle un peu de français, why ye hablar un poco de espanol. I also read Latin, and ancient Greek, as my father was determined that I have as much education as possible. I am not sure there's room in my brain for yet more languages, especially one as complex and beautiful as yours. Naha chuckled. Spanish, French, Latin, Greek. I suppose Chani Leon Chan and Guli or, I? What does that mean? Magnolia asked, but Naha just laughed again and started walking off ahead. Elaine hurried to Magnolia's side, taking her by the hand. Didn't he worry? He always speaks Gaelic when we're going to visit the clan. It means one language is near enough. She whispered. Oh. Magnolia said. It's stunning. 
Wouldn't it be funny if I taught ye some Gaelic phrases? Ye could use them on daddy when he doesn't expect it, to get back at him for teasing ye. What day ye think? Elaine asked excitedly. Magnolia had an odd look on her face as she stared at Naha's back ahead of them, but when she turned back to Elaine, her usual gentle smile was in place once more. You know, Elaine, I think that sounds like an entertaining idea. They visited Greta first. Naha claimed he wished to thank her personally, for the jam that Magnolia and Elaine had brought back with them after their last visit. Magnolia spent some time catching up with her new friend. Then Elaine asked if she was allowed to stay here, while Naha and Magnolia went about their business. Me and Bernie have a new game, and I really want to play some more. Can I, Daddy? Can I, Maggie? Please. She begged. I, please, if ye kindly would. Bernie added. I've been hard at work on the farm a week, I'd fair love a wee break to play wee Elaine. Can we, please? You should ask your mother. Magnolia told him, while Naha watched with that little amused smirk on his face, that seemed to be slowly becoming a permanent feature. After all, she will be the one who has to care for Elaine as well as you. Didn't worry about that. I can care for myself. Elaine insisted. Is that so? Naha asked, folding his arms and giving a theatrical sigh that reminded Magnolia of Commander Candlish. Ock, well. I suppose I'll have to send Magnolia back then. If ye can look after yourself, ye dinny need a nanny. Elaine's eyes widened. What? Nay. Nay, nay, I canny. I'm just a wee bairn, I need a nanny, I day, daddy, really, I. He's teasing you. Magnolia assured her, shooting now her an exasperated look. Honestly. How silly. Greta chuckled. You're right animated today, Elaine. She said. She turned to Naha. Me lad, you're welcome to leave her here while ye and Magnolia day what needs to ain. I promise I will ne let her get spirited away. If anything, ye'd better watch out for my Elaine spirit and ye away yourself. Naha replied, ruffling his daughter's hair fondly. She's half fay herself, I sometimes think. Magnolia stood back and watched, her heart softening at the lightness in Naha's tone and movements, as he interacted with Elaine and with Greta and Bernie. A good man. Truly good. If only I knew what that meant for me. They walked together through the village, keeping a respectable distance without it feeling like they were trying to avoid each other. Naha was surprised, and a little relieved, by how comfortable he felt around Magnolia even now. Turns out I'm a big enough lad that a couple we kisses didn't need to ruin a friendship after a that. That was good. It assuaged Naha's guilt about his confused feelings, and gave him time and space to focus on the real problems. Magnolia had suggested they visit Ewan MacLeod, after Greta told her about the village headman. Though Naha knew the old man's title was nothing but honorary, especially now, he figured it would do no harm to visit the old widower. They reached the top of the hill where Yoon's little hut resided, separate from the rest of the clan. It was really small, covered in moss and grass, looking more like a pixie house from a fairy story than a human dwelling. Naha knocked on the door, and they waited. He lives here? Alone? Magnolia asked, clearly surprised. Naha nodded. Aye. MacLeod used to live in the middle of the village, right around the whole clan. He was friends wi my grandfather, and then me father, and he worked well managed in the day-to-day -day things we could me. But... But before he could explain what had happened, the door opened, and the old man made his way slowly and painfully through. Eh? What day ye want? If ye're here to steal me fortune, ye're too late. The old man said, then started to laugh. It sounded like a witch's cackle mixed with a hacking cough. Naha saw Magnolia flinch. He was impressed that the woman did not verbally react at all. Most people gasped or exclaimed in surprise the first time they saw Ewan. 
He was near 90 years old, bent over almost double, only able to walk by clutching a walking staff near as old as he was. The pate of his head was completely bald, covered in dark moles and freckles, though long white hair sprouted madly from the sides of his scalp and down past his ears. He was thinner than any man Naha had ever met, and his skin, always pale, was now near translucent. He had four teeth in his wrinkled mouth, and his fingers that curled around the staff looked stiff and arthritic. But none of that was the shocking part. No, that was his eyes. They had been blue, once, but that had been a long time ago. Now they were milky white and clouded over, the irises barely distinguishable from the whites, the pupils barely visible at all. And yet, for all his evident blindness, he let off a strange aura of being able to see everything about a person. It's me, Naha Irvin, sir. Naha said with respect. He may be Ewan's liege laird, but Ewan had been a core part of this village long before Naha had drawn his first breath. I've come to visit ye. Are you busy? We Naha? Ewan asked, and then cackled again. What's we Naha doing all the way up here at Miwi Hut? Arena ye supposed to be the laird of the castle now? How dare ye have time to be visiting her mitts? Naha saw Magnolia glance at him with alarm, but he just gave her a reassuring smile. What kind of laird would I be if I didn't visit friends and family, Mr. McLeod? Aye, aye. True enough. The old blind man agreed. And who's we? Is that Katrina? Did ye bring me some of your bonny stories, lass? Magnolia blanched and hesitated, clearly uncertain on how to respond. Naha grimaced. Katrina's did. Dinna ye remember? She went just before the last war when me Ben was born. Och. Och. A shame, a shame. But that's nae bairn ye've got with ye. Ye caught in again, be ye thea? Hard to believe ye're old enough for a that even now. Ewan muttered to himself. Naha smiled to himself. He hadn't heard that nickname since his father passed. Naha's name meant snake, and the Beethia was a giant and fearsome serpent of myth. His father used to call him that every time he said he'd grown. Nay, sir, I. Ewan either did not hear or did not care. I remember when Yer Atha brought Yer Mither to meet me for the first time. I could see back then, and ye were ni born. I recall. I'm not, we are not courting, sir. Magnolia interrupted gently. I'm simply Elaine's nanny. My laird has requested me to join him in his tour of the village today. English. Ewan exclaimed. Ye are caught in an English lass. Good God above, Bethia, have the times changed that much while I've been trapped here in Miwi Hut? What else is going on at yon castle? Magnolia shook her head emphatically. No, sir, we are not. Naha held up his hand, indicating to her that it was no use trying to argue with the old man, when he got an idea in his head. May we come in, Mr. McLeod? Ok I, ok I. Leave your Englishness outside, lass, and ye can come in. He turned and hobbled inside, leaving the door open, still muttering as he walked. If the wheel air trusts ye, then ye're good here, I suppose. Magnolia blinked a few times. A dot how do I leave my Englishness outside, exactly? She asked in a low voice. Naha laughed, a hearty laugh that he felt in his chest. He felt a lightness that he hadn't in a long time, even while he worried about the coming winter. From your new friendship, no doubt. And nothing else. The two of them followed Ewan inside. The hut was tiny. A small bed sat in one corner with a thin blanket. In the center of the room was a little table with some chairs haphazardly arranged around it. There were some cabinets and a box for his clothes, an empty fireplace, and a grubby window. A basket of food sat on the table. Naha knew that the locals kept Ewan fed, bringing him something every day. It relieved him. The old man couldn't take care of himself and was too stubborn to accept any further help. 
Ewan felt his way to the table and sat down in one of the rickety old chairs. Magnolia and Naha followed suit. So, Miss English Nanny. Do you have a name? Ewan asked, turning his head blindly in her direction. Magnolia looked briefly alarmed, but she simply nodded. Yes, I'm. My name is Magnolia, sir. Humph. Very fancy-like. Proper English. Day you got another one? The old man demanded, folding his arms over his chest. Mr. MacLeod, please. Naha said gently, trying to remind the man of his manners. It's all right. Elaine and Bernie Reed call me Maggie. You're welcome to as well if you find it more palatable. Magnolia said. Do you live here alone, Mr. MacLeod? Is there anything you would like us to bring you? Ewan's face unfurled into a toothy grin. Ock, I, ock, I, I ken it now. Ye might be English, but ye've got a big Scots heart beaten in that chest. Nay wonder he's smitten. Magnolia is me daughter's nanny, Mr. MacLeod. Naha reminded him gently, though he had to admit a particular pleasure at the slight blush on Magnolia's cheeks. Ock. Lighter your castle staff, lighter each other, lighter yourself if you must, but dinny waste your breath lying to me, Bethia. I've kent your family since me and your grandfather were lads. I ken when a lad is smitten. The old man harumphed and tapped his forehead. Or day ye think because I've shriveled away yonder, I've forgotten about the needs a man? Magnolia was determinedly looking away, now and Naha couldn't tell if he felt more embarrassed or amused at Ewan's insistence. For her sake, he pressed on rather than arguing further, and allowing the hermit to dig his heels in further. We came to talk about the winter, Mr. MacLeod. It's come in harsh this year, and we're running low on supplies. I ken the clan listens to ye near as much or even more than they listen to me. Have ye heard anything? He asked. Are we to starve to death, then? Ewan asked, sounding supremely unconcerned by the prospect. Nay. The young'uns will ne allow it. Dinna ye worry yourself, lad. Chaniel twil air natch tiktrogad. There's nae flood that will ne subside. If only I could be thar positive. What's that? Magnolia asked. Was that Gaelic? Ewan turned his blind eyes to her once more. Aye, that it be, lass. Maggie, was it? Yes, sir. She said. Maggie, tell me true. Day ye care for we be thea? Ewan asked her. I will need talk more until ye answer. Naha's heart thudded, and he turned to see her reaction. She simply smiled and said. Of course I do. He is a good employer, a great laird, and an increasingly dear friend. Aye, and ye're a diplomat. Ewan laughed, clapping his hands together. And his bairn. Elaine? What to Elaine? Naha asked him. I care for Elaine very much, too. Magnolia said, and Naha's breath stuttered at the pure honesty in her statement. She is a brilliant child, good and kind and pure. I would do anything to keep her safe and happy. Just the same as how Nahai would do for her and for his people. That seemed to be the right answer to whatever strange game Ewan was playing with her. Right, then. Let me tell ye something, Maggie. When the winter comes, I'll be the first among the dead. Magnolia was already shaking her head before he finished speaking. Nonsense. Nonsense. Nobody needs to die. We will find a solution. Has his lordship told you how bad things are? How bad they really are, I mean. Ewan leaned across the table, and Naha felt a tight discomfort in his stomach. He knew Greta Reed had told her some of it, but he had the feeling Ewan would not be so gentle. Tell me, then. Magnolia said, looking the old man full in the face. Ewan smiled but it was a bitter expression. Bethia can try as hard as he likes, but he's got nay money to feed his people. The farmhands are a deed. 
I lost all four of my sons and my seven grandsons, as well as me I side fighting against thon English armies, trying to protect this land. Me only daughter went well birth in a bairn that never met her faither. That we orphan lass lived here we me and me wife until she was a woman grown. Does she live in the village now? Magnolia asked. Naha winced and unconsciously put his hand out to take hers, as if he could protect her from the knowledge that was coming. Ok, nay, Ewan said. Three years back, during the last skirmish, some English soldier took a liking to me granddaughter. She disappeared. I have any seen nor heard from her since. She ran off with him? Magnolia asked, though Naha could tell by her voice that she suspected something much darker. That's the belief that I cling to, lass. Ewan said grimly. Me wife died the very same month, and I've been up here by myself ever since. Magnolia was very quiet, and Naha felt the slight pressure of her hand in his as she took the comfort he was offering. Day ye ken why I'm telling ye all this, Maggie? Ewan asked. I don't, Magnolia said. Her voice was thick, as though she was trying to prevent tears. But please, do tell me. Ewan nodded in approval. Two reasons, depending on why ye're here. The first reason is that ye're English, lass. Many of us will need trust ye, but Bethia seems to. Day ye think ye deserve that trust? Naha glanced at her face again, but her expression was inscrutable. Ewan didn't wait for her to answer, anyway, before he continued. If ye day, then when ye go back home, tell them the sad story I just tellt ye. Tell them how we can ye day it any more. The McFoyle clan is powerful the land over, it's true, and Laird McFoyle's voice has always spoken for the way to any two other lairds, but the clan is struggling. We're nay asking for help. We dinny want war. We just want to be left alone. Magnolia said nothing. She withdrew her hand from Nahas, and he felt strangely empty at its loss. Magnolia is an Annie, Mr. MacLeod. He said gruffly. She has no say in the politics of countries. I am sure she'd want to avoid war just as much as any of us day. Ewan nodded pensively. Aye, that might be true. And if it is, lass, that brings me to me second reason. If ye're really wanting to help, I need ye to remember something. Magnolia leaned forward. And what is that, sir? Ewan leaned over the table, grasping at the air until Magnolia caught his withered old hand between her own. He smiled and said, Chanarin dudwint sambith sabisa ianim dudam haster. The old man said, Do ye understand, lass? Nobody can give full service to two masters. Why would he tell her that? And of course, she couldn't understand. She didn't speak any Gaelic, after all. Even some folk in the lowlands of Scotland wouldn't understand, never mind this English girl. But there was a strange look on Magnolia's face as she responded calmly. You know, I may not comprehend the words, Mr. MacLeod. She said. But I think I understand your meaning perfectly. Ewan patted her hand. Good lass. Then I. Maybe ye can help after a. Perhaps there's life in this old clan yet. Chapter 12 The Plan Magnolia, Naha, and William sat together in the Laird's study, discussing everything they had learned and planned over the previous four days. If William thought it strange that Elaine's nanny should be involved in this discussion, Magnolia didn't sense it from him at all. She had been shocked when Naha had asked her to join them. It had been just over half a week since they had agreed to be friends, and their relationship had changed spectacularly. He comes to play with Elaine and me whenever he can. He seeks my opinion. In short, he treated her as almost an equal something which Magnolia would have never expected. And he truly valued her input on the food shortage crisis, which is why she was here now. We simply can't force Laird McCullen to open the supply route. She said, shaking her head at William's suggestion. I understand the impulse, but you must realize that such an act of aggression will lead to more fighting. 
That is the last thing the village or the people need. She caught Naha looking at her as she spoke and saw a rare softness in his eyes, a gentle smile on his lips at her words. It sent warmth through her skin and her bones, leaving tingling pleasure at the end of her fingertips. William seemed less impressed. Aye, that might be, but the first thing the clan needs is food, Magnolia. Unless ye're gonna tell me ye're a witch and can magic it out of thin air, I'm gonna need something more to go on. McCullen is the only other laird around. Naya offered. It'd mean travelling further. I'd probably have to go myself and make whatever devil deal they propose, but we could reach out to Laird Taylor, or Laird McLeish. William nodded. Aye, I thought of that, but Laird McLeish is a tricky one to barter we. They look up to the McFoyle clan in times of warfare, but if he senses weakness, we can he guarantee he will need turn it to his own advantage. And Laird Taylor? Magnolia asked. I know not of him. That's because there's nay much to Ken. William said with a shrug. Aye, he's a laird, but his clan is vastly depleted. Taylor is clinging to his status and nay more. He can keep his people fed, but everyone everywhere kens him as a wee hen heart. He's just a lad, barely eighteen. So you worry begging from a boy would cause the same issue appear in weak? Naha said, sighing. You're right, of course, as usual. We can e risk it. I dinny. What if you're thinking about this in the wrong way? Magnolia said suddenly. Both men turned to look at her in surprise, but she took it in her stride. She was used to surprising people by speaking out at meetings, after all. What if these things you see as problems are solutions? William looked at Naha and shrugged, gesturing for her to continue. Naha nodded and turned back to her. Tell us what ye mean, Magnolia. He said. How delightfully bizarre. These men care not that I am but a woman, they want to know my plan anyway. It was so unlike what she was used to in the order that she took a few moments to gather herself. Then she folded her hands on the table and said. I think we should focus on the young laird Taylor. I understand that he seems to be a weaker option, but we could spin that to our advantage. She paused, but Naha just nodded encouragingly, telling her silently to go on. She smiled and continued. Naha should travel to Laird Taylor's clan's lands. He can bring Elaine, which means I would also go with him, which gives him another set of eyes and ears. We needn't take a big party, just the three of us. Oh, I? William said, raising an eyebrow teasingly, then wincing. Magnolia had the feeling Naha had just kicked him under the table. Still, she pretended not to notice as she continued. Meanwhile, you, Commander Candlish, would take some of your soldiers out on regular patrol. Perhaps some of their womenfolk or even children could follow, too, to visit their friends in other clans. Let them discuss how the great Laird McFoyle would turn to a milksop such as Laird Taylor before considering his own closest ally and Laird McCullen she said. Magnolia paused again, waiting as the men processed what she'd said. To her heart's delight, she saw a slow, incredulous smile unfold on Naha's face, and his eyes seemed to glow with pride as he looked at her. Ye mean to shame him into open and the supply route? He surmised. Ye think the gossip of his people will force him to act? I do. She agreed. William burst into laughter. Well, well. Looks like Yawi Nani has a heed for politics. He said. Who would have thought? And ye really wrong either, Magnolia. Laird McCullen's a proud old goat. That's why he's so head up about Naha Mary and his Agnes in the first place. If we turn that against him, we may get what we need without having to do a single thing. We'd need to let it be known that we're leaving. Naha said absently his thoughts obviously going quicker than his words could keep up. Magnolia could help Betty and Eliza spread the word down in the village. Greta will help, too. Magnolia added, feeling a surge of excitement that her plan would possibly solve the crisis for Naha's people once and for all. 
and perhaps Elaine could convince little Bernie to spread it among the children. You know how children like to tell each other tall tales. William snorted. Aye, and bairns are vicious in a way we adults canny dream. If they start whispering stories, ye can be sure they'll be toxic shame by the time they reach McCullen's ears. It might take a few days to travel back and forth from the Taylor clan's lands, though. Naha cautioned. It's quite a journey to ask of ye, especially if we're bringing Elaine along as well. Are ye sure you're up to it? Magnolia nodded seriously. I travelled up from England by myself, did I not? I want to help the people of the village in any way I can. And besides, I will never mind seeing a little more of the Highland view. This is such a beautiful country. Naha gave her that heart-wrenching grin again. Perhaps I cannot kiss him again without becoming a traitor, but I can at least allow myself to bask in that warm smile. William was giving her the same odd look that he'd given her that night they'd met in the hallway for the first time. It was as though he was waiting, searching for something, and she had no idea if she could pass his test. Finally, William nodded. It could work. I can that me soldiers and the village women would love the chance to stretch their legs and visit yonder clans. And everybody loves a good wee trip to Thonrum and Mill. Magnolia smiled. I'm glad you like my idea, gentlemen. When would we set it in motion? Ye should take Elaine and visit Greta at first light in the morning. She's always up early to tend to her farm, and the more time she and wee Bernie get to spread their word, the better. I'll stay here and plan for the travel, and if all goes well, we can set off two days hence. Magnolia felt a flutter in her belly at the thought. Travelling alone with Naha and Elaine was simple in theory, but would it be so in practice? She could not be sure. Can I trust him? Can I trust myself? She looked at William, who had the strangest grin on his face. He caught her gaze and winked at her. Och, didn't he look so pensive, dear Magnolia? He said. After a, I'm sure ye and his lairdship can find an awfully lot to talk about in your days of travel. Naha rolled his eyes. Have ye nay got a wife and bairns to get back to, Commander? Aye, that I day. William said brightly, getting to his feet. Good evening to ye both. Dinny day anything I wouldn't. That dos ne leave much. Naha called after him as he left. Magnolia stood too. It wasn't a good idea to be alone with him right now, not without any preparation. Aye. Should I go and let Betty and Eliza know of our plans? Nahan nodded, his eyes suddenly focused elsewhere. Aye. Aye. She nodded and turned to go. Magnolia? She turned back. Yes? Thank ye. He said simply. Thank ye for being someone I can trust. She nodded, but as she turned to go, the sudden guilt threatened to pull her straight down to the ground. Chapter 13 The Lady Taylor Anthony Gall, Laird of Clan Taylor, was trying his absolute hardest to come across as a powerful chieftain. He wore the traditional tartan of his clan, though the sash and kilt hung oddly from his skinny body. His chin had approximately three hairs that he proudly referred to as a beard, and his colouring was so fair that even those could hardly be seen. His pale blue eyes were wide and continuously darting about, never at rest. The sword he wore on his back was beautiful but clearly ceremonial, Magnolia doubted that it had ever seen battle. He spoke in a rich, over-exaggerated voice. He also tempered his own accent as much as possible, as if aiming to mimic the patterns of the lowland Scottish and English nobles. Part of Magnolia wanted to laugh every time he spoke. In contrast, the mothering side of her wanted to tuck the boy into bed with a cup of warm milk and a bedtime story. 18, Commander Candlish said, but I've seen boys of twelve with more candor and pluck. Magnolia curtsied to him nonetheless, staying silent while Naha made the introductions. Ridiculous child or not, Antony was a laird, and she must treat him as such. It won't be too hard. 
We have our fair share of trumped up nobles in England, also. Naha finished speaking, and Antony nodded gravely. Well. The Taylor clan is greatly honored to have ye among its visitors, Laird McFoyle. He said. And ye as well, Maid Elaine. Thank ye. Elaine said seriously. Ye are very kind to have us here. Naha beamed at his daughter, putting a proud hand on her shoulder while Antony turned to Magnolia. As Antony did so, his forced plain accent came out more clearly. And a pleasure to meet you, Miss Leemore. I do hope that Scotland is proving to be quite to your tastes. From the corner of her eye, Magnolia saw Elaine bite her lip to hold in a giggle at the pompous speech. Magnolia thought about it for a second, then said, I, you can it is nay usual for me, but I am settling in farewell. Antony blinked rapidly at her, and she could feel Naha and Elaine both staring. She turned and winked at Elaine, who had to hide her face in her father's side to stop herself from entering a fit of laughter. I see. I was not expecting you to speak in this way, miss. And nor I, you, my lad. Magnolia replied courteously. Do not concern yourself. I simply find myself slipping into the vernacular on occasion. I must say, you are the first person I have heard up here with such a familiar accent. Antony beamed. The poor boy obviously didn't sense her irony and took it as praise. Why, thank you. I thought it would make you more comfortable if I adapted to the way your countrymen speak. Magnolia dipped her head to hide her own smirk. Very kind of you, my lad. She agreed. Naha cleared his throat. Do you mind showing us somewhere we can rest? The bairn is awfully tired after such a long journey. I was hoping we could discuss our business tonight over dinner, Laird Taylor. The boy turned to look at him. Seeing them next to each other was quite startling. Naha must have had an entire foot on him in height. Antony looked like he'd be squashed underfoot if Naha so much as accidentally breathed in his direction. Yes, quite so. Antony said, still in that exaggerated accent. Yes. My girl will show you to the guest rooms. Please, take some time to refresh yourself, and do join me for a meal this evening. It would be our pleasure, me lad. Naha told him. Magnolia muttered her thanks, determined not to meet either Elaine or Naha's eyes as one of the maids approached. None of them said a word as the maid showed them to two rooms, one for Naha, and one next to it for Elaine and Magnolia, before heading away. When they were safely inside the girl's room, Naha chuckled to himself. Well? What day ye think a Laird Taylor? He asked. Elaine started to cackle. That man is so silly. She laughed. He sounds so funny. Is he trying to copy Maggie's voice? He's naid away in a good job. Magnolia chuckled at her amusement, but mostly she felt bewildered. I was. Not expecting that, even with William's warnings. She confessed. Goodness me, how does he command any respect from his men? Tradition, a strong military commander, and a stronger wife. Naha told her with an easy grin. He walked to the door. Ye two freshen up and get some shut eye if ye need it. I ken it's been a bit of a journey getting here. It had been. They'd been on the road for two days, and this, the third day, meant they were almost at the end of the third week out of Magnolia's four week deadline. No. I cannot think about that now. All right, Daddy. Elaine said chirpily. I'm gonna take a nap. And a bath. Magnolia told her, causing more giggles. She felt the warmth in Naha's gaze but didn't look at him directly. She wasn't sure she could handle it if she did. The door creaked as he went to exit and head into his own room. Wait. Magnolia said. Naha turned his head, pausing where he was. Wait. What do you mean about his wife? Naha blinked at her for a second, then let out a hearty laugh. Ok, ye'll see soon enough. 
I wouldn't want to ruin the surprise. Tony had been called a wee hen heart since he was a child. At 11 years his senior, now her hadn't had many occasions to interact with Tony as a child, or, as he was calling himself now, Anthony. Even still, he remembered the spoiled young lad, always crying and whimpering and avoiding conflict whenever possible, even in play or jest. He had never been meant for the lairdship. The previous Laird Taylor, his much older brother, was around Naha's age. Unfortunately, he had died in the fighting alongside his soldiers. With no son to speak of, that put Antony in charge of the clan, only fifteen at the time, just as Naha had been. Aye, but we handled it just a wee bit different. Thank God for Lady Taylor. The grand, plump lady sat at the side of her husband at the head of the table now. She wore a stunning dress of deep purple and green, and her dark hair was elegantly knotted on top of her head. Lady Ailey had been married to Antony's brother, and she had served as a loyal and beautiful, not to mention formidable, Lady of Taylor. When her husband died, the clan had panicked at the idea of losing both their fierce laird and cunning lady. Naha had heard stories of how the clansmen, servants, and even Antony's mother had all plotted together, to make Antony feel like marrying his brother's widow just made sense. Ailey had played the demure widow for the acceptable year of grieving, and now here she sat, lady once again. It's just lovely to see you again, Naha. She said enthusiastically. Ailey was a big beautiful woman with a personality to match. I am most glad that my laird husband was good enough to give ye an audience. Aye, ye laird husband indeed. As if he does not just day what he's told. It's wonderful to see ye again too, me lady. Naha said courteously. Och, nonsense. Ailey said decisively, shaking her head. We grew up together, ye and me and me late husband. Ye called me Ailey when Michael was laird, and my current husband Osni have an issue we ye do ain the same now. She turned, affecting a gentle smile and earnestly touching Tony's cheek. Day ye, me love? Antony blushed from the roots of his hair all the way down to his two small toes. Every inch of skin was bright red at only the gentle brush of her skin against his. Naha held his laugh in check. Ye couldn't he pay me enough to be a youth once more. Thank God I'm past to that. He caught Magnolia watching the display and found some embarrassment whirling in his stomach, as he considered how he acted around her when they were alone. Well, I. Mostly past it. Antony cleared his throat. A course I didn't, he said, his voice cracking. Then he gathered himself and repeated, in the Ponzi accent that he kept affecting. Of course I don't. We are all friends here. Ailey smiled, her full lips drawing the helpless young laird's attention as though they were a magnet. Well, isn't he that just so kind of ye, me love? That was when Elaine piped up. You two are funny. She said decisively. I like Lady Ailey. Can we be friends? Ailey laughed delightedly. Aye, of course we can, me we took. Me and Yin Jianani too if she likes. Magnolia looked up, startled. Oh, aye. Yes, that would be lovely. Grand. I'm so excited to be friends. Ailey said brightly. Now, I'm sure me esteemed husband had a question for ye, Naha. Naha straightened up, still skillfully hiding his amusement at how the lady unrepentantly held command of the conversation, even if she let her husband believe otherwise. Oh I? What would tha be, me laird? Antony flinched, looking almost started to be addressed at all. Oh, er. Uh. Why, I mean. So what brings you to our home, Laird McFoyle? I assume this is far from just a social visit. Aye, that it is. Naha said gravely. I appreciate how ye're always straight to the point. I've come to ye for help. He heard Magnolia hastily turn a giggle into a cough, and was extremely pleased to have been the one to amuse her. Help? Antony asked suspiciously. 
Me people are starving, Naha said, and the atmosphere in the room dropped a little. Aye, they're fine for now, but when the winter comes, I dinny ken how we're gonna keep them fed. Antony stared at him at a loss for words. It was clear to see his youth in the lost expression on his face as he said. And you want my help? Ailey was giving Naha a shrewd look. Why come to us? Why are any ye appealing to Laird McCullen? He's your closest ally, physically and historically too. Naha sighed. Honest with ye, Ailey, it's a bit of a mess. Laird McCullen's got it in his heed that I should be wedding and bed in his wee Agnes. Agnes McCullen? Ailey asked, raising her eyebrows. She's ages we Antony if I can correct? Naha nodded. Nay that there's anything wrong we such a marriage, of course. Ailey hid her smirk, and Antony nodded thoughtfully. But I didn't find myself in a position where I can accept his generous offer. Naha continued. And he's taken quite a bit of offence. He's closed the supply routes, and I didn't ken how I'm supposed to get food to me people without any help. Ye take issue with political marriages, Naha? Ailey asked, raising an eyebrow. That dose ni sound like ye. Apart from Cat, ye were always first and foremost about your duty. Naha smiled thinly. Aye, well. People and reasons change. We can ye all have the grand love ye and me laird day. Antony preened at the compliment even as Ailey rolled her eyes behind his back. A course ye'd come to me for help. Antony said, his accent slipping back to its natural state in his excitement. And of course I'll help ye. Of course, there's the matter a debt to consider. But Naha was hardly paying attention. He was watching the Lady Taylor and her narrowed, calculating eyes as she looked between him and Magnolia then back again. Suddenly, Ailey was on her feet. Would ye gentlemen mind ever so kindly? If I were to take we Elaine and her nanny to see the new Westie pups. This does nee sound like a grand conversation for women like us. Naha was ready to think of some reason, any reason, to object, but before he could, Elaine was babbling excitedly. Pups. Really? Oh, can we? Can we, Daddy? Please. Naha sighed but smiled. Aye, of course ye can. If me lad says it's all right. Antony gave his permission. As the three girls left, Ailey turned back and winked at Naha, and he watched them go with a strange feeling of foreboding settling in his stomach. One of the West Highland Terriers had given birth to a litter only a month before, and it was with these excited pups that Elaine was playing now while Magnolia and Ailey sat back and watched. I've rarely seen her so joyful. Magnolia said, amused. She had a tiny pup on her own lap, a little snow-white fellow shyer than the rest. He didn't want to play, but he seemed content to nap in Magnolia's skirts while the rest of the litter frolicked. She's a bright wee thing. Ailey said pleasantly. She does ye credit. Magnolia blinked. Oh, no, I'm simply her nanny. Her goodness is all down to her father, I assure you. Aye, is that right? Ailey asked. Magnolia turned to look at her at the ironic disbelief in the other woman's voice. So you're not on the way to being her stepmother, then? Magnolia's eyes widened, and she felt her heart race. I, no, of course, I'm, that is to say, my lad is. Ailey laughed, a deep laugh that seemed to resonate through her entire impressive being. Ock. Ye poor wee thing. Ye've got it bad, so ye have. How long did it take? Magnolia considered trying to deny it. She considered pretending that she had no idea what Ailey was talking about, but she knew it would be no use. She had the feeling that this sharp-eyed lady never missed a thing. Instead, she said nothing at all. Ailey reached out and patted her shoulder. It's all right. Ye're a woman, and women have needs just as men day, even if they didn't want us to ken that. Ye see yonder kennel master? 
Magnolia glanced in the direction she was pointing. The kennel master was an unremarkable man, with brown hair and eyes and clothes. The gentleness in his expression when he dealt with the dogs, and showed Elaine the best way to pet them certainly made his face worth a second glance. The kennel master was older than Magnolia, older than Alien Naha too. He was perhaps sages with the Viscount of Mitred, mid-thirties or so. His skin was bronzed from long days working in the sun, his round shoulders showing he was as strong as his dogs. That's Leonard. He's me lover. Ailey said matter-of-factly. Magnolia stared at her in shock. The other woman hadn't even lowered her voice. Anyone nearby might have heard. But Haley continued to look unconcerned. In fact, she was scrutinizing Magnolia's face, as if testing her reaction. Aye. That was most unexpected, my lady. Magnolia said after a pause. What about your husband? Ailey scoffed. Och, wee Tony, bless his heart. He's been wanting in me petticoat since he was twelve years old and learned what a woman is. Poor lad nearly imploded when I agreed to wed him a year after me Michael died. He's so besotted, that he does not even question that I still have any bedded him. Michael was the first lad? His brother? Magnolia asked. Ailey nodded. She glanced out over to the kennel master, a soft expression on her face, then turned back to Magnolia. See, the thing is, Magnolia, may I call ye that? The thing is, nobody except Tony is under any illusions as to why we wed. I mean, look at me. Do ye really think a woman near in thirty wanted to be shackled to a self-important bairn of eight and ten? The lady sighed, leaning back in her chair, giving Magnolia a frank look. I loved me Michael we all me heart. She said. Just as much as I love Leonard. I ken I was lucky, luckier than many women in me position. I could marry somebody who made me heart swell with pride at being able to say he was mine. When he died, I never thought I'd love again. Magnolia considered this. But you love Leonard now? I love Leonard too. Ailey corrected. See the thing Abu hearts, Magnolia, is that they heal, even when ye think they never will. I hurt for three long years after me Michael died, sure thar I'd never feel happy again. She smiled. And then I met Leonard, and it changed. I felt guilty for a long time, to be sure, but eventually, I realized. Michael wouldn't want me Mopin. He'd want me to be free. That doesn't mean I'll ever stop loving him. It's just different now. And so you moved forward with Leonard. Magnolia said. She found her heart aching at this bittersweet tale, but she couldn't work out exactly where the pain was coming from. But then, why did you marry Antony in the first place? Ye can why? Ailey said with a dry laugh. For me people. Losing Michael and losing me, all in one. Fell swoop wouldn't he have been good for a clanth are already lost much in the war. Antony is a sweet, silly boy, and he's nay idea how to care for his people. I had to choose between duty and sentiment, and I chose duty. Magnolia was silent. She was thinking of her own father, her own people. The order. Her mission. And then she looked out and saw Elaine, giggling with the puppies. She thought of a pair of intense green eyes, no longer a source of fear, but of something else, something she'd never expected. Do you regret it? She asked Ailey quietly, her fingers lightly brushing the sleeping pup's fur. Ailey smiled sadly at her. Sometimes, she said. I did what I had today, but sometimes I wonder if I wouldn't have been happier as the kennel master's wife. Maybe even come in back to Clan McFoyle, instead of being stuck here a glorified nanny. Duty. Love. What does it all mean? Why is she telling me this? I feel. She said finally. That you may see more than you let on. The lady laughed. Aye, ye are certainly nay the first to suggest such. She gave Magnolia a sympathetic look. Magnolia. 
I didn't ken why you're here. Why you're really here, I mean. I didn't ken what's got all that guilt swimming behind your eyes. Magnolia bit her lip, fear shooting through her. Was this where she was caught? Was this where it all ended? For some inexplicable reason, she could picture nothing but how hurt Naha would be by all of this, and how she'd do anything, anything, to avoid it. Ailey was watching her. I didn't drag ye out here to judge or to make choices for ye. She said gently. But I day want to warn ye. Whatever you're facing, choose carefully. Dinny forget who ye are. And if ye are not sure about what's really important, well then it's time to get to Ken yourself, and quick. Magnolia swallowed. Her eyes were damp, and suddenly tears were running down her face, tears that had been building for weeks, without falling how they needed to. Glad Elaine was distracted, she allowed herself to sob, unsure why she was crying except that she felt like her heart might burst. I don't, I can't. She started. Ailey pulled her into a friendly hug, skillfully hiding Magnolia's face in her shoulder, and avoiding any damage to the pup on her lap. There, there. Ye didn't have to tell me. In fact, I'd rather ye didn't. It's a right just to cry for a bit. Go ahead, let it out. Lord above Kens I wish I'd had a shoulder to cry on more than once. So Magnolia did. She accepted this near stranger's comfort crying about the tangled mess in her head, sobbing about how her heart was torn and confused. She'd never know it was possible to feel as many things at once. At some point, the tiny puppy in her lap woke up and started to rub his head on her hands, offering his comfort too. Ailey stroked her hair and muttered Gaelic platitudes that Magnolia could not understand. When her tears finally dried, she sat up, and Ailey was smiling as she handed her a handkerchief. There, Ailey said. Does me that feel better? Magnolia wiped her face. It does, she admitted. Thank you. Ailey nodded. I'm glad. Now, listen, Dame, just one favor? Whatever decision ye make, I can it'll be the right one for ye. Ye seem like a smart lass we a kind heart. But whatever ye choose, whatever ye day next, do me a favor and dinny break me friend's heart. Magnolia's eyes widened. What? Naha doesn't. I see how he looks at ye. Ailey said. And I see how ye look at him. If ye have to choose duty, whatever that duty may be, then I need ye to promise me ye will need drag his heart away wi it. Magnolia's cheeks went slightly pink, and she wiped at her eyes again. I. I will try my best. She said finally. I don't want to hurt him. Or Elaine. I swear that much. Ailey smiled once more. I can. She reached down and tickled the shy puppy under the chin. He seems to like ye. Why didn't ye keep him? Maybe he'll help ye if ye get a bit lost. Magnolia stared at her, then glanced down at the tiny pup. Really? Are you sure? Ailey nodded. We're gonna give one of the litter to we Elaine, to add to the kennels in McFoyle Castle anyway, but I think it'd be fair cruel to separate you and this we lad. What day ye say? Aye. Magnolia started. She stroked the dog's head with one finger and saw his little tail wag, and his big brown eyes brighten with contentment. Very well. I shall take him. Thank you, Ailey. The lady nodded. Excellent. Now let's go check on the bairn and me Leonard, shall we? Magnolia took a deep breath and wiped her face one more time. Yes. Let's. Naha closed the door to Elaine and Magnolia's room behind him, a smile on his face. Both of the new pups, which Elaine had been given naming dominion over, were curled up asleep on their respective owner's beds. Naha told Elaine very seriously that he knew now he didn't have to worry about either of them. After all, Laird Softpaws and Sir Spindrift were taking charge of nighttime protection. Magnolia had laughed at that, and it was a piece of music that sounded like sunshine. 
Oh dear, ye've got it just as bad as she has. A voice startled him from his thoughts. He looked up in surprise to see Ailey standing on the opposite side of the corridor, her arms folded as she watched him exit. Poor Wee Elaine must be on constant tenterhooks. I dinna ken what ye're talking about. Naha lied, though he wasn't sure why he bothered. Ailey had always been able to see right through everyone. Ailey scoffed. As ye say. Will ye walk wi' me? He nodded, and the two of them began to stride down the corridor together. They were a study in opposites to a casual onlooker, Naha supposed. She was short and round while he was tall and muscular. She was dark where he was fair. But they were more alike than a glance would tell. It's the eyes, Katrina used to say. We've got the same fire in them. Would ye still say that now, love? As they turned the corner towards the archway that led to the night garden, Ailey said conversationally, Day ye ken that ye were my first love? Now has started, turning his head to look at her. I was? Ailey laughed delightedly at his surprise as they walked out into the fresh night air. Och, I. But by the time I was old enough to ken what I wanted from ye, ye were already deeply in love wi' Katrina. I. Had nay idea. Naha confessed. He felt his cheeks warming. Had he really missed all of that? How? She led him to a bench. Didn't he look so guilty? She teased. It worked out for the best anyway, I got my Michael, and ye your Katrina and that darling wee bairn. Aye, he said sadly as they sat together. Aye, but now they're both gone, Michael and Kat both. And none of us yet thirty. They're gone, Ailey agreed. And we're permitted to be as sad about it as we like. But there are upsides, as well. Life moves on, Naha. Now I've got me Leonard, and ye. Dinny, he interrupted a little more sharply than he intended. He knew what she wanted to say, just as much as he knew he wasn't ready to hear it. Not yet. Just. Dinny, Ailey. She shrugged. As ye like. Ye were always more stubborn than was good for ye, even as a lad. Ailey glanced around the garden, then smiled. Do ye remember when ye and Katrina visited after Michael and I were wed? Naha smiled fondly. I. I. The two of ye were non-stop gossiping. Michael and I were both scared out to our wits. Ailey snorted. As ye rightly should have been. Naha laughed too, relaxing a little. They spent perhaps an hour like that, talking about old times, about Michael, about Katrina, and about new times also. Ailey told him about Leonard and commiserated over Tony, and in return, Naha told her all about Elaine. Neither of them mentioned Magnolia, for which Naha was extremely grateful. Eventually, he stood and yawned. Forgive me, but I need to turn in. Elaine will be waking me first thing in the morning, sleep or nay sleep. Ailey smiled. I indeed. I should be getting back to me chambers as well. I think I'll enjoy the air a wee bit longer, though. He nodded. Good night, Ailey. He told her. He started to walk back towards the archway. Nah. He turned his head. Hmm. Ailey was giving him that scrutinizing look once more. Day ye still talk to her? He went still. Day I still talk to who? The lady snorted. Ye ken what I'm asking. Day ye still talk wee Katrina? Lord kens I still have a word wee my Michael now and again. Nah his mouth tightened. He wasn't angry that she asked, how could he be? She was one of the few people who truly knew what he felt. But he did feel a faint sliver of embarrassment, nonetheless. A man near thirty, talking to imaginary ghosts. Aye. He admitted. I, sometimes. More often than I'd like to admit. Ailey didn't look surprised. Dame me a favor, Naha. He waited, 
saying nothing. She gave him a sad smile. Next time Cat talks to ye, actually listen, will ye? For your own sake. A cold shiver ran down his spine, and he stared at her for what seemed like an eternity. Then he grunted, because he didn't have a response that would cover any of the emotions she'd evoked in him. Good night, Ailey, he said gruffly. He turned away again and headed back inside. Listen to her. But what use is there in listening to the dead? Chapter 14 The Dream Ellie and Anthony could not supply storable food. Still, they promised to send along what farmhands they could spare, as soon as time permitted. More importantly, Ailey took Magnolia aside before the carriage left, and told her quietly that word of Naha's visit had definitely reached Laird McCullen by this point. Magnolia had only been a little surprised. You knew what we were doing this whole time, she said. Ailey had just twinked, and bid her visit again soon. Now Elaine, Magnolia, and Naha, along with Laird Softpaws and Sir Spindrift, travelled back to Clan McFoyle as fast as the carriage would take them. Magnolia was more than aware that every night and dawn that passed drew her month to a close. Choose carefully, Ailey told me. But what choices do I have? Sir Spindrift nudged his head under her hand, clearly sick of her thinking rather than paying him attention. She smiled and scratched him behind the ear. At least I can be sure of you, pup. She whispered to him. Elaine was fast asleep on the seat opposite, Laird softballs curled protectively on her lap. Naha sat beside her, staring out of the opposite window. If he heard Magnolia's whisper, he didn't show it. The carriage trundled along, and Magnolia was surprised to realize that she recognized where they were now. They were on the borders of McFoyle land, they would be home before the day was out. Nah, she said hesitantly. He looked away from the window, his eyebrows raised, as though he'd forgotten he had company on the journey. Oh, Magnolia, forgive me, I was half dreaming. Are you all right? I'm fine. She told him. I simply wanted to check my internal navigation is correct. Are we almost home? Home. What a strange feeling that word has on my lips now. She clenched her fists so that her hands didn't shake, the unexpected power of the once innocent word threatening to overwhelm her. Naha took a moment before he answered, and when he did, he was looking back out the window again. I, he said, and his voice was low. I, we're almost home, Magnolia. Almost. The rest of the journey passed in silence, too many thoughts repeating themselves in Magnolia's head, to even consider whatever might be whirling in Naha's. Choose carefully. Elaine let out a little sigh in her sleep, and it cut deep into Magnolia's heart. Choose carefully. Sir Spindrift licked her fingers in affection, and she tickled under his chin as the first of the McFoyle forests came into view. Choose carefully. Naha's hair and beard flashed brightly and the lowering sunlight like a flame brought to life. But how do I do that? Uncle William was waiting for them with a massive grin on his face, when the carriage pulled up next to the castle. Elaine was the first out, and she ran to her uncle and his wife, Laird Softpaws in her arms. Uncle William. Auntie Abby. Look what I got from Lady Taylor. She's right nice. I called him Laird Softpaws, and Maggie's got one too, and he's called Sir Spindrift, Anne. William chuckled, ruffling her hair. That's grand, Elaine. Magnolia and Daddy followed closely behind. William, I wasn't expecting ye. Naha said. He smiled, though. And Abigail. Gods, it's been a while. Ye're still hardly showing. Auntie Abby laughed and patted her stomach. Aye, well, there's a fair few months to go yet before this one makes its appearance. She said. Are ye well, Naha? Grand. He replied. Auntie Abby smiled and turned to Magnolia. And ye must be the famous Miss Magnolia Leemore. 
I'm Abby Maguire. I'm William's wife, for me sins. He tells me the two of ye have become fast friends. Does he now? Magnolia asked, giving Uncle William a funny look. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you. Why are ye here, William? Ye are welcome any time, of course, but it's awfully late for ye to have left the Burns we Abby's sister, just to come and greet us back. I'm here as your commander, actually, me lad. Uncle William said. He had an excited sparkle in his eyes. I've come we news about Laird McCullen. Both Daddy and Magnolia seemed to freeze in place, which confused Elaine. Laird McCullen wasn't the kind of man people wanted to talk about. Elaine found him stuck up and boring besides. Tell you what, Elaine. Auntie Abby said. Why didn't we leave Yerda and your nanny and your uncle to talk, and ye can come and show me the pups? Elaine brightened immediately. I. Maggie, can ye give Auntie Abby to hold Sir Spindrift for a wee bit? Magnolia blinked. Oh, of course. She said, handing the dog over to the other woman. Have fun. We will. Thank ye. Elaine said, holding tight to Laird's softballs as she followed her aunt inside. When they were up in her nursery, both pups sniffing at all their new surroundings, Elaine said. Auntie Abby, what secret things are they talking about? Auntie Abby smiled. Och, dinny worry your pretty wee heed. Ye've got a good few years before it becomes your concern. Enjoy them while ye can, me wee button. Elaine tilted her head, confused. Ye adults are awfully strange, auntie. Will I be strange when I'm an adult as well? Abby let out a chuckle. Aye, lass, probably. Just enjoy being a bairn for now, though, eh? I can day that. Elaine agreed brightly. Day ye want to hear a story? Her aunt gave her another smile and sat cross-legged on the floor across from her. Is it about the fair folk? She asked. Astonished, Elaine said. How did ye ken? Ye're always twittering about the fair folk. Abby laughed. But Denny worry, I love to hear. Was this story, then? Well, said Elaine grandly. It is about the fair folk. And me mommy. Now her lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, far too alert to sleep. William and Abby were staying the night in the castle, before heading home to their children the next morning, and Elaine had fallen asleep hours ago. It had worked. Their plan had worked. Magnolia's plan. It was her idea to bait the proud Bampot. Magnolia. Ailey's knowing eyes filled his mind, and he scowled. Away we ye. Away. But it had worked. Naha's people would receive help from Laird Taylor's farmhands, and Laird McCullen had reopened the supply routes, shamed into the act by the threat to his ship. Naha's clan was still suffering, but, at least this winter, they would not starve. Magnolia had been exhilarated when William told them the news, entirely losing her decorum as she cheered. She had even gone so far as to hug Naha in her joy. Naha's delight was even higher, and he'd lifted her by the waist spinning her in a circle and laughing, only stopping when he caught William's eye. His friend watched the whole thing with a sly grin, and now her and Magnolia jumped apart as though iced. William didn't say anything. William didn't have to say anything. So now here now her lay, his chest all a jumble without an idea of where to begin processing everything. Relief, joy, hope, pain, guilt. Happiness, how could one man feel all these things at once? The hours slowly ran on as he tossed and turned, unable to rest. What would Katrina say now? But it wasn't her voice that entered his mind. Instead, he remembered Ailey's words from just a few days before. Day ye still talk to her? Day me a favor and listen to her. He groaned, pulling his pillow over his head, begging sleep to take him. When Nahar opened his eyes again, he stood somewhere he had never been, and somewhere he'd known his whole life. 
the pond in the very center of the fairy forest, where the heather pixies drank, and the brownies bathed, and the bean nigh washed the clothes of the ill-fated. He could not tell if it was night or day. The trees were old and gnarled, and they rose up high above him, blocking out the sky. It was not dark, nor was it light. Instead, the clearing seemed to exist in an ethereal, eternal twilight, hues of purple and blue and silver bathing everything he could see. Around him, there was no wind, but he somehow could feel a breeze regardless. The scent of pine trees, of memories of his youth, filled his nose, along with the sweet sting of pollen that beckoned the fall. He breathed in deeply, his senses taking him to a time he'd long forgotten. Naha took a step forward towards the pond. He was reasonably sure this was a dream. His legs felt heavy, but he glided like a ghost as he approached it. Something compelled him to sit at the water's edge, and he knelt without a thought, staring into its depths. How is it that I can see the sky, but this wee pond reflects the stars? Why, it's magic, of course. A familiar voice told him. He turned his head, feeling every muscle in his body contract from his fingertips to his very heart. The kind of magic that only comes to the sleep in. She was as beautiful as she'd always been, but this was no ghost, not this time. Katrina sat directly across the pond from him, solid and whole, smiling warmly. I've been wondering when you'd make your way here, me love. She said gently. Naha opened his mouth, but he could not speak. There was something different about her, something celestial which he could not quite place. The last time he had seen her, her belly had been swollen, her face streaked with tears, blood, pain, and death choking all of his senses. But now she sat, serene and peaceful as the stories of the Aeos Sith. Her long green dress almost blended entirely with the grass around her. Her dark hair was in an elaborate knot, decorated with flowers and sparkling gold. And her eyes, those grey eyes, Elaine's eyes, burned into him, waiting. Am I dreaming? He asked hoarsely. Is this a dream, Cat? It is, I. She said, her voice like music on the wind. Do ye think it matters? Naha swallowed. He ached to touch her. But he somehow knew that if he tried to cross the pond, tried to get to her, she would be gone for good. So he sat, frozen in place, and said, So ye did run away we the fair folk, just like Elaine always believed. Katrina's tinkling laugh was like the lightest silver bell. She's turned into a fine wee lassie. I'm proud. Ye've done a good job we her, Naha. He blinked his burning eyes. I've done what I could. Elaine Dosni have a mither. I can he be that for her. Katrina nodded. Aye. But someone else can. Are you ready to listen to me now, me love? Really listen? Pain tore at his heart, a desperation to escape this conversation, because he knew what it meant. When it was done, when it was over, she'd be gone. He couldn't say how he was confident of this, but he knew for sure, if he let her speak now, it was highly unlikely he'd ever talk to her again, ghost or dream or otherwise. Naha let out a sob, his pride meaning nothing now. I love ye, cat. I love ye too, me Joe. That will ne change. Nothing will ever change that. I'll always love ye, and Elaine, and I'll always be taking care of ye as much as I can from right here. Katrina said steadily. Now, will you listen to me? Naha closed his eyes. That made twice. He knew the rules of the fair folk as well as any Scotsman, and he knew, somehow, that they applied here. The law of three bound the asker and the asked when a question was uttered thrice. He would be forced to speak truthfully or not speak at all. Now, he had to make a choice. Am I ready? Can I day this? I've told her everything about ye. Naha said. Elaine, I mean. She loves ye dearly. She tells stories of a mummy she never met to anyone who'll give her the time of day. Katrina nodded. Her skin reflected moonlight even though there was none, 
and her breathtaking beauty seemed to take over his entire mind, forcing him to focus on her. Are ye ready to listen? She asked quietly for the final time. He felt the click as the third time locked the question into place, and he dipped his head. There was no going back now. When the dream was over, he would wake, and she would be gone. I, he said. I, tell me. Magnolia, Katrina said, and the word was the brightest song. Ye did me expect it, I can, but it came nonetheless. He said nothing. She waited a moment to give him the chance to answer, then continued. I died near five years ago, Naha. There's no way I'll be back. Ye can that, didn't ye tell me otherwise. Ye're the one dream in me now. Ye can everything that I can. Naha flinched but stayed silent. He had to listen now, not speak. If he spoke before it was time, he'd ruin it. But Magnolia's alive. And so are ye. Ye have to stop forgetting that. Ye and Elaine and Magnolia, ye are a unit now. He shook his head, though not in disagreement. It's been less than a month. How can ye say? How can I think, how can I feel? But Naha couldn't even finish his own thoughts. Katrina smiled warmly. I've been trying to tell ye for such a long time now, me Jo. I need ye to remember what I'd want for ye and Elaine. I can ye be free until ye day that. Now was the time to speak, he knew, but he felt the words lodge in his throat. She waited and watched, and finally, he forced them out. And what is it that ye want for us? Naha asked in near a whisper. Katrina stood. The light that shone from her skin was stronger now, and it began to expand over the whole clearing. To have peace, she said. Naha squinted against the light, holding up a hand to shield his eyes. He could only make out shadows now, the sudden brightness making it hard to see. To have life, Katrina continued. The light covered everything, and Naha could see no better with his eyes open than closed. He had no idea if he was even still in the forest, no sense of his surroundings, no idea if he was alone. Katrina's voice was in his ear one last time, a quiet, gentle whisper, as she said, To have love. At that word, she was everywhere, and she was nowhere. Naha could taste how her lips had felt, the first and last time they'd pressed against his own. He felt the softness of her skin under his fingers, smelled the fresh mint she seemed to carry with her wherever she went. Saw those eyes, staring into his. The sound of her voice as it echoed the word. Love. She breathed one more time. And it sounded like goodbye. If you like our channel, please subscribe and make sure to click on the bell icon, so that you won't miss any future audiobooks we'll upload for free each week on YouTube. Chapter 15 The Confession Magnolia sat in only her night shift, her hair almost dry after her bath, enjoying the unexpected warmth of the night breeze through her window. She supposed it was now midsummer, the right time for pleasant weather. And just four days until it was time to be home again. She sighed. She had been trying to sleep for hours. Magnolia had no idea what time it was. All she knew was that every time she closed her eyes, indecision, foreboding, and the promise of a deep regret no matter how she acted awaited her. So eventually, she'd gotten out of bed and come to look out over the ground. It was inky black outside, but she could almost make out the rippling waters of the lock, and further than that, the outline of the trees in the fairy forest. It really is beautiful here like nothing I have ever seen. What once felt like an alien world now felt like. Like. There was a hard, urgent rapping at the door, and Magnolia jumped, surprised, and not a little afraid. Had something happened? Who could that be at this hour? She hurried over, opening it, and her confusion only grew, as she saw Naha standing there in nothing but his nightshirt and under things. His eyes were wild and urgent. Naha, what? 
Did I wake ye? He asked, his eyes trailing over her clothes. This was the second time he'd seen her in bed clothes, now, though at least last time she'd been wearing a thin robe over the shift. Uh. No, I was already awake. She replied, crossing her arms over her chest. Are you all right? What happened? You look. Can I come in? He asked urgently. Magnolia raised her eyebrows, but stepped back from the door, allowing him to step inside. Sit down, he said abruptly. Magnolia sat on the edge of her bed, warily watching as he closed her bedroom door behind him. He started pacing back and forth across her floor space, his hand running through his wild hair in distress. Naha, what's the matter? She asked, alarmed. He stopped pacing and faced her, and her heart picked up speed. His underthings only covered to just below the knee, displaying his well-muscled shins and the red hair that curled on them. When she looked closer, she saw that his feet were entirely bare. She glanced upwards and swallowed. Naha's nightshirt was slightly open, revealing part of his muscular, hairy chest. Every time he moved his arms, the view flashed a little more, making her stare. Then, quite suddenly, he was close to her, kneeling at her feet, looking up into her face and holding one of her hands between his. Magnolia. He said. Magnolia, I need to tell ye. Tell me what? She asked. His movements astonished her, but she did not pull away. Naha. I can't play this game any more. He told her. His green eyes were bright as the summer grass, and his hand was almost painfully tight around her own for just a moment, then he relaxed. I can it's only been near four weeks. I can you've got your secrets, and God kens I've got mine. But I didn't want to pretend any more. He lifted her hand to his lips. I love ye. He murmured. I love ye, I love ye. I love ye. With each declaration, he pressed his lips lightly to the skin on the back of her hand. Magnolia felt as though someone had poured boiling water and ice simultaneously through her brains. Have my ears gone faulty? Have my eyes? But no, because there he was, his beard bristly against her skin, his lips fresh from her hand. He looked up at her, still kneeling, still holding on. Naha. She repeated faintly because she could not think of another word. What are you saying? You can't, I'm not. Ye are, and more. Naha said earnestly. I can ye feel something as well. Maybe not the same as me, but I need to tell ye true. Since the moment ye got here, ye've changed me life. Elaine's. I held back because ye were any cat, but I can now, I can that's the whole point. Ye can ye be cat. I didn't need ye to be cat. I love ye. Magnolia felt a lump in her throat. Why are you saying such things? She asked in half a whisper. Are you quite clear-minded? He chuckled, kissing her hand again. More than I've been in years. He told her. His voice sounded lighter, happier than she'd ever heard it. If ye dinny, if this is ni what ye want, Magnolia, I will ni hold it against ye. Tell me to leave if ye must, and I'll go, without another word. He let go of her hand and put one hand on either side of her on the bed. He lifted himself a little so that while he knelt, his face was at her chest line as he looked into her eyes. Magnolia raised her hand hesitantly, touching his cheek. He closed his eyes against her touch, leaning into it just as he had that night at the fountain. Father. Country. The crown. Suddenly, not a bit of it was as important as this. There was nothing else, not any more. Just Magnolia. And Naha. Magnolia threw herself forward, her arms wrapping around his neck, as she launched from the bed and pressed her lips hard against his. He was ready for her catching her in those muscular arms, holding her tight against his chest while his back fell back against the floor. His hands roamed freely, down her spine, in her hair. Every touch was like a shock to her nerves. 
she clung tighter, her tongue exploring his mouth, her fingers tangling in his hair, needing more, more. Then, quite suddenly, she found herself spun around, and she was the one on her back. The hardwood supported her as he broke the kiss, pulling away and surveying her from above. He had a hard look in his eyes as he towered above her, one hand on either side of her. I am at his mercy. What surprised her more was that there was nowhere else she'd rather be. Now hello at his head, and she ached for him to kiss her again, but he didn't approach her lips. Instead, he buried his face in her neck, kissing and nibbling and licking at the skin just at her collarbone. He made her gasp out at the sensation, closing her eyes as the world centered around how he felt against her skin. He slowly moved lower, from the crook of her neck down her collarbone towards the neckline of her shift. Holding himself up with one hand, he moved the other to the lace there, and Magnolia felt like she might burst. Naha. She mumbled. Naha, I have never done. This before. He stopped, surprised, and looked up. Never? Look in the way ye day? His hand toyed with the lace, but he did not pull it loose, not yet. Day ye want me to stop? No she said, too quickly. Don't you dare. He grinned. That's what I was hoping you'd say. He told her, then pulled at the lace. The gown fell open, exposing her small, firm breasts to the air. May I? She gulped in air, her heart racing, and nodded. He took his now free hand and gently caressed one of her breasts, his elbow leaning on the floor as he leisurely circled her nipple, exploring with agonizingly sweet slowness, taking his time and delicious torture. Then he lowered his head once more, taking her other nipple in his mouth even as he toyed with the other in his fingers, and as his tongue flicked and tasted and danced a little whimper escaped her. Her hands shot up as if of their own accord, clinging to his back, pulling him closer. After seconds or minutes or hours, for what was time any more? He drew back once more. Yeah, pullin' at me shirt. He said hoarsely. I suppose fair is fair. Naha straightened his back, most of his weight on his knees that straddled her, and she felt a hot hardness digging into her belly as he pulled off his shirt in one fluid motion. She didn't stop herself from staring. His toned arms, free of the cloth, were hypnotizing in their liveness, strong enough to crush a wolf, gentle enough to hold her close. His chest, inches from hers, seemed to call out like a magnetic rock to her own. She was desperate to feel all of his skin against her. You're beautiful. She gasped, reaching out to touch his hard chest, the hair there surprisingly soft, the skin underneath warm and soft and welcoming. The look Naha gave her then was so burningly intense, that she thought she might be set aflame. He leaned down, crushing his lips against hers, his bare chest connecting with her own and making her cry out against his tongue. Her nails dug into his back, pulling him closer, nearer, begging him never to leave, never to stop touching her. But he broke the kiss again after a while and moved away from her entirely. She wanted to scream at the absence, at the loss of completeness she hadn't even known she was missing until he'd finally given it to her. He stood and reached down to help her to her feet. Did I do something wrong? Is he stopping? Magnolia took his hand and allowed him to pull her up. He moved her gently but firmly, directing that she should sit on the end of the bed again. Without question, she did as she was told. Once, she had said to him that he wasn't her laird. Nothing felt more ludicrous than that thought did now. He knelt at her feet again, just as he had when he'd made his declaration. This time, he didn't reach for her hand. Instead, he gently lifted one of her legs, tilting her hips back as he did. He kissed her ankle, then worked his way slowly, teasingly along, his beard tickling her calf, his tongue tasting her thigh. Magnolia's breathing hitched then sped up as she realized what he intended to do. She considered stopping him, but the thought felt like a crime of the highest order. Right now, she wanted nothing more than to allow him to taste her, to give her pleasure like nothing else ever had. When his tongue touched her, ever so lightly, it made her whole body shake, and she gasped out loud. 
She thought she heard him chuckle at the reaction, but before she could ask, he was buried between her thighs, his tongue dancing out a sweet song against her. She squirmed as heated ecstasy shot through her from her head to her toes, her body twitching at every brush of his tongue, every hard squeeze of his fingers on her thighs. Her own fingers tangled in his wild red hair, pulling hard enough that it must have hurt his scalp, but he just held her tighter and kept going. She needed him, all of him, more of him, and her hips moved urgently as she cried out and gasped and held him tighter and tighter against her. I have never felt anything like this. Ask. He kept at it, each eager movement and taste building something inside her. Each exquisite moment so intense it would have been painful had it not been so pleasurable. She was torn between the desperate need for release, and the wish that he would never stop. Both of her legs were over his shoulders, now, her knees curled to pull him closer still, and he let go of her with one of his hands. Her head was tilted back, her arms propping her up, her eyes half-lidded as she experienced this, and suddenly his hand was creeping up the exposed skin of her breasts. He tugged at her nipple, demanding her pleasure as he kept at his work below. The nails of Naha's other hand dug into her thigh, and it was suddenly hard to see, as the feeling built and built and threatened to overwhelm her completely, and she was at the point where she wasn't sure if she could take another second of this sweet agony, when... Oh God above! She opened her mouth, but all that came out was a strangled cry that sounded like a prayer. Her whole body shook, her muscles contracting. Her skin was so sensitive it may as well be painlessly aflame. Every nerve in her body was alight, every individual synapse both more present and further from her than they'd ever been. The pleasure washed through her like a wave, crashing over her and changing every place it touched. And when it finally passed, and she could focus once more, she was panting, covered in sweat, every cell singing. Naha! She gasped, and he moved so that he was leaning over her on the bed his face inches from her own. Magnolia? He grunted, the sound deep in his throat. They stayed like that for a moment, poised in silence. Magnolia was the first to break it as she moved her hands to the string of his underwear. Right, wrong, or otherwise, she knew one thing. I want him. All of him. I need him. He helped her get them off from his legs and then he was bare before her, still leaning over her on the bed, their breath mingling in the air. Are ye sure? He asked, and the need throbbing in his voice sent need pulsing through her once more. Take me, me lad. She said, a slight tease to the put on Scottish accent. She found his member and stroked it lightly with her hand, surprised by the feeling, soft and hard at once, warm and responsive, and ready. His growl was almost feral as he lunged forward, capturing her lips once more, his tongue exploring deeper and deeper. Then he moved to line himself up. I'll go slowly. He said. He was trying to sound calm, she supposed, but the need was more than evident. If ye need me to stop, just say. She nodded with her heart in her throat, nervous and excited and scared and desperate for this all at once. He held her waist and she his forearms, as he slowly, slowly pushed into her. Magnolia moaned as he entered her. The fullness of him was all she could feel, all that existed in the world, and when he slowly started to move inside her, it was almost too much to bear. She had expected pain, but there was none, had his actions before smoothed away. A little tightness, but no hurt as he slid inside her. All right? He whispered. In response, she moved her hands from his arms to his backside, her nails digging into his cheeks, indicating silently that she wanted, needed, more, more, more. He wheezed out something like a needy laugh and obliged, moving closer, his hips thrusting a little faster, his head lowered to kiss her stomach, her neck, her hair, anywhere he could reach. She clung to him, each movement like an earthquake through her body, each second of their joining more than she could ever have imagined and only building more. Naha! She whimpered. God! He snarled as she said his name, taking it as an invitation to move faster, harder, and she pulled at him to encourage more and more. She knew it was coming this time, but it was somehow even more intense than before. 
she practically screamed as the wave overcame her this time, every fiber of her knowing nothing but the pleasure, the feeling of now her skin on hers, the feeling of him inside her. She turned her head and bit down on his arm, determined not to wake half the castle with her cry. When she gathered herself, he was still moving, a little slower now, but the need in his expression was palpable. Naha had made her feel so good, and she wanted to make him feel the same, so she clung to him tighter and encouraged him to keep going and whispered. I love you, too. The sound he made was bestial as he finished, his heat pulsing into her, and then he collapsed forward, chest to chest, his head beside her own. They lay there like that for who knew how long the only movement when Magnolia moved her arms to wrap them around him. They didn't speak. Magnolia wasn't sure they had any words. Eventually, they pulled apart. Naha went into the side room, probably to wash a little. Magnolia fixed her nightgown at the chest, her mind whirling with what had just happened. She moved up to lie on her pillow, on her side, wondering if she would ever sleep. She half expected him to leave. But when he re-entered the main room, it was just to lie on the side of the bed that was usually empty behind her. He wrapped his arm around her waist and pulled her back against him. Let tomorrow's magnolia deal with the consequences. For tonight, there was only her, only him, and their shared warmth as they drifted to sleep together at last. Chapter 16 The Friends Morning dawned as it always did and Magnolia half awoke from a dream involving dancing pixies in a forest to the sound of a knock at the door. Mmm, come in. She murmured sleepily. The door creaked open. Miss, I, oh me, I'm right sorry. I'll leave, I, oh, me God. Magnolia was fully awake now as she sat bolt upright, brought back to reality by the shock in Betty's voice. She looked around wildly, wondering for a split second what could have caused such a reaction. And then she saw him there, all muscles and red hair, peacefully asleep on the pillow next to her. She turned to see the maid standing frozen in the doorway. Betty's face was red as a strawberry as she said. I'm right sorry, Magnolia, I just, I didn't. Eat. Magnolia felt her own skin warm, too but she couldn't help but laugh at the ridiculousness of the situation. It's quite all right, Betty, dear. She said. Forgive me, I should have warned you before welcoming you inside. Betty nodded her head, and then a slow smile crossed her face. So. Forgive me for being so forward, but ye and me laid are? Magnolia chuckled softly. I'm not sure, to be entirely honest. She said a smile on her own face. She experimentally moved her body and felt stiffness in her arms and legs. The pain was sweet, though, stinging sharply like it had wakened her body anew. I simply... Oh, goodness, this feels so strange to talk about. Well. Betty giggled. We probably shouldn't speak of it at all while me laird is snoring right there next to ye. I only came by because me ma'am wants to ken if he'd prefer the leftovers from last night, or a fresh egg to break your fast. An egg, please. Magnolia said. Soft boiled if she can. She glanced at the sleeping man beside her, enjoying the feeling of warmth in her chest, then looked back to Betty. I think I shall take Elaine into the village to play with Bernie today. Would you like to accompany me? Betty looked surprised, but she nodded excitedly. If me laird can spare me from me duties for the day, I'd be more than happy to accompany ye. I can get some more of Greta's jam for me ma'am while I'm there. Magnolia smiled, and Betty glanced at the laird once more. I kenned it would happen eventually. The maid said teasingly. Sandy owes me a wee bobby now. With that, she left the room, closing the door behind her. Magnolia watched her go, then sighed contentedly, laying back on her pillow. It wasn't all contentment, though. Magnolia's thoughts drifted as she lay there, considering the reality she'd managed to ignore all of last night. I'll have to go home soon. I have to return to reality. This can't last. 
She'd been a member of the order since she was barely more than a child. She'd done her all to serve crown and country, just like her father before her. Her father waited back home for her return. Lizzie and baby John, too, who hadn't heard a word from her in all this time. How can I be considering abandoning it all so easily? How long day ye think it'll take till everyone in the castle kens? An hour? Less? Naha's deep voice whispered in her ear. She yelped, jumping a little before turning quickly to see him gazing at her with amusement in his eyes. Naha! How long have you been awake? He chuckled, reaching up to brush her hair from her face. Since Betty knocked on the door. Ye can he blame a man for wanting to overhear the lassies gossiping about his bed in prowess. Magnolia grinned and swatted at him, aiming to hit him lightly on the shoulder, but he caught her wrist and tugged. She squeaked, falling sideways on top of him, trapped by his arms. Her face was inches from his, and she looked down into his eyes. They were intense and smouldering and focused only on her. Why, my lad? She said coquettishly. You seem to have captured me in your embrace. Indeed. He agreed in a different, rougher voice, the hunger of the night before rising to the surface again. What are ye gonna do about it? I suppose there's always time to consider my choices later. She giggled and leaned down, their lips meeting and molding together as though they were created to do so. There was no slowness to it, this time. As soon as her mouth was on Nahas, need surged through her. Their mouths opened, their hands tore at useless clothing. Getting out of bed was delayed by another hour or so. Well? Uncle William asked as Betty walked into the small private dining room. Will his lordship be joining us for breakfast, or are Abby and me to adopt this wee button and all? Elaine giggled as William tickled her under the chin when he said this. If ye adopt me, will that make all four a year bairns me brothers and sisters instead of me cousins? She asked. Five, when the new one comes. Auntie Abby corrected. But I didn't think your daddy would want us stealin' ye away. Elaine nodded seriously. Aye, I can. He needs me here to look after him. She smiled at Betty and said. Isn't he well? He's usually up earlier than a this. Ah. Betty said, and for some reason, there was a strange smirk on her face. Well, Elaine, ye see, me lad and Magnolia both have other things to occupy them this morning. I'm afraid there'll probably be a wee bit of a delay before ye see them. Auntie Abby and Uncle William exchanged a strange look, and Elaine tilted her head curiously. Other things? She asked. Like work? Is Maggie still helping Daddy with the hard things? Uncle William's eyes were narrowed as he surveyed Betty. Still, they cleared up, and there was a big grin on his face as he said. Och, I, I'm betting Magnolia's helping Yada we something right hard as we speak. For some reason, Auntie Abby swatted his shoulder for that. Behave, William. She said as Betty giggled. Then a curious look crossed her features as she addressed Betty. Me husband may be vulgar, but serve me curiosity. Is he correct? I couldn't possibly comment, Betty said, placing Elaine's breakfast down in front of her. But I will say that Magnolia looked very pleased when I went to wake her this morn. And now? William pressed. Why? Betty said, eyes sparkling. I day believe I woke him and all. All three adults laughed, which mystified Elaine even further. What on earth was funny about waking people up? I shall never grow up. I shall stay a bairn forever so I didn't laugh at nonsense. Bored of this conversation, she said. The pups were both sleeping when I went to see them this morning. Do you think they'll be awake to play after breakfast? Actually, Elaine, Magnolia suggested a wee trip down to the village today. Do you want to come with us and see your friends? Betty asked her. Ye coming and all? Elaine asked, surprised. 
Betty never came along on fun things like this. Aye, if Yerda says it's grand. Betty confirmed. Then she had that odd smile on her face. And I'll tell ye, I think he's like to agree we anything Magnolia asks of him today. Why? Elaine asked, eyes wide. Even more confusingly, her aunt and uncle started laughing again. She frowned, crossing her arms. Adults are right strange. She declared. Uncle William snorted. I canny argue we ye there, lass. Tell you what, why didn't ye and Magnolia and Betty here ride we Abby back to the village? Ye can see your cousins before ye go off to meet your other friends. Elaine instantly brightened. She loved spending time with the Candlish children, from the oldest, who was nine, right down to the wee bairn who had just learned to walk. Tha sounds like fun. She said excitedly. What day ye think, Betty? Betty smiled. If the commander is kind enough to let us ride rather than walk, I'm hardly gone refuse. Auntie Abby touched her husband's arm. I'm happy to have ye all, a course, but if I've got three women in the wee wagon wee me, how are ye making it back? Och, I'll walk later. Uncle William told her. He kissed her cheek, and Elaine pretended to find it off-putting, but it was actually fine. She liked seeing her aunt and uncle being in love. I'm gonna visit the Kirk first. Auntie Abby raised an eyebrow. I? Ye turn in pious on me, husband? Wish someone had told me that before ye placed a fifth bairn in me belly. Elaine glanced at Abby's stomach. She knew that her aunt was with child, but she had very little idea of what Uncle William had done to begin the process. I'll ask Magnolia later. Or Daddy, he'll ken for sure. Uncle William let out a loud belly laugh. Nay, I'm nay going for a service. I'm just gonna visit me cousin in yonder kirkyard. Then he and Auntie Abby exchanged one of those looks that Elaine never understood, filled with meaning, before Abby nodded. If ye are gonna visit mommy, can I give ye some flowers to take along? The wild purple primulas are out, and I'd like to give her a wee present. Elaine said. Can ye wait till I gather some? Aye, a course. William agreed. Now, eat ye breakfast. Sounds like ye've got quite the day ahead of ye. Magnolia, Betty, and Elaine travelled with Abby down to the village, stopping in briefly to meet her children and her sister. After some conversation and a little play between the little ones, the three of them headed towards the small house on the outskirts where Greta and Bernie lived. Bernie was as enthusiastic as ever when he saw the three of them approaching, and he ran out of the house to greet them as usual. He hugged Elaine excitedly and politely bowed to both Magnolia and Betty. Och, Bernie, I've kenned ye since ye were in your napkins. None of that bowing to me, I'm just a maid. Betty told him. Aye, but the prettiest maid in the whole world. Bernie said sweetly. Just like Miss Maggie is the prettiest nanny in the whole world. Greta stuck her head out of the window opening. Stop bothering the girls and bring them inside, Burn. She called. Hail, Betty. You're looking fresh as a daisy. Would that I had your youth. Oh, don't. Magnolia called back, laughing a little. If you are old, what does that make me? I have three years on you. I'm nearly five. Elaine said brightly making everyone laugh as they finished the walk up the path and entered the house. Once the greetings and niceties were complete, the children went outside to play, leaving the three adults to drink ale and gossip together. It was precisely what Magnolia needed, and the whole reason she'd engineered this trip in the first place. So, Greta said. Why didn't ye tell me what's happened? Magnolia blushed bright pink at her friend's directness trying to think of a way to put it into words. Before she could, though, Betty saved her the effort. The maid started to giggle and said, Ye'd never ken, Greta, she said. But this morn, when I'm on me way to wake Magnolia, guess who's in her bed? Betty. Magnolia protested, but she was grinning. 
she had missed this kind of girlish talk. In her regular life, only Lizzie was ever there to have such conversations. Lizzie. What would she have to say about all of this? Have I betrayed our friendship now? Greta nodded with a small chuckle. So ye and me Laird finally got to the business, did ye? How was that? Magnolia cackled, banishing the maudlin thoughts of her other life. Have Olga. Greta, you're a mother. I, and a woman widowed, and Betty here still half a ban. The farmer winked. It's been a while since the two us have had a man in our lives. Now, I gave ye me ale, and ye are gonna give us the details in exchange. That hardly seems proper. Magnolia laughed. Betty shrugged. Proper's for the nobles. We're a maid and a farmer and a nanny. Let's gossip. Magnolia continued to smile outwardly, but internally she froze. A nanny. Nothing more. How simple things would be if this were so. But last night had been so wonderful, and she did not want reality to crush this unexpected high, at least not yet. So instead, she would continue to pretend, continue to live the life she wished she had. Magnolia would drink her ale and laugh with her friends, and, for now, she'd forget everything else that awaited in the shadows of her future. Naha heard the rustling of the grass that indicated someone was coming up behind him. Still, he didn't look up from the elaborate headstone that bore Katrina's full name and her epitaph. Beloved wife. Adored cousin. Dearest daughter. She is a mother to angels now. I hope ye Rini sit in here feeling guilty. William's voice said from behind him. Naha didn't turn around. Betty didn't he take long in spreading the word then, I? Naha rasped back without turning. He was crouched in front of the headstone, and a second later, William crouched next to him. Well, we akened that it was a matter of when. Nay if about it. William told him. Naha finally turned his head. His friend held a small bunch of daisies in his hand, which he placed at the grave next to the primroses that Naha brought. They sat there, crouched in silence, and lost in memories for a few moments before Naha spoke again. So did ye ken I was gonna be here? William gave a small huff of a laugh. A course I did. I ken ye better than anyone. Honestly, though, I'm a mite surprised that ye finally took the leap. I thought ye and Magnolia would be dancing around each other for a year yet. Naha said nothing. William sighed. She's a good lass, especially for an Englishwoman. Elaine adores her, the village people seem to have taken to her, and ye're clearly besotted. What's the problem? There's nay problem. Naha told him, and he was surprised to find that, for the first time, that was true. Yes, Magnolia was still hiding something. Yes, he still missed Katrina. But loving Magnolia, and having her love him, made these things matter little and less. Katrina would have liked her. William went on after a brief pause. Ye can her me cousin love to spend her days we strong women like Alia Dare and me Abby. Magnolia would have fitted right in there in their wee group. Naha smiled, remembering the ladies gossiping in a time that seemed so long ago now. He could picture his recent conversation with Lady Taylor, how she'd spoken with love regarding both her deceased husband and her new kennel master. And now he understood. Aye, that she would. He agreed. She came to me, ye can. Cat, I mean. William gave him a slightly concerned look. What day ye mean by that? Am I gonna have to call the healer and get your head checked out? Or perhaps I should be calling a Catholic priest, since ye seem to be seeing ghosts. Better nay tell the minister. Naha let out a chuckle, stretching and straightening to his feet. It was just a dream, William. He said. I ken she was nay really there. She's under this headstone bones now, or dust, and the rest of her is in heaven where she belongs. But Elaine believes her mither dances with the fair folk, and so that's what she was doing in me dream. 
William also straightened up, giving Naha a searching look before nodding. Aye, Tha sounds right. Me cousin was always away we the fairies. Elaine, too. She looks like he, Naha, but she's got her mither's heart. I can. Naha said with a soft smile. I'm the proudest man of faith I could be. They both looked at the grave for a little longer, then William asked. So, what did this not apparition tell ye? Naha smiled to himself, picturing the image by the lake once more. Tha she wants me to be happy. That I have any to stay stuck in the past, stuck we her. It was me dream, which means I kenned it this whole time, of course, but. I think it took a talk we Ailey, and a wee probe into me own mind before I could get there. William patted him on the back, and it quickly turned into a tight, brotherly hug. I've only been telling ye that for three years, ye bampot. He murmured into Naha's shoulder. Naha hugged him back just as tightly. I, I, I can. I should ken by now that ye're always right. The two men separated. And Magnolia? William asked. She's always right, and all. Naha grinned. William laughed loudly. Smart man. But that isn't what I mean. What's this gonna be? Naha looked him straight in the face. I love her. He said, surprised how easily the words slipped from his lips. They were true, truer than he'd even known before he spoke. I love her, William. It doesn't mean I love Katrina less. William seemed to consider this for a long moment. I didn't ken what I'd day if I lost me Abby. Day ye think of them differently, Magnolia and Cat? Did he? Of course he did. Neither was less than the other, it wasn't like that at all. They were both essential to him, both parts of who he was, complementing each other and him in how they affected his life. Cat. She was the waters of the sea, deep and wild and unpredictable. She could be calm as a bay, or stormy as a tempest, at a moment's notice. Still, if you were kind to her and held your sail true, ye'd reap the rewards the like of which few men on earth are lucky enough to ever even dream. Naha smiled. Just like ye with your devilishly handsome features that ye're always telling me about, William. I guess the eyes and the storm both run in the family. The commander chuckled, giving his green-eyed friend a little shove on the arm. Flatterer, he said. Correct, but still a flatterer. Naha snorted, glancing up at the sky. The clouds were gathering, dark and thick. It would be a heavy rain, though perhaps a brief one. The green of life in the highlands came at a cost, but he would never be the one to complain about the life-giving water the sky offered to them. What Abu Magnolia, then? If Katrina was the sea, what's our wee English rose? William asked. Cat was the sea, and Magnolia is the sky. Naha told him, without even having to pause to think. She's the lightness of the breeze in springtime, the warmth of the sun on your face, the cycle of heat and rain and storm and snow that brings life anew to the world every year. The two men stood quietly as the first raindrops began to fall. Naha watched as they dripped on Katrina's headstone, highlighting her name, reminding the world that she'd existed and that she'd always, in some ways, be here. Ye love her? William said with a surprised smile. Ye really love her? Aye. Naha agreed. Aye. Now let's get us out of the rain. I should pay the bairns a visit, it's been a while. Sounds good. Abby's making chicken soup. William told him. He clapped him on the back again as the rain started to fall more heavily. And the two friends left the courtyard, side by side, and said goodbye to the loved one who had finally found peace. Perhaps, now, at last, Naha could find peace too. Chapter 17 The Conversation between Naha's visit to William and Abby's home and Magnolia's time with her friends in the village, it was almost evening before she saw him again. Supper was fast approaching, as Elaine's grumbling stomach informed them all when Naha found his way to the nursery. 
Magnolia's heart melted as soon as she saw his face, and the warm smile that spread over it when he glanced at her face. Good to see you, me lad. She said, a little teasingly. Daddy. Elaine chirped. She ran to jump into his arms in a tight hug, as she always did. Have ye had a good day? We were about to go get our supper, will ye come with us? Aye. He said, tapping her nose. Though, actually, I had a wee idea that ye ladies might like. I was thinking, if ye wanted, ye and me and Magnolia could take our supper out on the grass we a wee blanket. Magnolia felt the shiver of a pleasant surprise. It was such a simple idea, and yet it made her feel so happy that he'd think of it. She knew the days were passing quickly, and she'd have to make a tough choice and very soon, but was it so wrong to love him? Because I do. I am sure of it. And if it was love that she was truly feeling, then what crime was there in an outside supper? Even if the future was murky, hadn't she earned a night eating dinner with this family? Not your family. Your family waits at home. But they could be. Lord, how she wished they could be. But does that mean giving up everything else I hold dear? I think that sounds extremely pleasant. Magnolia said with a smile. I'd love to eat in the gardens. The air is so fresh and clean here, it makes such a pleasant experience. Aye, and we'll bring a wax of lemon candle to keep away the midges. Elaine said brightly. So they didn't cover us in bites or try to get at our food. Smart lass. Naha said proudly. I'll meet ye both outside. Magnolia. Could ye change Elaine into something a wee bit warmer if we're gonna be out late? Yes, of course. Magnolia agreed. She caught his glance, and heat flashed between his eyes and hers, causing a tinge of red on her cheeks. I think I will change, as well. Aye. Naha agreed. Aye, me too, come to think of it. Shall we make it a proper fancy night? Oh, yes. Elaine piped up as Naha put her back on the ground. Come, Maggie. I can exactly what I should wear. She grabbed Magnolia's hand and pulled her away. Magnolia chanced one last warm look in Naha's direction, before she allowed the child to spirit her away. Naha had just finished placing the spring wildflowers in the jar when his daughter and Magnolia arrived. Seeing them together after the events of the night before, was almost too much for a man's heart to bear. Daddy, look. Elaine said, rushing ahead of her nanny slightly to sit opposite her father on the other side of the blanket. Look, look. Me and Maggie are matching again. Irene we the bonniest lassies ye ever did see? It was true. They were both dressed in simple light green day dresses, each with a slightly darker rose cape over their shoulders. The color popped oddly with Elaine's fiery red hair, and it brought out the bright pink in Magnolia's cheeks even more than usual. Naha grinned. I, bonnier than a sulky wife, the pair are ye. He was rewarded for that by Magnolia shifting in awkward, pleased embarrassment before she too took a seat at the blanket. Elaine, did ye pick the outfits? Oh, you could tell, could you? Magnolia asked him. She was too refined to stick out her tongue, of course, but he could hear how much she'd wanted to in her voice. I. Elaine told him, obviously very pleased with herself. I, I kent there was an old green dress somewhere, and I asked Maggie if she would need pretty please put it on, and it fit. I love it when we match, it makes me feel like we're a family. Magnolia reached for one of the wine glasses that Naha had already poured, and took a quiet sip. Naha's eyes were on her, eager to see her reaction when he said, Well, in a strange way, we are a wee bit of a family, didn't ye think so? Predictably, Magnolia almost choked on her wine, and hastily covered it with a delicate cough. Fortunately, Elaine didn't seem to notice, instead looking thrilled at her father's words as she helped herself to some bread and cheese. I think so, I. His daughter chirped. I ken Maggie's only been here for a month, 
but I can't remember what it was like before. I'm so glad you're here and that we got to meet ye. It's like I was sleeping before, but now I am nay. Like a good dream that ye started. She reached out and took Magnolia's hand at that, and Naha watched as the Englishwoman's eyes shone with emotion. I'm glad I have met you, too. Magnolia said quietly, squeezing Elaine's hand gently. Both of you. Elaine beamed. Will ye stay forever, Maggie? We'd be happy to have ye. Betty loves ye, and so does the cook, and Bernie said his mam thinks ye're a real nice lass and she loves your visits. Say so ye'll stay forever. Please. Now his breath caught. He knew it was foolish, but suddenly the most essential thing in this or any world was that he heard the answer he wanted to from those lips. I. Magnolia started. Naha's heart began to beat faster as he realized she was deliberately avoiding his eyes, looking anywhere else that she could accept at him. Well, Elaine, when I took this job, your father and I agreed on a one-month provisional contract. What's a proficiency construct? Elaine asked through a mouthful of cheese. Magnolia breathed out a chuckle. A provisional contract. It means that your father agreed to hire me on the grounds that, after one month, we would review how well I fitted into the job and then evaluate what happened next. Oh. Elaine said. I see. She thought about it for a minute then said. Well, that's all right then. Because I really like ye very much, and ye're the first nanny I really like, so that means it's fine. Oh, I don't know. Magnolia replied innocently, her expression remarkably plain. I'm unsure if I have met all your father's requirements to remain a long-term asset of the household. She turned her face to Naha then, and her eyes were sparkling. You're teasing me, ye witch. Naha found himself grinning at her gall, even as Elaine looked at him with worried eyes. Ye are any gone send her away, are ye, daddy? She said. I. Now has started. Because I'll be so very sad if ye day that. Elaine told him. She stood up, her hands on her hips, her little face screwed up in irritation. And very angry, and all. Listen to me, Daddy, Maggie is the best thing we've ever had in this castle. She kens the best games, and she saved me in the lake, Anne. Elaine. Now had tried to cut in. But she kept up her rant, building her tantrum in the way only a child of her age could. Anne, Anne, Uncle William and Auntie Abby like her and all. And she's got Sir Spindrift now, and Laird Softpaws is his brother, Daddy, and ye just canny split them up. Ye canny, ye canny. Elaine. Magnolia said softly. It was clear from her expression she hadn't expected such a reaction and she felt terrible for upsetting the girl. Darling, that isn't what I meant. Naha reached over and pulled Elaine into a tight hug, holding her close until she calmed down, like he always did when she got worked up like this. When he was sure she was breathing a little more regularly, he said. Are ye ready to listen now? The little girl nodded mutely against his chest. I'm nay gonna send Magnolia away. He told her stroking her hair. In fact, I'd quite like it if she stayed forever, too. He was speaking to Elaine, but as he said that last part, his eyes were fixed on Magnolia's. The woman's bright blue eyes widened at whatever implication she'd taken from his words, and, in truth, Naha wasn't sure what he'd meant by them himself. Elaine pulled back to scrutinize him. Really, Daddy? Are ye telling me true? He made a cross over his heart. Truer than true, Meechuk. Magnolia's your nanny, and ye care about her. I wouldn't ye split ye up. Or Sir Softpaws and Laird Spindrift. Elaine giggled. Ye got their names wrong, Daddy. She said, accepting the glass of crushed apple cider that Magnolia handed her. Ock, I'll remember one of these days. He chuckled. Drink your cider and eat your supper now, there's a good lass. The three of them talked light-heartedly, 
though Naha's eyes kept sweeping to Magnolia, and he was thrilled to notice she was doing the same. It was all so fresh, so new, so strange. He knew he had no regrets about the previous night or what they'd done this morning. Did she? Was he too hopeful to think that her gentle smile meant that she did not? God above, Naha, ye sound like a boy of five and ten again. Naha was happy that they were here, he and Magnolia and Elaine, sitting and eating and talking and comfortable. He wouldn't deny, though, that part of him was eager to send the child to bed, so that he and Magnolia could revisit this morning's activities. Eventually, something appeared to occur to Elaine. But Daddy? She said, in that way she did where she expected everyone to keep up with her exact level of conversation. What Abu when I grow up? I will need need a nanny then. That's true. Naha said seriously. His heart leapt in his chest like a cricket, as he caught Magnolia's eyes once again. I would need worry too much Abu that right now though, Meechuk. I have a feeling there may be another way to get her to stick around. Magnolia's eyes widened slightly. Another way, my lad? She asked, the question sounding almost like a challenge. Naha smirked and winked at her. Ye are really the only one who cares how to tease. After an hour or so, Elaine started to get sleepy, and Magnolia walked with Naha as he carried the little girl up to her bedroom. She was sleeping soundly by the time that they arrived and tucked her into bed. When they left and stood in the corridor, there was a mildly awkward pause. Magnolia opened her mouth to speak. Naha. Magnolia? He started at the exact same time. They both stopped abruptly, then looked at each other and laughed. Are you all right? He asked her. Yeah, nay. Having regrets? No, she said quickly. She needed Naha to know that it was true. She regretted a lot, but not him. Whatever happened, whatever secrets she had buried just under the surface, that were threatening the happiness she'd found, she'd never regret giving herself to him. But I will. I will regret it when I must choose between him or my home. Him or my father. The corner of Naha's lip twitched. Good. He said. Me neither. Magnolia hesitated, then moved a little closer, putting her hand on his arm. Would you like to go and walk by the lake with me? She asked. I like to see the stars when I can, and I'd very much like to see them with you. Stop this, Magnolia. You're just getting yourself further into something you can't ever keep. Naha leaned down and kissed her in response. It was a light kiss, just a brush of the lips, but the passion was just as strong and sweet as each time their mouths had met so far. When the kiss was over, she slipped her hand into Naha's, and they headed out towards the gardens. So tell me, Magnolia. Naha asked her as they reached the front entrance of the castle. Do ye have any brothers? Sisters? He knows nothing of me. He doesn't even know my real name. Magnolia shook her head. I had several brothers, but none lived past a week or so, sadly. She told him. My mother had much trouble retaining her pregnancies. She and my father had all but given up by the time I came along. I see. Naha told her. I'm me parents only bairn as well. Me only brother has always been William. They walked out into the gardens, turning without even needing to consider the direction, walking towards the lock that reflected the night sky. You and William have been such close friends for so long? She asked him. Since childhood? Aye, for as long as I can remember. William's been with me through everything, no matter how bad it gets. Magnolia loved the soft expression on his face when he talked of his friend. It was pure and straightforward fraternal love, the kind she rarely saw shown openly between men back home. I'm glad you're so close. She said. She let go of his hand but it was only to slip her arm around the crook of his elbow. He seems a good man. Ock, he's a pain in the neck. Naha laughed. 
He placed his free hand over hers, holding it in the loop of his arm. I'm sure he'd be right flattered to hear you speak in so nicely of him, though. He seems the type who would be prone to flattery, it's true. Magnolia said with a little laugh of her own. She did like Commander Candlish rather a lot, but he seemed to go out of his way to be genuinely ridiculous at times. Now has squeezed her hand. Did ye ken he was me late wife's cousin? A cold feeling ran through Magnolia at the reference to Katrina. She vividly remembered Naha's words from the previous night. I didn't need ye to be cat. I love ye. Had he said that only in the heat of the moment? Could he possibly have genuinely meant it, when he claimed that she was equal in his eyes to his beloved dead wife, the woman who had given him a lane? It hardly felt possible. And possible or not, did it matter? She was a spy, an Englishwoman, and a member of the Order. No move she could make would result in anything but betrayal for someone. Are my only choices pain and more pain? That cannot be true. I didn't know that, no. She said. Were they close? Naha seemed to feel her shiver, because he pulled her slightly closer as they walked by the shore. They were close, I. He agreed. Very close. When we met, we were all just bands. William and I were like brothers long before she came along, so half the time, I felt like he was protecting me from her rather than the other way around. Though discomfort still roiled, she found herself smiling at the idea of little Naha, intimidated by a pretty girl and having to be cared for by his dramatic friend. I didn't tell you this to upset ye, Naha continued. As they walked along the shore, the wind gently blew, making the stars on the surface dance like a beautiful ballroom full of angels. I tell ye because, well, William was the biggest reason I was able to get over my fear and marry Katrina, despite of the pressure for me today otherwise. Oh? Magnolia asked, her eyes trained on the water. She missed dancing. Did they dance like that in Scotland? It seemed strange to her that she had been here so long and she didn't know for sure. What do I know about Scotland, really? Am I living in a fantasy? I. Naha agreed. I dinny ken if ye've noticed, but I can be a bit. reticent. That broke Magnolia out of her discomfort as she turned to look him in the face. Oh, no, my lad. She joked. You? reticent? Perish the thought. Why, you are as open as any book. He chuckled. Ye're far too cheeky for your own good. Ye're gonna offend some great laird one of these days. Well, of course, I should strive to avoid such a thing. Magnolia replied innocently, batting her eyelashes. Naha let go of her hand and sat on the grass by the lock, tugging gently at her arm until she was sitting down next to him. I tell ye, he said gently. Because, Magnolia, William has been trying his best for weeks to coax me into telling ye what I did last night. Magnolia started, unsure if she heard correctly. Ask. Are you telling me that he? I'm saying he likes ye, Magnolia, and he thinks ye're good for me. I ken it's fast, and I ken it's sudden, but I also ken what I feel. And if William trusts ye too, then I didn't see any reason to hold back. Nah, his expression was serious. Magnolia's heart rate sped at the implications of what he was saying. She couldn't be entirely sure, but it sounded like he wanted to. It seemed like he wished. He leaned over and nuzzled her cheek, his beard tickling. I'm so glad ye turned up at me door, Miss Magnolia Lemore. Her smile slipped in an instant. And reality returns. There it was again, that name that wasn't her own. The woman he loved didn't even exist. And suddenly, she couldn't do it. She couldn't lie to him any more. But no more can I tell him the truth right now. If I do, I will lose him forever, and I cannot bear it. His face was moving, ready to catch her in another kiss, but she put a hand up gently to stop him. Naha. She said. Naha, there are things you don't know. He pulled back a little, 
but he didn't look upset. Is this Abu the big secret you've been keeping all this time? What is it? A husband? A bairn? You? You knew I was hiding something? She asked, astonished. And she'd been so careful. Even if his guesses were entirely wrong, she still found herself taken aback. Naha chuckled. I, I've ken since the moment I saw those lovely blue eyes are yours. You're awfully good, but I didn't get to me position among the lads without being able to notice things. She gave him a rueful smile. Her wild, intelligent, handsome Highlander. How had she ever thought these people savage? How had they ever been at war? War. Suddenly, Magnolia wanted nothing more than to cry. She felt weary, as though she hadn't slept in the whole time she'd been here, as the burden of the letter she had still to write weighed on her conscience. Spy. Traitor. Well? Are ye gonna tell me? Naha prompted gently. Can I? Can I so readily betray my own people, my father? Magnolia opened her mouth, trying to work out how to phrase it, trying to work out anything at all to tell him, but when she tried to talk, her voice simply refused to work. I. Naha, I'm so sorry, but I can't. My life before now. It was different from what I'd like you to know about. I will tell you. I swear it. But please, do not make me do it now. And do not ask me for any commitment until I can do you the justice of the truth. Naha considered her for a moment, then slowly raised his hand to cup her face, making her raise her eyes to look up at him. His green eyes shone with concern and intelligence and, yes, love, and Magnolia simply wanted to be lost in them forever. It's a right. He said. Whatever it is, it canny be that bad. Ye've got a good heart, Magnolia. I'll wait until ye're ready. But until then, I want to ken something for sure. Whatever it is, I'm going to have to lie. Again. That's all I do now. The thought unsettled her, making her feel sick to the stomach, and not just a little disgusted with herself. I never thought I'd feel guilty for serving my crown and country. Am I doomed to guilt either way? She nodded, her throat dry. All right. What do you want to know? He looked at her seriously for a long moment. Did you mean it last night? When ye said thy you love me. Magnolia flinched, astonished that he should even have to ask such a question. Did she mean it? How could she not mean it? He was everything right in the world. The sun rose on his smile and set for his sleep, and the birds sang because he was so full of life that the world needed to respond. Of course I meant it. Magnolia said, and her voice was firm and confident for the first time. Of course I did. I love you, Naha Irvin, more than anyone I have ever met in my life. Of that, at least, she could be satisfied. Staying or going, who she could trust, who she would hurt, none of that was apparent, but Magnolia knew she loved this man. He surveyed her, then his expression softened. Then that's good enough for me. He said softly and pressed his lips to hers. Only the moon and the dancing stars on the lock witnessed what happened next. The gentle sighs and the low groans were lost in the sounds of the rippling water, and the moonlight cloaked the writhing bodies, allowing them, at least for now, to stay together as one. And for now, just for now, Magnolia could forget her duty and the impossible choice she faced. Because right now, there was no choice at all. Chapter 18 The Letters This was it. Tomorrow was the day. Four weeks had flown by, both so slow they felt like a year, and so quickly she felt it had barely been a day. So much had happened. The girl Magnolia had been when she arrived seemed to barely exist anymore. She had lost her maidenhood to a wild Highlander, but it was much more than that. She had made friends, helped save a people from the threat of winter, and yes, she had even found love. Reality still waited, however. Her country and her crown awaited her word, and so did her father. 
Much as she would like to simply disappear into the wonder of the highlands of Scotland forever, much as she wished dearly to not have to face her past, the letter carrier would await her tomorrow all the same. Even if I can stay, then what? Shall I lie about my name and my history to the man I love forever? It made her head hurt to think about it. It was too much, far too much, and she wasn't sure what she was going to do about it. Still, one problem at a time. Right now, there was a letter to deal with. Magnolia chewed on the end of the pen, knowing she was destroying the beautiful feather but finding herself unable to care. This letter was possibly the most important document that she would ever send in her life. She needed to make sure that she got the wording entirely right. What was right? What was wrong? What should she tell them, and how could she convince them of the truth? Magnolia had known for a long time, of course, that the day when she must write the letter was coming. She admitted to herself in private that she had delayed it until the very last possible moment, content to live in the guise of Magnolia Limor just a little longer. But Magnolia Limor was not sitting in front of her desk with a sharpened swan's feather in her hand. Instead, Magnolia Winterbourne, lady of the Elphinstone estate, was poised and ready to write. She would pen words that could change not only her own life, but the lives of an entire clan. The lives of a whole country. Perhaps even two. Thank goodness I have been trained to handle the pressure. I'd be entirely falling apart otherwise. After over an hour of agonizing, she dipped her pen in ink and began to write. For the grand honorable gentleman of the gathering to which I have forsworn my penmanship. My heartfelt blessings to yourself and your families. I write as the stated four-week stretch for which you assigned me this task has been completed, and I have much to report. However, be prepared, it may not be exactly as you expected. You see, I came here looking for a war, and instead, I found something entirely different. Laird MacFoyle rules over a populous, but hungry clan. In heart. They are fiercer and stronger than any village I have ever come across, but in coin and bread, they are bereft. The village headman is a ninety-year-old blind widower, who lost all of his children and grandsons to war. His granddaughter was also taken from him in the fighting. Most of the young men in the village have been eradicated in previous wars, most bloodily the events of three years ago. The laird himself fought alongside his men, and barely escaped with his life. Since then, he has had no time for any sort of plotting whatsoever, he has been too busy trying to ensure his people are fed. Magnolia redipped her pen again, feeling a wave of sadness that made her hands shake slightly, as she thought of poor old Ewan and all the pain he had endured. Though Laird MacFoyle is considered strong among the Scottish people, his home site has no preparation for war. As well as a food shortage and a lack of men, there are very few defences around his boundaries. His closest allies also suffered greatly, and each of the clans is struggling to rebuild. The only heir to the MacFoyle lairdship is a four-year-old girl. While she is bright and kind, she is but a child. Were anything to happen to the laird, I am unsure the clan could recover. To the south of the castle sits a village filled with women and children trying to do the work of dead men. To the north, a forest, where the child heir believes the fairy folk reside. Clan McCullen, McFoyle's closest political ally, exists to the left. A failed attempt at a marriage pact has soured relations, which has been a massive problem, for a clan that relies on its allies to rebuild after the previous devastation of battle. Though repairs have begun, the tension still exists, and any rekindling of such could be a true disaster for the people. She sighed, thinking of the work they had undertaken to mitigate the threat of closed supply routes. The infighting between lairds was too much. The clan could not face any more of it. In short, though you may scarce believe it, these Scots and this clan are a people who want nothing more than peace. They wish to be left alone, not to attack what we hold dear. My time in the village, with the people, has taught me that much. They not only detest the idea of further fighting, a large enough act of aggression could annihilate them entirely. Their army is in tatters. Though their commander is brave and durable, 
they have lost many soldiers, and there are very few young men left to draft. The Highlanders keep themselves distant from the lowlands and from the borders because they know that the further south they travel, the more they are likely to hurt. To conclude, under no circumstances should you launch an attack on Clan Muckfoyle or the northern lands. They are kind, loving people who have suffered much. They plot not against us but instead spend their energies trying to remain afloat in a sea of misfortune. Prithee do not sully our name, and the name of our crown and country, with needless bloodshed on a peaceful clan. Enclosed is a sealed envelope, intended for my father. If the reader could ensure that the sealed document arrives, so that Lord Daniel Winterbourne of Elphinstone may peruse it privately, I would be exceedingly grateful. And thus, with my wishes for your continued health and great fortune, and that of our beloved Queen and country, I end my report. Your loyal and obedient servant. Magnolia Winterbourne, Lady of Elphinstone. Magnolia leaned back to survey her work, sprinkling sand to dry the ink and gently blowing to clear it. She would need to write to her father, but what on earth would she tell him when she barely knew what came next herself? To keep herself occupied, she wrote out a duplicate of the first letter, to tuck away in her secret drawer. It was her habit to have copies of all written correspondence, one never knew when they may need to access the exact wording of documents once more. By the time she had signed her own name with a flourish a second time and folded the copy, she knew that the only way to get what she needed to say on paper was to write from the heart. So, she once again dipped her pen and began to write. My esteemed father, to whom I have not spoken in far too long, and with all the love and duty that my position of your daughter commands. Now what? There was so much to say, and she hardly knew her own thoughts. She wanted nothing more than to be fully honest with her father, but how could she be so, when she barely felt she knew what honesty meant? Magnolia's father had done everything for her. He'd educated her, trained her, and brought her up to believe that she was more than just some silly girl. He'd comforted her when her mother died, and taught her how to stay strong. She'd thought she would stay by his side forever. How could she tell him she was considering abandoning him? And what was more, could she really go through with it? I wish you were here now, father. I could tell you all, and you could help me decide what to do. Magnolia wrote of Lizzie, of baby John, of cousin Mary and her pregnancy asking after all of them politely before inquiring about her father's health. She knew she was stalling, but the words she needed to write wouldn't come. Have you been worried sick all this time? If I write the truth, will you be alone, no mother, and no me? The thought of Daniel growing old alone in the estate made her heart constrict. Was she selfish? Was there indeed no good left in her? The truth. Magnolia owed her father the truth. She wrote of the discoveries she'd made here. She'd discovered no war, no plotting. Instead, there was a little girl who smiled like sunshine. An old blind man who saw more than Magnolia ever would. A gentle farmer's widow and a loving maid, who went out of their way to welcome a stranger. She wrote of the Scottish kindness as well as, in spite of, their poverty. She wrote of their community, and how well they bonded together against tragedy. She'd filled near two pages before she paused, realizing she still hadn't written the words she needed to. I must tell him about Naha. He deserves to know with whom he now shares residence in my heart. But how? Where to start? How could she describe the laird, their connection, how she felt whenever she saw his gentle smile? How could she do it justice? She could explain the cold, hard facts, but would that even begin to cover it? God above help me. I have no idea how to do any of this. Magnolia swallowed. She could stand on the edge of this no longer. As a de facto countess and a lady of the realm, as a member of the order, and most importantly as a Winterborn, she owed her father the truth. And so, she wrote. She covered two more pages before she was done, describing Naha, describing her own feelings, explaining how torn she felt at having to choose between worlds. She even admitted that, right now, 
she didn't think she was remotely capable of leaving. There was wetness in Magnolia's eyes when she signed her name, not of sadness, but of an amalgamation of emotion she could barely comprehend. She missed her father dearly, and Lizzie, of course, but there it was in ink on paper. Scotland was home. Now her was home. Could it possibly stay that way? England was home, too, and had been her whole life. Father was home. The order was home. Could she really just discard it like so much refuse? For the moment, I can. Right now, Magnolia could not think any further ahead than the moment. The future was murky, and she only knew that she could never be sure of what waited behind the thick fog. She created a duplicate of this letter, too, and tucked both copied versions away safely. Then, she sealed the personal message to her father, and placed it inside the larger letter meant for the order at large. In the morning, she would take it with her to the outskirts of the village, where the order's man would be waiting to take it from her. Though she had asked him for the privacy and was glad he had given it, she found that her bed felt strangely vast and empty without Naha sleeping next to her tonight. When she finally drifted into sleep, it was a troubled one, full of dreams of conflict and betrayal, and the slim hope that she was, at last, doing the right thing. Naha complicated everything slightly by turning up at her door to say good night. At that point, neither of them could resist his coming inside. Now, as the light of summer dawn woke Magnolia, she gazed at his sleeping form next to her, and wondered once more how on earth things had ended up this way. Not, she reflected with a soft smile as he snuffled in his sleep like a puppy, that she would change anything. She couldn't possibly regret the moments she spent with the laird, her love. Nor could she ever regret getting to know and care for Elaine, or every moment she had spent in this ethereal wonderland, so near yet so far from home. Can I really stay? Can I really give up everything I've ever known? She walked to the window and her desk under it, and withdrew the copies of the letters which she would be delivering to the order's man this morning. Sir Spindrift raised a sleepy head as she passed him. Hush, boy. She told him in a whisper. It is not yet time to wake. Later, you and I shall play with your brother and with Elaine like always. Sir Spindrift couldn't possibly understand her words exactly, but he let out a low contented growl and tucked his head back under his paw. She smiled at him and glanced out of the window. The lock. Where I saved Elaine, and in a way, where everything began. The lock had been the first thing she noted from her window that first day, and it was the first thing she noted now, shining in the pre-morning sunlight like an exotic gemstone. It was not green like an emerald or blue like a sapphire, but rather somewhere between the two. It had been a temporary feature in her life for four weeks now, beautiful and mysterious and fleeting, just like the country. But Naha grunted and rolled over in his sleep in the bed behind her, and she couldn't help but wonder. Perhaps it will be temporary no longer. Perhaps. Or perhaps not. Regardless of all of that, Magnolia had a job to complete first. Magnolia dressed quickly but quietly, making sure she did not wake the laird, glad it was summer so she could wear the least number of layers. She slipped out, closing the door behind her as quietly as she possibly could. Sleep well, Naha. I will be back once I finish changing my life forever, one way or another. Magnolia didn't know the man who sat eating breakfast in the tiny tavern, but she knew he was there for her. There were four customers, but only one wore the telltale elegant rose brooch on his lapel. The tavern keeper's daughter was up and about, and Magnolia pulled her hood up over her head. She was doing nothing wrong by being here, she knew that. Still, she would prefer to not advertise the fact she was having a meeting today, especially at this hour. Later, she would wish she'd taken better stock of the occupants of the other tables, but for now, her focus was all on the spy. She approached him and sat down across from him. Are you here for breakfast, good sir? She asked quietly. And do you mind if I join you? He grunted. I'm waiting on someone. He told her in an unmistakably English accent. 
he gestured to the brooch on his lapel. A rose is a rare beauty. He mused. The code words. Yes, but its beauty belies its thorns. Magnolia replied. The man nodded. You have something for me? She took out the large folded letter and passed it across the table. It contains two letters. She told him. The larger one is requested, and a smaller for my father's eyes. Can you please ensure he receives it? The man simply grunted as he tucked the letters away inside his cape. Magnolia knew that she must avoid suspicion, so she stayed to eat breakfast with the informant. However, no words passed between them other than what was necessary. It would have been too strange to enter such a place at this time, without making a purchase. After she had eaten, she stood and bid him farewell then exited the tavern, feeling a massive weight lifted from her shoulders. At last, the plot is done. Now what? But what she did not realize, as she walked away, was that the two men eating at the table on the other side of the tavern should have been very familiar to her. One was a young soldier sweet on Betty, with whom she had exchanged words on several occasions, when he found an excuse to hang around the castle. The other, however, was more pressing and more well known. When she thought back later, she'd remember and wonder how she did not recognize him. That sandy hair, the gray eyes, and the light, quirky smile that were the trademarks of the young soldier's commander and now her best friend, William Candlish. And he'd served as a witness to everything. Chapter 19 The Discovery Naha had just finished paying a visit to the village headman when one of the young soldiers who remained in their tattered army ran up to him, out of breath. Me led. The boy huffed. He had to stop to swallow some air, his hands resting on his knees as he caught his breath. Naha waited patiently, wondering exactly how far the soldier had run, and why his need for urgency. Me led, the commander. Naha stiffened. William. Has something happened to him? The soldier took another deep breath, shaking his head. Nay, nay, at least, I didn't think, he's been looking for ye all morning, me lad. He's got a scour in the village trying to find where ye are. That is very strange. But I told Magnolia where I was headed before I came out to see you and didn't he ask her? I'd have assumed she would be the first he'd seek out. The soldier paled, just a little. Well, me lad, ye see, the thing is. I didnae think he wants Miss Lee more to ken whatever it is he has to say. What? Why? Naha demanded. That made no sense. William had been one of Magnolia's most stalwart supporters since day one. What could he possibly want to keep from her so badly? With an uncomfortable shrug, the young man said. Can I just take ye to the castle? He's waiting there as we speak. Naha shook his head. I have obligations to finish. Head back and tell him we can meet in me private study for luncheon. I promised Johnston's widow I'd visit, and I can he just abandon her. The young soldier nodded and ran off, and Naha watched him go. As he walked towards the bereaved woman's house, though, much was playing through his mind. What could possibly be such an emergency? And what does it have to do with Magnolia? Magnolia and Elaine were drawing together in the breakfast room when William walked in, pale and disheveled. He looked like he hadn't slept all night. Uncle William. Elaine called out, excited as ever. She got to her feet and hurried to his side. How are ye? Magnolia smiled, too. Greetings to you, William. What a pleasant surprise. What was more of a surprise was the venomous dark look he shot in her direction. That, and how, though he hugged Elaine tightly, he did not even acknowledge Magnolia beyond the glare. Have ye seen your daddy, Elaine? He asked. His usually cheerful voice was dull and flat and hard, and it felt like he'd withdrawn all the cold air from the room. I need to talk to him. Elaine shook her head. 
He said he was going out this morning, because he had important laird duties. Do you want to see the rabbit I drew? Later. William told her, leaning down to kiss her hair. If you see him, tell him I need to speak with him urgently, will ye? Oh, he went down to the village too. Magnolia started but was rewarded with nothing more than another dark look. I was actually talking to Elaine, Miss Lee Moore. He said stiffly. Miss Lee Moore? What happened to Magnolia? Is everything quite all right, Commander? She asked, switching back to his title too, responding to her own confusion with propriety. He just grunted, then turned to Elaine once more. Tell him I was looking for him. He said again. Then, without another word, he straightened and walked quickly out of the room. William looked uncharacteristically uncomfortable when Nahar entered his study, which immediately put the laird on edge. He'd seen William retain his good humor through death and illness. Whatever is wrong we ye now? There ye are. William said irritably. Didn't me soldier tell ye it was urgent? He did. Naha replied, closing the door behind him. But I have other duties, and I canny jump if your men are gonna be vague. I met Abby when I was on me way back. She says ye didn't come home the last three nights. She's worried sick. What's going on? Abby had actually been more angry than worried, but Naha figured a little guilt might do his friend good. William sighed, all of the annoyance flowing out of him. His whole body seemed to sag in defeat, which was more alarming than if he'd started to yell. Sit yourself down, Naha. He said tiredly. Naha did, nervous about what was coming. Have ye seen Magnolia since ye got back? William asked him, his voice hard. An unpleasant feeling of foreboding clouded Naha's mind. Nay, I came straight here. What's the matter? Is there something wrong? Aye, but it isn't how you're thinking. William hesitated, then said. Do you still keep that whiskey in here? If ye day, we could both use some. Even more uncomfortable, Naha didn't know what else to do other than comply. He fetched two cups and poured two whiskey shots, pushing one across the table to his friend. Tell me. He demanded. William drank his own down in one gulp, making a face at the burn. After a moment, he said. Well, me and one of the lads had an early breakfast a few days ago down at the tavern. Ye can, Connor, the one that's always trying to catch your maid's attention. I can, Connor. What has he to day we Magnolia? Naha was trying not to get annoyed, but he could do without William's talent of putting a flourish on a story now. In case ye didn't believe me. William muttered, which made Naha's skin go clammy. How bad could it possibly be if William seriously thought he'd doubt him? William took a breath and said. Magnolia walked in before the sixth belt here meet we a man. Another man. I kenned it was too good to be true. But no, he had more faith in her than that. Jealousy was an ugly emotion, one of which he would not allow himself to fall afoul. It was probably just. I, I can, which is why me and the lad followed him after he left. William interrupted. I liked Magnolia, ye ken that. I just wanted to ken what was happening to put your mind at ease. But I truly wish I had me. I was happier before. Naha tried not to let the anxiety overwhelm him. Just speak, William. What is it? Tell me. The man travelled all the way down to Edinburgh. William said tiredly. Where he met another fellow dressed in full English regalia. A soldier, or a member of some organisation, I'd grant. What is he saying? This doesn't make any sense. He handed the new man a letter. A thick thing. Connor sneaked up close. He said both of them spoke in an English accent, and the one we followed said, he said. William faltered, unable to complete his sentence. Out we it. Naha commanded. He said the smaller letter inside was for the attention of Lord Winterbourne, Earl of Elphinstone. 
said his daughter had written a personal message for her faither, along with the information the order required. The world shuddered to a stop, and the color seemed to drain from the room. Naha could see the concern in William's gray eyes and hear that he was still talking, but Naha's ears seemed to have stopped working. Winterbourne. Yes, he knew that Earl. He'd even met him once when he was a lad. He had been part of some peace negotiations with Naha's own father many years back. He'd seemed pleasant enough, for an Englishman. He'd given Naha a strawberry and called him a handsome young boy. Sherlock had been a welcoming man, eager to find peace, so he'd invited Lord Winterbourne to stay for a few nights and know the castle. Young Naha had been fascinated by the strange foreigner and talked much with him. He'd been only eight himself, but he remembered now as clearly as though it was yesterday. Winterbourne had told him he wasn't all that different from the children back home, as if that was some surprise. And then he'd taken his clock watch from around his neck, and shown the miniature painting inside the clasp. He told me the woman was his beloved wife. Anna Ben was his five-year-old daughter. It couldn't be. It couldn't be. Bile rose in Naha's throat as the implications threatened to drown him. Everything fell into place, like the most horrible mosaic the world had ever seen. I can act the role of maid and cook as well as nanny. Why would a clearly upper-class young Englishwoman make her way up into the far north of Scotland just for a job? Je parle un peu de français, why y a blar un poco de espagnol? I also read Latin and ancient Greek. How was it that a nanny was so well educated? My life before now. It was different from what I'd like you to know about. And she often talked, so often, of her father. Her father. Lord Daniel Winterbourne, Earl of Elphinstone, servant of the English Crown. She's a spy, he said, and barely recognized his own voice. She's been a spy the whole time. She used me. She used me daughter. William nodded grimly. Who cares what information she's been feeding back to them? I can't fathom what her purpose here must have been. So much for a time apiece. But now his mind was still whirling through the past month, highlighting every word, every touch, every breath. He searched desperately for signs and even more desperately wished he would not find them. If he had overlooked them, what happened next would be his fault. I love you. She'd told him, but that had been a lie. All of it had been a lie. All of her questions about his family and about his people. All of her ideas about visiting Laird Taylor. Everything. The pain stabbing at his chest was sharper than a sword and twice as deadly, and it felt like he would never draw breath again. He had given everything to her. He had left the memory of his wife, and for what? But how could this be true? How could Magnolia? The book. The bloody book. That night at the library, the first time they'd kissed. There was no innocence in her being there that night, none at all. She'd been looking for information, and now she had it. Had she passed it all on to her friends down south? Were they coming for Naha even now? Were they coming for his daughter? What day you want me to day about it, Naha? William asked grimly, and Naha appreciated the full breadth of what his friend, his brother, was willing to do for him. If Naha ordered that the traitorous nanny should disappear, she would, and nobody would be any the wiser. William avoided disappearances and death where he could. Still, he never flinched when delivering justice to the enemies of his laird. But the idea of her death was the only thing that hurt Naha more than the sense of her betrayal. He shied away from it. He wondered almost idly if this was how a trapped animal felt seconds before its slaughter. Nothing, he said gruffly, still in that strange voice that barely sounded like his own. Didn't he do anything, William? Let me handle it by myself. Have another drink, then go home to your wife and bands. Are you sure that's a good idea? William asked haltingly. It is near an idea, Commander Candlish. Naha told him, pouring them both another whiskey. It's an order.
He didn't want to upset Elaine, so he stayed where he was and drank even after William left. Drunkenness would have been welcome, but it didn't come. He felt as sober and heartbroken after four drinks as he had to begin with. Naha wasn't sure how much time had passed and was surprised to note it was near Elaine's bedtime. He'd go check on his Ben as he did every night, and then he'd go directly to Magnolia. He'd confront her about everything. Ye old fool. Ye still hope and there's been some mistake. Clenching his fists so hard that the nails hurt his palms, he headed towards Elaine's bedroom. When he got there, he found the door already part open and heard voices coming from inside. Quietly, carefully, he edged around so he could see through the crack without being noticed. And then the Queen of the Fairies made a bet with her husband, that she could win over him at any game they chose to play. Magnolia Reed. He could see her now, sitting on Elaine's bed with the little girl cuddled up close, both of them paying rapt attention to a bedtime story. She looked as beautiful as she always did, her long blonde hair loose, her eyes wide and blue and innocent. Seeing how Elaine adored her ground the shards of his heart into dust. Lying to him was monstrous, but almost understandable as an act of war. But how can she sit there, night after night, and pretend she cares for me daughter? Elaine yawned. Is Daddy May coming to say goodnight? She wondered out loud. I haven't seen him since this morning, my sweet. Magnolia told her in a soothing voice. No doubt he's busy. And you're too sleepy to be waiting up. Shall we continue our book on the morrow? Aye. Elaine mumbled, and Naha hastily stepped out of view as Magnolia moved in sight of the door. Here, darling. Let me tuck you in nice and safe and warm. Magnolia said. And I'll sing you the lullaby you like. I love ye, Maggie. Elaine said contentedly. Nah had turned on his heel to leave them behind. He would not see Elaine tonight. He did not trust himself to do so, not without breaking entirely. What kind of monster was Magnolia Winterbourne? Did she care for nothing and nobody? Did it bother her nothing that she would break the heart of a five-year-old girl, who trusted her beyond anything? Did she care not that if it came to war, he and his daughter would likely? Enough. He tightened his jaw, straightened his back, and marched his way to Magnolia's chambers. He'd wait for her there. And maybe, just maybe, she'd have some form of explanation for all of this. Or even for any of it. Chapter 20 The Confrontation When Elaine finally drifted off to sleep, Magnolia kissed her hair and decided she'd just head straight to her chambers. She wondered idly if William had located Naha or not, and wondered more what the commander's problem had been today. I've never seen him behaving so strangely. Perhaps he simply got some bad news. Well, if Naha was back at the castle. He'd come to see her before the night was out. The thought made her feel as warm as it did uneasy, while she waited for the reply from the Order and from her father. She entered her chambers and lit one of her night lanterns, so that she might read for a while before she drifted off. As the flame sparked to life, she jumped in surprise to see a figure already sitting at her desk, alone in the dark. Naha. What are you, I mean, I am, of course, glad to see you. But why are you sitting in the dark, my love? She asked. She smiled a little. Did you want to surprise me? That's sweet of you, and it certainly worked, but perhaps use light for your own sake next time. He didn't answer. She frowned but made her way over to her basin to wash her face before bed. She took her time doing this, giving Naha a chance to speak if he wanted. He said nothing just stared at her. Finally, she said. What? What is it? You look like you're trying to solve a puzzle of some sort. I am. He agreed. His voice sounded off like he had something stuck in his throat. Is he unwell? He said nothing more, and she stayed there in complete silence for another few minutes she said. What puzzle? In the same dangerously flat tone, he said. You. 
Magnolia laughed. Surely he was joking? Perhaps this was some kind of flirtation. She was still inexperienced, she knew not all of these games. She moved towards him, perching on his lap. She stroked his cheek lovingly. And how difficult am I to solve? She teased. Evermore by the moment, Lady Winterbourne. Naha responded dully. He didn't flinch away from her touch, but he didn't touch her either. He sat there dull, lifeless, a statue wearing a mask. Uncertain now, she started to speak. Naha, I don't. And then there was a ringing in her ears as she processed precisely what he'd just said. Lady Winterbourne. He knows. He knows. She jumped to her feet, backing away. Naha's eyes were cold as they followed her, but he still didn't move. Magnolia suddenly felt very exposed in only her night things under the cold, judgmental gaze of the laird. Naha. She started again. I met your faith once, me lady. He told her. He was a proud man. Loyal to his country a little too much for me own tastes, of course, but I can he fault a man for patriotism. Is he a spy, an all? Does he bed all his targets an all? It isn't like. It isn't he like what? Naha asked. His voice stayed level as he stood, and took a step before her. Magnolia took another step backward, her heart thumping erratically and her eyes stinging with frightened and horrified tears. He knows, he knows, he knows. There was no room for anything else in her mind. She'd forgotten how to think, how to speak. She'd forgotten everything while Naha stared at her, his gentle green eyes filled with hate and disgust. And it was nay only me, was it? He asked. He was closer now, and she felt the wall behind her back as she took another step. He towered over her, the anger bright behind his eyes. Ye involved me daughter as well. A wee lass who is ne even five. Did ye feel any regret when ye lied to her? Or did ye laugh about how easy she was to charm? Magnolia was crying openly now, which only seemed to annoy him further. She saw pain flash across his face, replaced by sheer rage. Dinny ye turn on the tears as though ye are the innocent, injured party here. He growled. There was finally emotion in his voice, but it was deep and angry and filled with hate. Dinny ye act like ye have nay been plotting against us this whole time. What was in your letter, Magnolia? Did ye tell your people all our weaknesses? Are they coming to attack? No, I. His hand slammed on her shoulders, pinning her in place, his heartbroken face inches from her own. Are they coming to kill me, Ban, dearest Lady Winterbourne? Will ye even care when me little girl is lion cold and dead at the end of a sword? Please. She finally gasped. Please, Naha, please listen to me. You have to trust me, you simply must. Trust ye? Naha roared so loudly it must have been heard on the grounds below. I wouldn't he trust ye if he were the last person alive. Ye got into me heed, into me bed, ye manipulated me daughter and me people. Ye're a monster. No. She sobbed. No, no, please, please listen. I am Magnolia Winterborn, and I did come here as a spy, but I really did fall in love with you, and I do care for Elaine and I swear I. Shut your mouth. He snarled, letting go of her and turning away. His clenched fist smashed against the wall, hard enough that Magnolia managed it might have left a dent was it not made of solid stone. How dare, how can, ye've been a spy since. Please, Naha. She begged. Please listen to me. I did write to them, I did, but I told them the truth. The order, we thought. Order? The order of the Red Blossom, Her Majesty's Elite. I could be expelled simply for telling you that, but I don't care, Naha, I don't care. All that matters is you listen to me, please. He turned to stare at her again, then folded his arms. I'm listening. He said. 
His voice was still low, but some of the anger had ebbed. Speak quick. I can not imagine what ye have to say that had meant any of this. She let out a shaky breath of relief. At least he was giving her a chance. That was more than she expected, in all the imaginings where he'd discovered her secret. Shaking with terror and guilt and pain in her heart, she pushed away from the wall towards her desk. She felt his eyes on her as she moved, but with trembling hands, she reached for the secret drawer. It took her a few times to open it, but she finally found and withdrew both duplicate letters. Here, she said, the tears unchecked down her face now. Here, read them. One for the order, one for my father. Read them, please. Naha stood frozen with uncertainty for a solid minute, then he grunted and took the few steps to grab them from her. He seemed to spend an eternity reading, while Magnolia stood there in trembling silence. I'm going to lose him. He should have always been my choice. To her horror and shame, she saw he was crying heavily by the time he finished reading as well. So ye meant some of it, I suppose. He croaked. I do love you. She wept. I know it's hard to believe. I know. But I do love you so much. I want to stay here, I want to be with you, with Elaine. I couldn't decide between my old life and my new, but I know now, I know, that where I belong is. Wherever you belong, Magnolia Winterborn, it is me me. Naha told her. He was still crying, but he sounded tired and defeated. He seemed to shrink in place, looking lost, like a child who could no longer find its family. Ye can ye stay here. It was like someone had taken a pole arm and pierced it right through her ribcage. She felt an aching, gaping wound where her heart had once been, and her legs gave way beneath her. Kneeling on the floor, her hands clasped together, she begged as much as she could manage. Please. Please. I don't, I can't. He placed the letters on her desk. Take the night he said in that low monotone once more. I am nay monster who'd throw a woman out in the dead of night in her under things, nay matter what ye've done. Naha paced to the door, and as Magnolia sobbed harder, she saw him glance around once with an indescribable expression on his face. Naha! She said once more, though she had no idea what she'd say now even if he would listen. Magnolia! He breathed, and it sounded like agony. Then his voice hardened once more, and he said, I want ye and ye things out of here as soon as the cock crows in the morn. I will ne have Elaine suffering more than she has to. And then he walked through her door, slamming it behind him. Magnolia curled where she was on the floor, hugging her knees, and simply cried. Over. It's over. Everything is over. And Magnolia was alone. Chapter 21 The Order of the Red Blossom Daniel Winterbourne missed his daughter. He'd known he would, of course. She had been his constant companion for twenty-six years, only more so since the death of his dear Eleanor. His anxiety for Magnolia's safety and his loneliness, were tempered only by his pride in what she was doing for Crown and the country. He reminded himself of that as frequently as he could through the month she was away. It was the only thing keeping him sane. And now he sat in that little meeting room with Duke Barton and Marquis Connolly, awaiting the arrival of the Viscount of Meatred. Peter had sent an urgent message to them all this morning with worrying tidings. Their man had returned from the north, and with it, he had brought a letter. The Viscount walked into the room, his face grave, his eyebrows creased with concern. My lords, your grace, he said, adjusting his glasses on his nose. I bring grave news from Lady Winterbourne. A tight knot formed in Daniel's stomach as Peter flourished a letter in front of them. Is my baby in danger? Have I sent her to her death? Without waiting for any comment, Peter began to read. For the grand honourable gentleman of the gathering to which I have forsworn my penmanship, my heartfelt blessings to yourself and your families. 
I write as the stated four-week stretch for which you assigned me this task has been completed, and I have much to report. However, be prepared. You see, I came here looking for a war, and war is what I have discovered. I live in fear of discovery every day. I have compiled what I know below, that you may hurry here quickly and prevent an attack on our home, our people, and my humble self. The Duke and the Marquis looked horrified and began to mutter to each other. Daniel felt the blood drain from his face. If Magnolia is worried about her own safety, things must be terrible. Peter read on, detailing the weaknesses and strengths that Daniel's dear daughter had discovered in the McFoyle lands. He described the brutish laird, the spoiled daughter, and the bloodthirsty clan that hate to bring war. Daniel's horror grew more and more, as Peter read on. To what awfulness had he exposed his own daughter? How she must be suffering. When Peter finished reading, he looked around with a severe frown on his face, his eyes meeting each of the other four. It seems to me that Lady Winterbourne needs our help at once, he said sadly. And that the Scots plan to attack, just as we feared. We should mobilize at once. May I see the letter? Daniel asked hoarsely. Peter nodded. Of course he said, handing it over. Daniel's fingers shook as he took the paper and unfolded it again, to read the words Peter had just recounted. He traced the signature at the bottom. It was undoubtedly Magnolia's, right down to the little flourish on the tail of the final A. Worry not. The Duke told Daniel, giving him a steely look of sympathy. My friend, your daughter shall be retrieved and this threat will be removed before our royal charge even knows of it. What would you have us do? Daniel's eyes hardened, and he clenched his fists on the sides of the table. I would use the powers given to me by Her Majesty, to immediately employ an army. He said in a harsh voice. I would gather our best English soldiers, and march upon Clan McFoyle before they can enact their awful deeds. Will you support me in this endeavor, Your Grace? The Duke nodded. Of course. My Lord Conley? The Marquis, looking unusually severe, nodded too. Indeed. Who will lead this army? Me, of course. But no. Daniel had been a leader of men once, but he was old now, and upset, and he would be of no help to either Magnolia or the Crown in this state. I move that Lord Cole takes the forefront of the attack. He is the most intimately familiar with my daughter's letter, and his cunning mind will allow him to wrench victory from these demonic Scots. The Viscount looked surprised. You'd trust me with this, my lord? That is truly an honor, especially when your daughter faces part of the threat. Are you quite sure? Daniel knew he must be pale, but he put as much determination into his agreement as he could. We are all of us the senior members of the Order of the Red Blossom. In this room stand four of the men most trusted by the Crown and the country. We have all made our own sacrifices to get here. There is nobody else I would trust more. He held out his hand, and Peter clasped it. The two men shook, and then Daniel turned to the Duke. Your Grace, he said. Commission a regiment immediately, if you will. As you say, so it shall be done. The Duke promised. As the men made their way out of the meeting, Daniel could only hope and pray that he wasn't too late. The carriage ride south held none of the joy of the travel north. Each little Scottish Kirk Magnolia passed, felt like another knife between her ribs. The Highland cows stared as she passed them, their round dark eyes shining with judgment. The clouds were dark and grey no longer a blanket, but a storm trying to push her from the country as quickly as they could. I have poisoned this place. I am a disease to Scotland, and she wants me to go. The driver, this time, did not talk with her as the gentleman had on the way here. Did he know what she had done? Did he know what she was? Either way, it was a quiet, lonely ride back home. She had left her pup at home with his brother. He had not come when she called this morning, and she had no time to look for him. 
Perhaps even Sir Spindrift knew the truth, now. The further south she travelled, things changed more and more quickly. The grass helped her track her progress as the days wore on. The transformation from bright, healthy forest green to chartreuse and down to something olive-coloured felt like life was being drawn from the world itself by her presence. Would her father welcome her, or would he be disappointed to see her? She'd written him her personal note filled with hope and love, but now here she was, heading home alone with nothing to show for it. Magnolia often cried, quietly and to herself. The rest of her time was spent staring in the middle distance, wondering how she had managed to get it all so wrong. They did not stop in Edinburgh this time, instead taking back roads to circumvent the city entirely and shoot straight for the borders. She felt it like a shimmering veil as they crossed the line dividing Scotland from England, and it felt as though she left part of her soul behind her. At least I protected them from war. At least Elaine is safe. Good morning, Daddy. Elaine said brightly as her father shook her awake. Naha's eyes were red and swollen after the events of four nights before, but he could not help but smile at the cheer in the little one's voice. It's a right surprise to see you first thing in the morning yet again. I, well, your yeah, daddy wanted to see ye before he had to start his work today, me weech ook. Naha told her. She sat up in bed, and he leaned over to kiss her frizzy red hair, still tousled from sleep. Did ye get a good rest? I, I dreamed the other pups were bigger, and we were their pets. She giggled. Have ye ever heard such a silly thing? He tickled under her chin. Ye've always been me wee pet, Chuck, he said. Elaine smiled at him, but then she tilted her head. Why are ye waking me, though, instead of Betty? Where is Maggie? Is she still sick? It's been days now, maybe we should fetch the healer. Naha felt it like ice water poured over his head, drenching his whole body, removing the slight warmth that being with his daughter had brought for him. Nay. He said in a much more subdued voice. Oh. Elaine was obviously confused. Ye is a red, daddy. Have ye been crying? He put his arms around the little girl, pulling her into his lap and giving her a tight hug. Probably it hadn't been the right thing to lie to the little girl all these days, but he had been in no state to tell her the truth. Listen, Mo Kriya. I have to tell ye something thy year and agony like very much. She leaned into the hug, and he heard the stutter in her little breaths, though he couldn't tell if she was upset or just bewildered. Naha stroked her hair as she muttered. What's the matter? Is everybody all right? Did Maggie get sicker? Can I see her, please? I promise I will ne touch her, so I will ne get sick. Nay. He said again burying his face in her hair, hiding from the world just a little bit longer. Ye are gonna have to spend some time we Betty or the cook for the next while, until we can get ye another nanny. Magnolia is, she had to leave quite suddenly. She was never sick. She started travelling home a couple of days ago. Her little body went rigid, and then she pushed away from him so that she could look him in the face. What? She demanded in a high pitch that caused the two puppies sleeping in the corner of her room to look up in alarm. What day ye mean? Where did she go? Naha's jaw clenched, but he talked as calmly as he could manage even as his heart tore itself apart. She went home, Chuck. She realized that she did need belong here. She did not want to be in Scotland any more. Elaine burst into noisy tears that shattered Naha's very soul. Nay. She screeched. Nay, nay, that makes nay sense. What are ye talking about? Ye said she could stay forever. Did ye send her away, Daddy? I thought ye loved her, like me. Ye lied to me. How could ye? She was pulling away from him, and Naha sat there helplessly as she struggled off his lap. He wanted to deny it, wanted to tell Elaine that Magnolia had done this herself, but that, well, it wasn't right, was it? No matter his reasons, Naha was the one who had demanded that Magnolia leave without so much as a goodbye. I couldn't trust her wee me heart. 
I couldn't trust her weemy daughter. But seeing Elaine screaming and sobbing on the floor made him feel like he may drown in the guilt nonetheless. He slid off the bed to kneel beside her but didn't try to touch her again. He wouldn't do so when she was having a tantrum, unless she asked for the hug first. He didn't want to upset her more. Elaine, me wee darling, please listen to me. He entreated. I want Maggie. She screamed, her face red, and her voice raw. I want Maggie. Bring me Maggie. Me and all, Elaine. Me and all. But Naha couldn't say that, of course. So instead, he sat there, hurting at his loss, hurting at her betrayal. He stayed falling to pieces, as he watched his baby girl cry, and hate him for taking away the only thing close to a mother she'd ever had. After a week of travel, her carriage finally drew up outside her father's home. It's your home too, remember, Magnolia. Don't forget that. But the building, grand and beautiful as it was, seemed unnecessarily extravagant compared to the simple stone of Castle McFoyle. The sculpted detail and the pristine off-white coloring made it look more like a home for a doll than for a family. The coachman helped her out, and she tipped him generously with the last of her funds. He tried to help with her bags, but she refused. She hadn't many things with her, anyway, and she'd rather do the homecoming for herself at the very least. So the coachman placed her bags on the ground, and she waited until he'd driven off, before she picked them up in her hands and headed slowly towards the door. Magnolia wrapped the heavy brass knocker against the door and waited. It didn't take long before the grand front doors swept open, and the astonished-looking face of their head matron, Mrs. Green, was framed in the doorway. Miss Magnolia. The old woman cried in happy surprise. What a shock to see you here, my lady. I thought you'd be up north for a long time yet. Yes, so did I. Magnolia replied, trying her best to smile. Is my father home, Mrs. Green? He is, he is. The housekeeper said, standing to the side. Come in, come in. Jeremy. The boot boy appeared as if from nowhere, hurrying forward at the matron's commands and collecting Magnolia's bags without a word. Magnolia tried to protest, but too late, he'd already taken them from her, and vanished once more by the time she could form a sentence. Mrs. Green led her through the house, speaking relentlessly, and Magnolia was actually very relieved by her chatter. The old housekeeper was the type to ask a question, then answer it before the responder got a chance to speak. This somewhat impolite habit made conversation very easy when Magnolia didn't feel like talking much. They finally reached her father's study, and Mrs. Green left her outside the door. Magnolia took a deep breath and knocked, ready to explain everything. She rehearsed every word in her head while she waited, running through countless possible iterations of the conversation, in the few seconds between her knock and the door opening. Father, it is good to see you, despite my heartache and my requirement to leave so suddenly. My darling father, how I have missed you, yet I wish that I saw you not on these terms. Are you ashamed of me, father? I surely feel shame on myself, though I am not sure from the same source. Father. The door opened, and there he stood. His pale hair had a few more silver strands, and he wore a tired expression behind the thick rims of his spectacles, but his eyes widened at the sight of her. Magnolia. He gasped, surprise, gratitude, confusion, and even more coloring his tone. Is it you? Are you truly here? I do not understand, I. Everything she had planned to say. All her decorum, disappeared as she met her father's eyes. Tears ran unchecked down her face once more as she threw herself into his arms and hugged him tightly. Daddy, it hurts. She sobbed, using a name she hadn't for him since childhood. It hurts so much. Her father clearly had no idea what she was talking about, but he drew her gently inside the study and closed the door. He led her to a seat, coaxing her to sit down and fetched her some water. Then he returned to her side and hugged her while she cried, without asking any questions yet, 
and Magnolia had never been so grateful. The door to Elaine's chambers creaked open, but Nara didn't try to move. The girl had screamed for over an hour, before descending into terrible heart-shattering sobs that he thought he would never erase from his mind. At some point, she had climbed into his lap, and he'd held her tight, and they'd cried together. He wished he could explain to his baby how all of this had happened, why things were like they were, but Naha barely knew himself. Eventually, she'd cried herself back to sleep, and now he sat cross-legged on the floor, the child curled on his legs. The two pups sat around them, too, as though guarding the little girl. Naha. William said, entering the room. I need to speak with ye. I'm busy, Commander. Naha said roughly. William didn't move, folding his arms. He looked tired again. We've had a runner. Runners were what William called his unique message service, that ran throughout Scotland, England, and even part of Wales. Travel from the south could take weeks or more, but with the vast system of messengers the McFoyle clan had in place, messages could reach the castle from England in a matter of days. Which was why now has stiffened at those words, and looked up sharply into his friend's face. What news? William's expression was grim. They're coming, Naha. They're coming now. Naha looked down at the sleeping child in his lap, the little that was left of his strength ebbing away. They were coming. Naha's people, his castle, his daughter. They would all be gone soon. And all because their foolish laird had given his heart to a spy. Chapter 22 The Intervention the first thing her father did when Magnolia had calmed down enough to breathe, was to ask her how the laird had hurt her. Magnolia gave him an astonished look, unable to understand how he could come to such a conclusion. Didn't you get my letter, father? She asked, a little more composed now. The private one I sent alongside the one for the order? Lord Gallagher's brow furrowed in confusion. I don't understand, he said. There was only one letter. The one in which you advised us to attack immediately, and lamented your own safety. And yet, now, here you sit. How can this be? What? Magnolia stared at him, uncomprehending. What did he mean? She thought of the letters she'd sent, and she knew that there was simply no possible way for him to get that impression from her words. Father, whatever are you talking about? That is not what my letter said at all. Neither of them. Daniel looked confused and turned to take a letter from his desk. He handed it to her. This is your signature, is it not? I asked the Viscount to allow me to keep it, so that I may have you close to me. Magnolia stared at the document. It started similarly to her own letter, true, and that certainly looked very similar to her signature. Still. The words were all different, all wrong. I don't understand, she said, tracing her finger along her own name. She felt a slight dent below her touch, and gasped as she realized exactly what had happened. Father. Someone used my original letter to trace my signature through. They must have leaned hard as they wrote over the original, then simply followed the lines for their forgery. Daniel frowned. What, why? She reached into her cloak, pulling out the letters Naha had returned to her just when he'd commanded her to leave. Here, father. Read. These are the letters I sent. I do not understand. I can't. Magnolia waited while her father read, watching while his expression went from confused to incredulous, finally settling on something close to anger. You fell in love with this Scotsman? He asked her at last. And you claim his people seek naught but peace? Yes, she said, unashamed. She could not feel shame for something that filled her heart with such joy, even though that joy was bittersweet now. Yes, and we must not attack them. They are good, kind people, and it would be folly to bring war. We would wipe them out entirely. Daniel looked between the actual letter and the false one, speechless, and Magnolia followed his eyes. 
Who could have done this? Who could have plotted and lied? What would they possibly gain? Magnolia and her father reached the same conclusion at the same time. They met each other's eyes, and speaking out loud as once, they said, The Viscount. Of course. Of course. Peter Cole wanted nothing more than to rise in estimation in the eyes of the Crown and the Order, and he hated the Scottish with a burning passion. All the concern he had shown before she left. Had it purely been jealousy? Had he intended to lead the expedition himself? Where is Lord Cole now? She demanded. I should very much like to give him a piece of my mind. But that was when she noticed the grey pallor to her father's cheeks, and how his eyes went wide, and how he looked like he had been struck on the head. Magnolia, my darling daughter. He said. We did not know. We had no reason to suspect any of this. Magnolia's heart raced once again. She began to wonder if the poor thing might not soon be quite tired out. What is it? What has happened? We saw Tarms the moment we saw your letter. Her father told her. The regiment. Magnolia, they deployed yesterday. We're too late. Magnolia felt her stomach drop to her feet. Naha. Elaine. And not just them. Old man Ewan. Greta, and Bernie, Betty and her mother Eliza. All of them were facing this threat. William and his children, his wife, and their unborn baby. If the regiment reached them, if they attacked, all of them would die. Magnolia set her jaw. No. She declared. No. Father, I shall fetch my riding gear. With a fast enough horse and a lot of luck, I might yet be able to warn them. This is folly, daughter. Her father warned. Folly it may be. Magnolia told him. Her eyes were entirely dry now, and she stood tall and proud. But, I shall not rest ever again if I do not try. Her father hesitated, then nodded. Jeremy. He called. The boy appeared again, this time somehow magically in the doorway as he gave a quick bow. My lord? Tell the stable master to prepare our two fastest horses, he instructed. And a carriage, sir? The boy asked. No, the earl told him. There's no time for carriages. My daughter and I must ride out at once. Magnolia started. Father. This is, you needn't. I am still lord yet, her father told her firmly and a proud, blessed father beside that. My daughter and the lady of my estate has told me of an injustice. I shall not sit here and allow it to be carried out in my name. But it is such a long ride. We will have to switch horses on the way, and I do not want you to become exhausted, and... He touched her hand reassuringly. Peter Cole is a Viscount. I am an Earl. If it comes to a matter of one man's word over another, you shall have me at your side. No more arguments, my dear. She kissed his cheek. Thank you, father. She said. Then, with a serious expression, and more than a little determination, she added. Let's go. They rode hard, taking only the minimum essentials with them, and barely stopping for more than four or five hours of rest at most each night. Every town or city where they stopped saw a trade of horses, so that their mounts were fresh as they took every possible path to try to beat the army north. There was no time to enjoy the scenery now. They barely spoke, merely keeping pace with each other where they could. At night, when they rested, Magnolia filled her father in on little bits and pieces of how life had been for her among the Scots. Daniel's surprise at his daughter's affections for the Scotsman soon faded, as he listened to her describe Naha. It brought back memories of a visit he'd once paid to the McFoyle clan, and a small boy with wild red hair and bright green eyes. Is it the same boy? And what does this mean for my daughter's future? He knew not, nor did he know much of anything other than their duties. 
It felt like every time they lay to sleep, it was time to open their eyes and be on the road once more, only occasionally stopping for a mouthful of food and a sip of water. The army had close to thirty hours on them, and it was a lot of ground to make up. No matter how quickly he and Magnolia hurried to the Scottish Highlands, he knew Peter Cole. The Viscount would be hurrying too, eager to get his men to the McFoyle Castle, anxious to lay siege on innocent people to promote his own name. His betrayal disgusted Daniel beyond words. Bad enough that he would lie to the crown, to the country. Bad enough that he would put the lives of innocents in danger for his own agenda. But the order was supposed to be a group of brothers in arms, men, and Magnolia, who served a common purpose. They were supposed to be able to trust one another, even when they could trust nobody else. Lord Cole had betrayed all that. He had turned traitor and used Daniel's daughter to do it. The Viscount had written slander most foul, and was willingly risking the lives of young soldiers by filling their heads with lies. He had betrayed everything for which the Order of the Red Blossom stood. And Daniel wasn't likely to let it go so quickly. A forest loomed in the foreground not long after, and it seemed to wipe the exhaustion from Magnolia's face. There's not much further to go, father. She assured him. Two more hills and down the glen. We'll soon be able to see Loch McFoyle, right next to the castle walls. Daniel could not help but let out a breath of relief at this. He wasn't old, as old men went, but he wasn't young enough to be riding all these miles on horseback either. And yet here they were, in the highlands of Scotland, with no help except themselves. For justice, I'd do much more. For Magnolia, I would fly to Scotland on my own power if that was what it took. Ahead of him, Magnolia dug her heels into her horse's flank. The fine Clydesdale they'd picked up in the last town complied with a sudden burst of speech. Without so much as a pause, Daniel spurred his own mount forward, keeping pace. Don't you worry, Magnolia. We have time. We can solve all of this, God willing. Naha had tried to send Elaine away. The moment he'd heard the word of the imminent attack, he'd sent a letter out to Lady Taylor, begging Ailey to take the child. He knew that it would have been more prudent to simply send her with a letter of apology, rather than asking for permission first, especially since their time was limited. But the idea of being apart from Elaine, probably never to see her again, was too much for his heart to bear. The messenger must have been waylaid, for he never received any word nor notice back from Ailey. He feared that, were there highwaymen on the hills, sending a four-year-old girl alone would sign her death warrant as surely as allowing her to stay in the castle. So he'd sent her to stay with Abby and the Candlish children, hoping they could all be some comfort to each other before the end came. Their fathers were certain to die this day, but Abby was a strong woman. She would care for them. Aye, if they didn't raise the village too. If Naha was honest, he didn't hold out much hope. I'm sorry, me weech ook. We'll be with your mommy soon. A hand clapped on his shoulder and brought him out of his reverie. He turned and saw William there, clad in full McFoyle tartan his massive two-handed claymore strapped to his back. His friend was much less a traditional Scotsman in appearance than Naha himself, the laird reflected. Still, at this moment, with a fierce look in his grey eyes, he embodied the true spirit of Alba. Fine day to die. William said in an echo of his usual cheer. Do you think God is smiling down on us with this shining sunlight? Naha chuckled dryly. Aye. Th ah must be it, he said. He looked behind where they stood, seeing his men gathered behind him, each as determined as their commander. There were some so old that their beards were white, and some so young that they barely had a beard at all. And each and every one of them was likely to die. A small segment of their soldiers waited down in the village, ready to protect the women and children and the elderly and infirm. Here at the castle, they had maybe one hundred men to face the attack of an entire English regiment. If they even had that many. Naha heard them before he saw them. Their armor clanked, and their feet beat in time, as they marched as one body over the hills and glens that would bring them to the battlefield. 
one of them was playing some sort of instrument, heralding their arrival. The first wave arrived and lined up around six feet from where Nahara and William stood, at the front of the battlefield, protecting their castle, their home. Fear flooded Naha's heart. He did not shy from it but embraced it. Fear would keep him going. Fear not only for himself but for his soldiers, for his friends, for his daughter. For them, for his country, for his people, he would fight until the last breath. And then something extraordinary happened. It was just one reedy voice, a voice that might have been the young soldier Connor, and he was not yelling or screaming. In fact, very calmly and clearly, he began to sing. As I came in by Dunadia, and down by Netherhar, there was fifty thousand Highland men a march into Harlaw. Naha's men began to mumble behind him. Naha knew the tune. It was an old war ballad describing a battle that had happened more than a century before. To his surprise, more of his men took up the chant, stamping their feet and shaking their shields and weapons rhythmically as they sang. As I came on, and farther on, and down and by Balquane, oh there I met Sir James the Rose, we him Sir John the Grim. A swell of pride filled the lad's heart, overcoming the fear and eclipsing it into something new. These old men and boys, very few of whom were of an age for fighting, stood as one in unity. These soldiers, who had watched their fathers and sons taken from them in previous wars, stood there without flinching. These people, his people, knew that they would die, but they would not give the English invaders the satisfaction of going quietly to their deaths. They would stand as one, united in song before the battle came to them. Naha and William exchanged glances. Naha once more saw that familiar glint in his friend's eye as William, too, began to sing, with more and more of them joining in behind them. O oh, came ye fray the Helens, man, and came ye the way? Saw ye Macdonald and his men, as they came fray the ski? Naha nodded and opened his mouth too. The tiny Scots army, only a hundred men strong, could be heard for miles around as they sang together, led by their laird. Yes, me come fray the Helens, man, and me came of the way, and she saw Macdonald and his men, as they came fray the ski. By the time the English army had assembled in full, some four hundred men strong, every one of the Scotsmen was singing his way through the ballad. They stood shoulder to shoulder, singing the grim tale of battle from their hearts. The Englishman, led by a bespectacled man in his mid-thirties, seemed confused about what to do. Nobody moved on the other side as the clan sang together. William unsheathed his claymore and Naha his own sword, and they held them up, ready to lead. Some ten minutes passed from the beginning of the ballad to the end, ten minutes where his men seemed to find a spirit he had feared left them all forever. Perhaps they could not win, but they would not die as cowards. Even if Clan Macfoyle was eradicated today, they would live on. Scotland would live on and there was nothing these sorry Englishmen could do to stop them. Gin anybody spirit ye, for them ye took a war, ye may tell their wives and bairnies, they're sleeping at Harlaw. The song finished, and a charge seemed to fill the air. Naha met the eyes of the bespectacled man across the battlefield and saw cold, ready anger. To death, then. To life. He nodded at William, and William nodded back. Ready, men. William called at the top of his voice, Orb Commander now. He held up his hand, counting down. One, two, we fight. Roaring as one unit, the clansmen raced forward while the English soldiers on the other side did the same. Naha and William led the pack, darting straight for the English leader, their swords glinting in the sunlight. Four hundred men flowed towards them as unstoppable as the molten rocks that had destroyed the ancient city near Mount Vesuvius, and just as deadly. The Scotsmen braced for the impact as the armies collided. Then something very unexpected happened that froze everyone where they stood. Stop! A thin voice cried, barely hearable above the clamour. Stop! Stop! Chapter 23 The Viscount it was like something from a dream, like a scene described in the Kirk from the Holy Book. 
One moment, Naha was charging towards certain death, and the next, an angel bore down before him, placing her whole body between him and the attacking Englishman. But no, it was not an angel, but a woman. She was dirty and exhausted, clad in a blue traveling dress, her blonde hair wild, her eyes wide as she gazed between the two men, her hands held out on either side as though they could somehow stop the blades. Naha pulled his sword back just in time, and the bespectacled Englishman did the same. The rest of their men hesitated on both sides, everyone seeming to freeze in place at this unexpected apparition on the battlefield. Magnolia. Magnolia, how? Why? She glanced at Naha only briefly before turning to the English soldiers, but Naha would recognize her anywhere. Her prim stature, her honey-colored hair, the way her voice lilted when she was truly serious. Gentlemen. Magnolia called out, steady and clear, as though she was not standing with the points of many deadly weapons pointed her way. The Viscount has led you here under false pretenses. He would have you slaughter innocents in my father's and my name. This man is a traitor to the crown. Loud murmuring started, and the bespectacled man went pale. Magnolia. Naha said in disbelief. She turned her head to him, but only briefly. Naha. She said. My father is coming. We will stop this. All of it. Ya dot father? Naha repeated, still struggling to understand what was happening before him now. What is this? I thought ye'd retreated. I thought. Silence, Scotsman. The Viscount snarled. You hear how he would speak to a lady of Her Majesty's realm, men? What more reason do you need to attack? To arms. He would speak to a spy, erroneously sent to cause war by the whispers of a corrupt Viscount. Magnolia interrupted fiercely. To Naha, she seemed to glow in the sunlight, and her tiredness and the filth of travel only made her more beautiful. Ye came back. Ye came to make it right. While Naha stared at her incredulously, the sound of horse hooves echoed eerily through the suddenly too quiet battlefield. As one, all five hundred men turned their heads to see an older gentleman riding slowly towards them, leading another, clearly tired, horse by the reins. Magnolia continued addressing the English soldiers. You see my father's approach. Pay your respects to Lord Daniel Winterbourne, Earl of Elphinstone and remember to whom you have sworn allegiance. More muttering broke out between the English army, while the Scotsmen, too, were clearly baffled by the turn the events had taken. Well. William muttered. Yalas has a unique way of apologizing. He lowered his claymore but did not sheath it, not yet. Naha said nothing, though he was relieved when both the English and the Scottish armies seemed to step back as one as though there was a field of energy around Magnolia while her father rode to her side. Lord Winterbourne dismounted, and Naha nodded at one of the lads in line behind him, his own stable boy. The lad was surprised, but he hurried forward, taking both horses by the reins and leading them off to the side. Is this really happening? Are we really saved? Winterbourne, what in the world are you doing here? The Viscount demanded the illusion of concern written all over his face. Such a ride cannot be good for your health, especially at such an age. You will address me as Lord Winterbourne, Peter. The Earl told him coldly, placing emphasis on the deliberate dropping of the Viscount's title. Swift calculation worked through the Viscount's eyes while Naha watched, and even Naha had to be impressed by how quickly the slimy man changed tracks. Of course, my lord. The Viscount said, giving a deep bow. I simply wondered why you had rushed all this way. Surely not on the word of this hysterical girl? You saw what she wrote to us. If she has changed her mind now, then it is only due to Scottish brainwashing. You know how these Scotsmen... Lord Winterbourne ignored him completely, instead slowly turning and facing Naha and William, no weapon in hand. This man was clearly as exhausted as his daughter. Still, he held a proud bearing that Naha found he instantly respected. He reminds me of me own faither. 
This is a good man, even if we are really always on the same side. Lord Winterbourne. Naha said. He nudged William, who was staring, open-mouthed, and William quickly gave Winterbourne a short but respectful nod. The Earl studied both of them for a moment, then his face relaxed into a smile that was heartbreakingly like that of his daughter. Yes, that is me. He agreed. And you are Naha Irvin, Laird of McFoyle. I met you when you were a boy. Naha bowed his head. Aye, ye did at that. He agreed. I'd near forgotten it until, well. Yes. Rather unfortunate business all of this, isn't it? My daughter has explained, and it appears there's been some sort of miscommunication. As he said this, Lord Winterbourne's eyes narrowed, glancing over his shoulder back towards where the Viscount stood. The Viscount looked thoroughly outraged. My lord. You would take the word of a Scotsman over my own? I would trust the word of my daughter over anyone else's. Lord Winterbourne retorted sharply. And you would do well to do the same, Peter. In the absence of my wife, Magnolia has been Lady Elphinstone not only by heritage but by action. She outranks you, and you will show her the respect her title earns. Father. Magnolia whispered from where she still stood between the two armies. The Viscount's face had gone an ugly shade of puce, and the muttering in the English army was louder than ever before. Still, when the Earl held his hand up for silence, it fell immediately. I would ask you a few questions, Laird Macfoyle. The Earl said seriously. Will you answer them as best you can? William raised an eyebrow. And who day ye think ye are to be asking him questions, Englishman? Peace. Now nah, I soothed. I'll be happy to answer your questions, me lord. So long as ye might answer some of mine later. The earl nodded slightly. I have just one of import, before I allow my daughter to share the truth with these soldiers about the Viscount's treachery. I will not put her in danger for nothing. Seems to me like Magnolia has a penchant for getting into danger with or without your help. Naha told him. He hadn't glanced at Magnolia again, not yet, he wasn't ready for that yet, but a small smile played on his lips. My lord, this is absurd. The Viscount continued to protest. The Earl lowered his voice, ignoring the Viscount and talking so only Naha and perhaps William could hear. Do you love my daughter, young man? He didn't even have to think about it. Yes, she had lied about who she was from the start. Yes, the Magnolia he thought he knew and the Magnolia who was real were not the same person. But saving Elaine from the lock, that was real. Helping him plan to save his people from starvation, that had been nothing to do with her spying. And when she kissed him, it meant nothing to her plot. How many days did ye raise to get here on time? Magnolia? How desperately did ye beg ye faithful about the truth? Yes, she'd hurt him. Yes, she'd hurt Elaine, the maid Betty, the farm girl Greta. But they only hurt when she left because of what she'd done before. Because of who she'd become to them in such a short time. Because they loved her. Aye. He said quietly. Aye. Still, and dearly, regardless of everything else. I've never. I've never felt such hurt, as when I thought she betrayed me, except maybe when me wife died. He felt William looking at him, but he didn't turn his head, continuing to meet the Earl's calm, steady gaze. Magnolia's father slowly nodded. I see. And do you or your people have any intention of mounting an attack upon mine? None, me lord. Naha said quickly. As I'm sure Magnolia has told ye, we can barely feed ourselves, never mind launch in an invasion. We dinny want bloodshed. We only want to live in peace. Both of them looked into each other's eyes for a moment longer, before he saw something change behind the earls. Lord Winterbourne gave a small nod, then turned and said in a louder voice. My good man, I would have you listened to the words of Lady Winterbourne. She has carried with her the real letters which she wrote, only to be replaced by the Viscount's falsehoods. 
This is slander. The Viscount snarled. Men. You were placed under my leadership, and... Viscount, I would have you remember who I am. Lord Winterbourne said coldly. He nodded at two of the English soldiers, who moved forward and each put a warning hand on the Viscount's shoulders. These are my men. Magnolia, dear, please go ahead. Magnolia turned to nod at her father, and in that instant, she and Naha met eyes again at last. Naha had only experienced this feeling once, long ago, when he'd spotted Katrina for the first time. This time, the eyes were blue instead of grey, and the innocence of childhood was long since past. This time, there was a history of betrayal, of pain, of suffering. This time, he knew what it was to hurt. But as his eyes met Magnolia's now, it was that same bolt from the blue, that same shock of lightning as his life was changed forever, with no way back. This time, when his heart sped and his palms started to sweat, he knew why. Look at that smile. I'd day anything for that smile. I'm sorry. She mouthed, tears in her eyes. I can. He said silently back. I can. And then she turned her back on him once more and started to read aloud. For the grand honorable gentleman of the gathering to which I have forsworn my penmanship. As she read, a hush seemed to fall over the entire battlefield. Scotsmen and Englishmen are like letting their swords slack as they listened. Her voice was like a melody, like the kind of music that bypassed the ears and went straight to the soul. Naha had read the letters already, of course, but he was as spellbound as the rest. When she got to the part about how poor they were, and how she entreated the Englishmen not to attack, angry words started on the English side of the field. But that's not what was in the letter we were shown. One of the generals hissed furiously to another. The Viscount forged the lady's letter. A soldier snarled. Magnolia ignored it all and continued to read. When she had finished reading the letter, it was to dead silence. Preposterous. The Viscount sputtered. She could have written that at any time. The Scotsman has gotten into her head, he has manipulated her and her womanly weakness, he. And me, Peter? Lord Winterbourne asked coldly. Has he manipulated me? Or is it you, sir, who have manipulated these good men? Magnolia glared at the Viscount. You have twisted my words. You have betrayed our queen and country in a folly while you play at a coup. You should be ashamed. The Viscount was practically spitting in his anger. Men. You follow me. Attack now, or. We follow the crown, and if the earl and his daughter speak true, you are a traitor of the highest order. Snapped one of the men holding his shoulder. What should we do with him, my lady? Magnolia looked surprised to be asked, but she composed herself quickly. Take him into custody. She said clearly and calmly. He will be given trial at court for his crimes, and dealt with at Her Majesty's pleasure. Yes, my lady. One of them said. Lord Winterbourne nodded his approval, and Naha felt a strange surge of pride. There will be no battle today. Lord Winterbourne announced. Please accept the apologies of my house and my country. I, Naha said, his eyes still on Magnolia. Go in peace we your men, me lord. And will ye take Magnolia we ye, too? Magnolia. He called. She turned to look at him. Naha. He took a few steps forward, not knowing what he'd say, not knowing what he'd do, just knowing he needed her in his arms. Perhaps because he was watching her closest, he was the only one who saw. When Lord Winterbourne spoke quietly to a general to arrange custody of the Viscount and Magnolia's attention was on Naha, the Viscount snarled as something inside him seemed to snap. No, I will succeed. The Viscount roared. He jabbed hard with his elbows at the men holding him, both of whom doubled over in surprised pain. He rushed at Magnolia. Naha saw the glint of the dagger in his hand. He didn't think. He just pulled up his sword and ran. 
There was a lot of shouting, confusion, swearing, and then he was at Magnolia's side, and the dagger plunged down while Naha blindly slashed his sword in the Viscount's direction. Pain, blood, screaming. Then nothing but blackness. Chapter 24 The Moment His eyes are opening. Betty called, and Magnolia hurried to the lad's side, as he groaned and moved for the first time in almost a day. Wah, Magnolia, where? Naha grumbled. He tried to move, but winced, reaching for his head. Wah happened? Shh. Magnolia told him, gently pushing down on his shoulder to make him lie down again. Shh. You hit your head when you fell after the Viscount got you in the arm with the dagger. You saved my life, Naha. She stared down into his green eyes, seeing the fear and alertness smooth away at the sound of her voice. He looked up at her. Magnolia? He said quietly. Magnolia felt the static in the air the instant he said her name, and everything they'd felt, every touch, every kiss, every sigh, came rushing back to her. How could I have ever left your side? How could I have ever lied to you? They stared at each other for so long, that Magnolia almost forgot that there was anything in the world. Behind her, Betty coughed a little awkwardly and then stood. I'll go let your faith there and the commander and Elaine can he's awake. She said. She gave a little curtsy then hurried out of the room. Elaine. Naha repeated, his eyes widening. Is she? She's fine. Magnolia told him gently smoothing his hair back from his head. After you parried the attack, the soldiers grabbed the Viscount. There was a scuffle, and by the time we got to you, you weren't moving. She felt herself pale at the memory. It had only been a second, a single second, but she really thought she'd lost him forever. For him to have died saving her life. I don't know that I could have ever lived up to such a sacrifice. Magnolia took a breath and continued. After that, some soldiers from both sides helped get you inside. William went to see his family, and let Abby and the children know he was all right, then came back to the castle with Elaine. The English army is in the village. What? Naha demanded sharply, then winced at the pain in his head and in his shoulder. No. Magnolia said hurriedly. No, not. They're there as guests, getting to know the locals having a drink, that sort of thing. William and I spoke with them, and they've become quite friendly. One of the soldiers is a carpenter, and he offered to help fix the holes in Ewan's roof before the winter comes. It was quite marvellous, actually. Wondrous to witness, the kind of miracle that her time in the Order had made her confident she would never see. The English soldiers and the Scottish villagers laughing together, working together. The clansmen inviting the Englishmen to stay overnight in their homes. I insisted father stay here at least a night, after the exhausting ride I put him through. Magnolia went on to explain. Then she blushed, realizing what her words seemed to imply. What I mean to say is, I had intended to request rooms at the tavern for us both, but Betty insisted. Her voice faded as she saw the pained look on Naha's face stretch into something approximating a smile. I've never been stabbed for a lass before. It isn't as fun as you might imagine. Despite the worry that still lingered in her heart, she couldn't help but let out a laugh, one that brought with it tears. Is that right? And there I was planning on doing it on the morrow. Naha coughed a laugh. It sounded pained but genuine. I? I didn't recommend it. Silence fell for a moment, and then they both tried to speak at once. Naha. Magnolia. They both stopped, met eyes, and laughed a little. I'm so sorry, Naha. Magnolia told him. I am. I never wanted you to be hurt. I never, if I'd have known who you were, what you were, I would never have lied to you, I swear it. I can, Naha told her, in a softer voice than before. I can. And I didn't just save ye. Ye saved me too. 
Me and me people, we would a died out there if nay for you showing up out of nowhere. Of course I came. She said, surprised that he would ever doubt it. How could I let you get hurt? Elaine? I would not have a man use my words to hurt a village of innocent people. He smiled at her, and she smiled back. The silence that followed was loud. Magnolia's mind wasn't on one thing in particular, but flickering through the month that had felt like a lifetime in this castle. She remembered arriving, and the shock of seeing this alien world so close to, yet so far from home. She remembered meeting Elaine for the first time, and the surprise she'd felt at how bright and pleasant the little girl was. How she'd first laid eyes on Naha, and been filled with a confusing mix of attraction and fear. She remembered the day at the lock when she'd feared Elaine would drown, and the night in the library, where she feared she'd be caught. The smouldering touch of his first kiss, the agony of guilt and indecision. There was the time they'd spent travelling to and from the Taylor lands. Her new friendship with Ailey, the tale about Leonard, the way they'd managed to secure food for their people. And her friendships with the women here, too, how Betty and Greta had both made her feel welcome from the moment she'd met them. Betty was so kind, even though she probably had no idea what to make of me. Or when Elaine had taken her to the fairy forest, and spoken about the late Lady Katrina. How Elaine had trusted her and cared for her and loved her over and over again. She never saw me as a nanny. She saw me, she sees me even now, as another mother. More than all of that, she remembered the moment she'd realized what it all meant, what the point of it was, what the aim of everything was. When Naha had rushed into her bedroom, pale and wild-eyed, and knelt at her feet, and declared that he loved her. The moment their heat and their passions had finally collided into something magnificent. Does he still love me, even now? Can he possibly know how desperately I love him? And if he did, then what? What would she do? They had duties, both of them, and this near miss of a battle had done nothing but entrench that idea more firmly than ever. Am I Magnolia Winterborn, Lady of Elphinstone? Or am I just Magnolia, a nanny in love with a wild lad? For the first time, she truly felt like she had a choice. But how could one choose between the impossible? Naha. She started. Magnolia? He said at the same time. They both stopped again, Magnolia smiling slightly that they'd done the same thing twice. Before she could go on, the door opened, and four people walked through. Elaine was the first to tumble inside, and she ran directly to her father. Daddy. You're awake. I thought, I thought. Hush, pet, it's all gonna be fine. Naha told her. It must have hurt him when she threw herself into his embrace, but he held her tight anyway. I promise ye, me wheat ook, we're gonna be okay from here on out. While Elaine sobbed in her father's arms, Magnolia turned to the other three. Betty was smiling at her, and her father was too. William stood behind them. His eyes were on Naha, but they slowly moved to Magnolia. Does he hate me? Can he ever forgive me for what I've done? She was surprised by how much she cared. She liked the commander, with his pleasant manner and welcoming character. That he may never forgive her filled her with a strange, sad emptiness. Magnolia didn't speak, waiting for him to make the first move. Eventually, William nodded his head. That was brave, what ye did. He acknowledged. Thank ye. Ye might have saved all our lives. Humbled, Magnolia bowed her own head. Thank you for saying so. She replied. Then she looked up into his stormy grey eyes and added. I'm sorry. She didn't explain what for. She didn't even know that she could cover everything for which she had to apologize. I. William said. I, I can ya. Naha. Ye an idiot. Nay, ye'll have to wait another few years before ye can steal me seat. Naha told him, and both men chuckled. Even behind their jokes, Magnolia could hear the relief in the commander's voice, and it warmed her heart. 
Magnolia? Lord Winterbourne said quietly. We will be leaving soon. Elaine jerked up from her father's embrace to stare at Elaine. What? Nay. Ye just got back, Maggie. I can ye and Daddy had a silly fight, but ye have to stay. He loves ye, I heard him say so. Silence descended in the room, broken by an abrupt giggle from Betty, which she quickly covered by pretending to be coughing. Magnolia felt her cheeks warm. Elaine, please, that isn't. And Sir Spindrift is here, and all. Ye went away and left him. Ye can ye day such a thing if ye gonna be a responsible owner a pup. Dinna ye love your dog? Elaine asked, folding her arms. The seriousness in the child's face almost made Magnolia want to laugh too. Yes, I love my dog. She said. And you're right, I should not have left him. When I leave. Her voice caught, because the idea of leaving tore a hole in her heart, but she kept talking. I will take him with me this time. Elaine's frown deepened. And didn't ye love me? Magnolia blinked. Because ye can ye take me. I'm staying here we me daddy. I guess that means ye have to stay an all. William let out a low whistle, and Betty cleared her throat. Elaine. Magnolia started. Actually, Lord Winterbourne, I was hoping that, with your permission, Magnolia could stay for a wee bit. I'm likely nae gonna be moving for a while, and me bairn is gonna need someone to look after her. Naha said, skillfully posing the question to both Magnolia and the Earl at the same time. Is that so? Magnolia's father asked, raising an eyebrow. Oh, can she, Lord Grandar, please? Elaine asked eagerly. Lord Grandar? Magnolia asked, her lip twitching. Her father snorted and winked. Young maid Elaine tells me that my title is too difficult otherwise, and since I am old enough to be a grandfather, that is the nickname she came up with. That is me very polite, Elaine. Naha told her. Lord Winterbourne shook his head. Don't worry yourself, my lad. I rather like it. And yes, Elaine, Magnolia may stay a while to help your father. Call it a courtesy for all the trouble Peter Cole has caused. William grimaced. Are you sure I can just finish him off myself? He asked half-heartedly. The Earl laughed at that. I admit, it is tempting to hand him over to you. But no, sir. I must take him to face the Queen's justice. William looked disappointed but nodded. Aye, fair enough. Come, then, let me help you with the binding. I'll get some satisfaction with that, at least. I'll come, too, Betty said quickly. The three of them filed out of the room again, but before the door shut, Magnolia called out. Father? Hm? Lord Winterbourne asked, turning his head back. Is my cousin Mary really with child? Magnolia asked. She'd never been clear at this point, and now, with the matter of airship at the forefront of her mind, it was more important than ever. Oh! The Earl said, glancing first at Naha and then at Magnolia. I'm afraid not, dear. Sadly, she was mistaken. And with that, he left and closed the door behind him. The room was quiet. Then Elaine launched herself forward and into Magnolia's arms. Dinna ye ever leave again, ye hear me? She demanded. Magnolia held her tight as the little girl sobbed into her chest. Ye can ye ever go. Promise me. Magnolia hesitated, meeting eyes with Naya over Elaine's head. She wished it was so simple, she really did. But she and Naha would have to talk a lot, and there was still home to consider. More than ever now, with her remaining her father's only heir. I don't want to make you a promise I cannot keep, Elaine. She didn't want to break the child's heart. Not again. I promise I won't do anything without talking to you first. She said finally. How's that? 
Elaine pulled back and looked at her suspiciously. Well. She said. I guess that'll day. For the moment. For the moment. Magnolia agreed, hugging her tight. Her eyes met Naha's once more, and she gave him a small, tentative smile. I. Naha repeated softly. For the moment. At least, for now, we're together. Come what may, we'll always have this moment. Chapter 25 The Library Once More For a week or so, life almost returned to, well, not normal, but the normality Magnolia had grown used to in her time in Castle McFoyle. She played with Elaine, took the pups out on walks, ate lunch, and talked with Greta and Betty. She visited old Ewan and told him stories, and she learned more and more about the stories of the fair folk that Elaine loved so much from the village. Naha healed well, though the healers were more concerned about the wound on his head, than the actual damage done by the dagger. They kept him under observation, requiring that someone, usually Magnolia, went to check on him several times in the night, to make sure he hadn't slipped away in his sleep. The dagger wound, at least, heals well. No sepsis, no oozing. It would leave a large scar across his shoulder, to be sure, but it would be one among many. A testament to his bravery, really. At night, she spent a long time in Naha's room, tending to him. She never approached his bed, and they never actively spoke of what had come before, but they seemed to have developed a way of talking without talking. Can you fix me bandages? He'd ask and Magnolia would hear. Can you stay with me? The healer said you shouldn't move too much or keep the candles blazing all night. Magnolia would scold, and what she'd mean was, I'll never leave your side again. But neither of them could say these words, not out loud. Not yet. And so, they danced around the concept of the future, waiting for him to get better, waiting for a solution they knew might never arrive. And they talked. And they loved. And they hoped together in silence. Three full weeks since the failed attack upon the castle, Naha knew that time was running short to keep Magnolia by his side. His excuse had worked well, and she had acted the part faithfully, caring for Elaine and tending to his needs. But now he was healed, and Magnolia had started once again to talk about her duties. I can he just ask her to stay we nay guarantees. I can that. Which is why I hope this works the way I planned. William had helped him. As soon as Naha had informed him of his plan, the commander had been entirely on board. He enlisted Abby, Greta, and the maid Betty to help him. However, Naha gave unambiguous instructions on what he wanted them to fetch. The result was, in a word, perfect. When William handed it to Naha that morning, the laird had known for sure that he had his best friend's blessing. I didn't ken how much I needed it. She's a good lass. William told him. Even for an Englishwoman. Day what ye need today. So he had. He'd spent the morning in the library, trying to find the perfect solution, and he'd come across it. He just hoped she found it funnier than she did teasing. Naha found Magnolia out by the lock with Elaine, teaching her how to swim in the shallows of the lock. Betty was with him, and she smiled at the sight. I guess the wee maid's less likely to drown if she can keep herself afloat. She laughed. Hail, Magnolia. Magnolia looked up, and her eyes widened in surprise to see the lad and the maid. Oh, Betty. Naha. I wasn't expecting you. Elaine jumped out of the water, sopping wet and exhilarated. I did it, Daddy. She cheered as they approached. I can float. I can swim. Well, with a little help. Magnolia chuckled. What can we do for you? Betty laughed again. Well, as for me, I'm gonna take Elaine to dry off a bit, and then she and me are gonna go steal some of me mammy's sweetmeats. Ye should probably dry off too, Magnolia. She told her. Sweetmeats. Elaine crowed, 
forgetting all about the lock in her enthusiasm. The August sunshine beat down as Betty led her away, and left Magnolia dripping with lock water in her under things before Naha. This feels familiar. Magnolia chuckled, and Naha was charmed by how carefree her laugh sounded, with no sense of embarrassment at all. At least, this time, nobody was at threat. That's always a good thing. Naha told her, smirking. But dare you think you can go dry off and come meet me in the library? I've got something I'd like to show ye. Magnolia tilted her head. Well, all right then. She said curiously. See you there an hour hence? I'll be waiting. He promised. Naha was sitting at the table where they'd read together that night they'd first kissed, when Magnolia walked in. His heart started hammering immediately as he took her in. She was dressed simply, in a pale blue dress that made the color of her wide eyes shine. Her honey blonde hair, still damp, was pinned up on her head. She wore simple slip-on shoes and no stockings, clearly having hurried to get here. She's the most bonny thing I've ever seen. Come sit down. He said with a gentle smile. You look grand. Oh. She said, her eyes traveling up what he was wearing. She seemed surprised, and he didn't blame her. Naha rarely dressed so casually, in some simple trues, and a shirt that hung open at the lacing, but he had been in such a hurry today that dressing well had simply been an afterthought. Yes, all right. Magnolia took the seat directly next to him, and he saw a rose tint to her cheeks as she did. Was she thinking about that night, too? Did she long for it as much as he did? I thought we could read together. Naha said. Like we used to. She gave him a strange look, and he almost laughed, but he couldn't. That would give the game away. After a, every time we tried to read together before now, it ended up in our queen or kissing or. That thought trailed off as something deep and dark inside him let out a low, anticipatory growl. Hush, Naha. Nay yet. I picked ye out a book. He continued, gesturing at the table. Magnolia's gaze followed his hand, settling on his chest for just a second before looking at the book. Then she started to laugh loudly. A traveler's guide to Clan McFoyle? Really, Naha, you brought me here for a joke? She asked. She touched the book cover lightly. God above, it feels like years ago that I spirited this thing out of your library. I and me heart with it. He told her seriously. She looked at him, taken aback by the change in his tone, and he made himself sound as earnest as possible. When you kissed me that day, Magnolia, me heart was never the same. I, she started. The rose color had given way to a deep crimson flush, not just on her cheeks but disappearing down her chest and below the hem of her bodice. I think you will find that you kissed me. Oh I? He asked, moving a little closer. Because that isn't how I remember it. Well, I remember you getting rather upset with me. She replied, leaning forward too. Their faces were so near each other now that their breaths mingled in the air. I remember a very angry lad who simply did not know what to do with himself. I, he said again. And an earl's daughter we an impossible secret and nay idea what to do next. She nodded, and she was so close that he could hear her swallow. I know what I should do next, now. She whispered. And what's that? But her hand was already moving, gently, cautiously cupping his cheek to bring his face forward that extra inch. He went willingly, and their lips met again at last. It started gentle, but that only lasted moments as the wild hunger neither had ever been able to entirely repress once again leapt to the surface. She clambered off her chair and into his lap, her legs straddling his waist, and he wrapped his arms around her, pulling her closer, the heat between them more scalding than the sun in the sky. One hand raised a tangle in her hair, and she was already pulling at the lace of her bodice, already impatient for him. Wait! He said hoarsely when they came up for air. Wait, wait, Magnolia. We canny. 
She leaned back, one hand on her bodice, the other on his shoulder, and her expression was wary. What? But. Why not? She asked. I. Do you not, did I misunderstand? There was a slight note of panic in her voice. Nay. He said quickly. Nay, nay, I just. Magnolia, I brought ye here to read and I'd really like it if ye'd read the book I got ye. Magnolia's expression went still, then she tilted her head in that way she did when she was confused. Ask. Are you being serious, my lad? God Almighty above me, when she calls me that it's almost more than I can bear. Deadly. He confirmed. Ye didn't need to move. Between ye and myself, I'm quite comfortable wi ye and me a lap like this. He ran a finger down her spine to emphasize his point, enjoying the way it seemed to make her shiver. She gave him that strange look once more, then slowly reached down for the book. His eyes were drawn to her chest as her bodice fell open, but he forced them back up again. He needed to see her face. Is there a marker in these pages? Magnolia asked, holding it in both hands while he secured her in place by holding onto her waist. It feels rather heavy in the middle. I dinna ken. Naha replied a mite too innocently. Why dinna ye take a look? She opened the book to the middle and gasped. Naha. What is this? The way her eyes widened, the way her lips parted, and her skin flushed, was almost too much. The way she jumped in surprise made him sure he'd done the right thing, and the anticipation of victory had never tasted sweeter. It's called a Luckin Booth, he told her. Do ye ken what they are? Magnolia slowly picked up the brooch and laid the book on the table once more. It was about the size of a silver murk or maybe a little bigger, carefully cut in the shape of a heart. He'd considered gold, but he'd chosen silver in the end, enjoying the way it shone against Magnolia's preferred blue-toned clothing. It was relatively simple, without any of the embellishments that many people were using on their luck and booths these days. It was merely a heart entwined with another, with tiny letters engraved along the sides. Naha held his breath as Magnolia read it aloud in an adorable attempt at a Scottish accent. Nay borders can withhold between our minds, and hearts, and souls. She quoted. Her hands shook slightly, and then those impossibly blue eyes were staring into his once more. Naha. Magnolia? He answered in a low voice. His every nerve was on edge, waiting for her answer, needing to hear it from her lips. Ask. Are you asking me to marry you? Her voice was barely a whisper as though she was afraid talking too loudly would ruin it for everyone. I, he said. Will you be me wife, Magnolia? Will you be another mither for me daughter? Will you come and serve me people as Lady McFoyle? Magnolia didn't say anything for a long time. Too long. Am I wrong about you with this? Have I ruined it forever? Then, slowly, and with near flawless pronunciation, she said. Chanaran Duduin Sambith Syabisa Ianam Dudam Haste When he didn't respond straight away, she said. Did I say it correctly? I'm sure that's how you and taught me to say it. Nobody can serve two masters. The laird translated, staring at her in wonder. Katrina had been a wild fae creature the world could not contain, and here was Magnolia now, an angel from above come down to bless him with another chance. Are ye saying I? Ye'll wed me? Magnolia laughed, placing the brooch carefully down on top of the book on the desk. I am, I am, I am, I am. She threw her arms around his neck. It will be complicated, and there are many things I must consider, but do you know, I can't imagine any future where I do anything other than live it as your bride. He moved first this time, crushing his lips to her own, tasting success. Naha helped her remove her bodice as quickly as she could, then lifted her, her legs still wrapped around him, off his seat. They stumbled back a few steps, and then he perched her on the desk while he desperately ran his lips and tongue down her neck, her exposed breasts. 
she let out tiny mules of satisfaction at each flick of his tongue against her hard nipples, and when it got too much to bear, his mouth left her chest and shot straight back to her lips, his hands replacing them at work. He worked her breasts as she started to pull off his shirt, only letting up to help her with his arms and returning to it while she fiddled with his truce. He felt it when they fell to the floor, but he could barely even notice, feeling nothing but her skin against his skin, how her nails dug into his back and her legs wrapped around him, how he wanted nothing more than to lay her back and. But then her bare foot shot out and gently pressed against his chest. Oh, no, my lad. She said with a teasing smirk. No, no. She pushed slightly with her leg, and he tripped backward, stumbling back onto his chair. She slid off the desk, kneeling at his feet. Naha's heart started to hammer wildly as she stared up at him from between his legs, hunger and love and everything in between swimming in her eyes. If you are to be my lad, then I would learn to serve you equally. She whispered. She slowly, slowly ran her fingers up his thigh, kissing and nibbling lightly where her fingers had already brushed. God Almighty, this is what heaven feels like. Naha's breath sped up. This was something Magnolia had only done a few times before, he knew that, but she had proven a willing and exceptionally adept student. And it seemed that she remembered all of her lessons, as she cupped his lower region and held his member firmly with the other hand. Magnolia. He groaned while she lowered her lips gently over the tip. She started slowly, and then she began to move, a little more quickly, taking more and more of him her hands and her mouth working together as she took command of giving pleasure. He growled and tried to reach for her breasts, desperate to share some of this intensity with her, but she slapped his hands away, gentle but firm, then returned to her work. So instead, he gripped the side of his chair, watching as her head bobbed up and down, watching as she made his entire body sing. Magnolia! 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 The pins came loose and her hair tangled in his hands as he pulled her closer, needing more of her, all of her. He could feel the moment the rush began, and he knew there was no holding it back. Magnolia? He grunted. I'm, I. She didn't react, other than a muffled sound that may have been a laugh and just kept going, more and more until he could not stand it anymore. His heartbeat was erratic, and then suddenly, he could barely feel it at all. There was ringing in his ears as the pleasure started from his groin and shot up his spine and into his limbs, making everything tingle with satisfaction as the release came. Magnolia held him, making little sounds of her own pleasure as she witnessed his. Naha's head fell forward when he was done. When he blinked back to reality, Magnolia was still kneeling at his feet, an exceptionally pleased grin on her face. Well, my lad? She asked innocently. Did I serve you well? Naha stared at her, gathering his breath, then held out her hand. She took it, getting to her feet, and then he pulled her close to kiss her deeply. The thing is, me lady. He whispered in her ear after. If ye are to be my wife, we must operate as equals. Oh? She asked, sounding like someone anticipating the greatest gift they'd ever received before. And however shall we do such a thing, my lad? Well. He breathed. Ye can start by climbing up on that table and letting me return the favor. By the time I'm good and ready again, ye'll ken how much I love ye. She moved back just a little, and her eyes softened. And I love you too. She said. Forever. Then she turned and did exactly what she was told. It's me own turn to be led, now. Chapter 26 The Resolution Magnolia wrote to her father right away, her luck and booth pinned proudly on her breast. She told him the truth about everything, well, most things, at least, and assured him that she was working on a solution to the undeniable new problems. Because Magnolia Winterborn, Lady of Elphinstone, had many things binding her to her country and the crown. She was her father's only eligible heir, and more than that, she had served as a member of the Order of the Red Blossom for her entire adult life. And what a scandal my betrayal shall be, 
if word of my imminent betrothal is taken as a defection from my duties. This worried Magnolia greatly. As far as she was aware, the Viscount of Mitred was in custody, awaiting trial and judgment, but he was not the only man who thought how he did. If there were other members within the order, or even among the peerage, who took this as a slight, it could mean a war that no letter could prevent. She had expressed such to Naha, but he had simply smiled and told her that, if the price of her love was such, he was willing to pay it. She'd scolded him for such foolishness, of course, but they'd gotten somewhat distracted afterward. And you're sure your honours can get this letter to my father as quickly as possible? She asked William quietly that evening as they stood together in the entranceway to the castle. I, as certain as I am that I am about to have to start calling you me lady, Magnolia. William replied, with a nod at her brooch. A salutation's in order, then? Magnolia suspected he'd known all along. In fact, she quite thought he had been part of the scheme to commission the thing, while Naha was on his sickbed. Impulsively, she leaned forward and kissed his cheek. It was funny to see how astonished he looked when she drew back, and she gave a slight chuckle. Thank you. She told him. For a second chance. He considered her for a long, long moment, then nodded. I he said. Didn't he mess it up? And then he turned and was gone. Magnolia smiled to herself. She had more letters to write, now, in formal notes that she would send to her friends, before the official announcements were made. She'd write to Lady Taylor first, and thank her for the advice that had led Magnolia and Naha both to where they were today. She knew that Betty was meeting with her soldier sweetheart, Connor, late this evening. It may not be entirely proper, but Magnolia could hardly blame the girl. She would not betray her friend's secret, but she would give her some notes to let her friends in the village know everything. One for Greta and Bernie, one for someone to read to old Ewan. One for the Tavern family and their daughter. And one for Betty too, and the cook, thanking them for everything they'd done, both as servants and as friends. I have been so lucky. Beyond all belief. When she finally finished writing and located Betty, not yet telling her the news, waiting for her to later read her own note and discover everything, it was very late. And so she headed to bed. To her own bed, in her private room, to experience the quiet solitude of sleep. When she entered the room, she heard a little bark and was both surprised and pleased to see her little dog curled up on her bed. She didn't shove him off instead moving him over to cuddle him while she lay down. I'm staying, Sir Spindrift. She told him, as the dog curled contentedly in her arms. Come what may, I shall not leave again. And tomorrow, they would tell Elaine. Elaine was very surprised when Daddy and Magnolia insisted she skip her morning lesson and come for a walk in the gardens with them, but she was hardly going to complain. Today was a numbers day, and while Elaine was good at numbers, she also found them very dull sometimes. Magnolia came to fetch her as usual, and Elaine immediately noticed something bright and shiny pinned to her dark blue dress. That's lovely. She said. What is it? Magnolia touched the heart-shaped jewelry with a soft smile. It's a brooch, Elaine. She told her. Your daddy is waiting. Shall we go outside? Elaine chattered about her dreams the entire way down the staircase and to the grand entrance. Still, she really thought that Magnolia seemed distracted, which was strange. Usually, Magnolia was the best at listening to her, but the English woman seemed focused elsewhere today. And then I think I might turn into a dragon, just for fun. Elaine tested her. That sounds nice. Magnolia said vaguely as they traversed into the gardens. I kenned it. I kenned that you were only listening to me. Elaine accused. What's on your mind, Maggie? Ye have to tell me now, else I'll start to worry, and ye didn't want that. Magnolia glanced at her in surprise, then chuckled. No. She agreed. You're right. I don't. But can you wait just five moments more until we're with your father? Elaine nodded, 
but she watched Magnolia suspiciously. Wait. Magnolia isn't telling me she's leaving now, is she? Panicking, Elaine said very little for the rest of the walk. Maybe if she was very, very good, Maggie would stay. Naha was sitting on a blanket with some snacks and drinks before him, dressed very nicely but plainly. He stood when the girls approached, and only sat again when they did, as though they were at a fancy dinner. Would you like some cheese, Elaine? He asked. She shook her head. Nay, Daddy, Dini tease me. What's happening? Why day we need to talk? Magnolia and Daddy exchanged glances in that way that adults sometimes do. It made Elaine very uncomfortable. They're hiding something. Well, Magnolia said slowly. You know that I was only to stay here until your father recovered. And he's better now. Elaine bit her lip because she was about to start crying. I, she whispered. Well, I wanted to ask if it would bother you if I stayed a little longer. Or a lot longer? Magnolia asked her. Elaine blinked. Wait. What are you asking me? Daddy smiled. I've asked Magnolia to marry me, me we took. But we'll only day it we your blessing. Elaine shrieked and jumped to her feet. Ye gonna be wed? She demanded. Maggie's gonna be me new stepmommy? Both adults laughed at her excitement, but Elaine didn't care. Married. Maggie's gonna be me daddy's bride. I kenned mommy was listening when I asked for help. I'll take that as a yes. Magnolia teased. Elaine hurried forward, wrapping her arms around them both. I. She sobbed. I, I, I. We can be a proper family at last. I. Said Daddy. I, pet, we can. Always. Magnolia agreed. Epilogue. Magnolia's father's reply arrived promptly a week and a half after she had sent the letter, and not for the first time, Magnolia marveled at the efficiency of William's remarkable runners. Thank you. She told the commander earnestly. You have been a wonderful friend to me, even though I do not deserve it from you quite yet. I, well. William shrugged. I can ye really that bad. And you make Naha happy. His grey eyes crinkled into something light and friendly. The only other person to make me friend smile the way ye day was me late cousin. I'm glad that, if somebody has to step into her place, it's someone as kind-hearted as ye are. Before Magnolia could get over her surprise enough to answer that, he'd already left. She stared after him for a moment, then hurried upstairs to Naha's study, letter in hand. It's here. She called throwing open the door without knocking. He didn't have to ask what. Bring it here, then. He said, a little anxiously. And we'll read it together. Magnolia unfolded the letter and spread it out on the table. She smoothed the corner and began to read. My dearest and most obedient daughter. It has done your father's heart proud to receive your letter. I shall keep this reply brief as it seems I must needs plan for travel. In short, I have detailed the answers to your queries below. First, on the form of Viscount, Lord Peter Cole. Cole was tried by Her Majesty herself, in front of the entire order, and with testament from many of the soldiers who were present that day. Once his treachery and willingness to commit crimes were discovered and confirmed, Her Majesty declared him a traitor to the Crown and to the order. As you know, there is but one sorry sentence for such a crime. Magnolia paused, glancing up at Naha. He shrugged. Forgive me if it sounds cold, me love, but I can he feel sympathy at such a man's death. He'd have killed me, me ban, and a me people for the sake of power. Magnolia nodded and continued to read. Second, my sincere congratulations on your betrothal. It may not have been what I planned for you, my daughter, but I simply could not be prouder. 
Please inform Laird McFoyle that I know him to be a good man, and I entrust you to him with all my heart. Naha smiled gently at that but encouraged her to go on without comment. Third, and most importantly, you were quite correct in your prediction of the twofold issue of your service and your position in my line of succession. I have spoken to the Duke and the Marquis, and, with the Crown's blessed permission, you are to be honourably released from your duties with the Order. This is thanks for your service in apprehending a traitor to the country, and helping to prevent a war that could have been truly devastating. Magnolia's heart soared. She knew her father must have argued her case vigorously, and she had never felt such love for him as she did at this moment. He was a kind man, a good man, and she hoped every day she would do him proud. As to your suggestion about succession, I discussed this with all parties involved. The boy's mother is willing, and she shall be travelling with me north to attend your marriage ceremony. The Crown has given permission, with your signed document and the signature of the boy's father, it is binding. Therefore, your legal rights as godmother mean that John Levy, son of Elizabeth and John Levy, shall be my heir in your absence. Magnolia bit her lip. That was it, then. That was the last barrier. I'm free. She said, barely able to believe it. Free to wed you. Free to be in Scotland. Free to live life anew. I, me lady. Naha said. Your faither is a rarity among men. He's good and kind in a way that shines through ye, too. I'll always be thankful to him for ye. Magnolia leaned over and kissed him gently, then finished the letter. As a final note, prithee hold back your nuptials, until such time as your old lordly father and your friend Lizzie's family can make it all the way north. We shall set out to travel today, but though John Sr. may be a good rider, I imagine with a woman, an old man, and a child, it may not be as quick a journey as our last ride north. Stay safe, and keep with you my love. Pass it also to young Elaine, and to my new son, the Laird Macfoyle. Your loving and prideful father. Lord Daniel Winterbourne, Earl of Elphinstone. When she finished, Naha kissed her again, long and slow and passionate. We wait until your faith gets here, and nay a second longer. He told her. Because I canny wait until ye my wife good and proper. What a surprise, my lad. Magnolia laughed. Because I was just about to suggest something very, very similar. It was a beautiful wedding, and it passed in a happy blur for Magnolia, in her deep silver and blue dress that highlighted her hair and eyes. Naha standing by William, both clad in full McFoyle tartan smiled with pride as she approached. Across her chest, Magnolia wore the McFoyle sash that Naha's mother had worn during her own wedding. Her new luck and booth served as something new, while the pins in her hair were borrowed from Lizzie. Her dress itself, of course, was the blue. Elaine, taking the ribbon to be used for the handfasting and performing that particular ceremony herself. She was not yet five. So though she wound Naha and Magnolia's hands together fairly securely, she required help to twist it just perfectly for the tradition. Lord Winterbourne was happy to assist, once someone explained to him the tradition. The paid piper played his songs, and the men drank a dram to his health. After Magnolia and Naha had drunk from the quake, it was time for dancing. Magnolia had never danced like she did that night at the Cayley. She danced so much it felt like flight, and her feet barely touched the ground. She spun with her husband, stepped with William, and even performed a whirl with her brand new stepdaughter. At one point, she held the giggling baby John and danced him around the room, too. That night, she and Naha and Elaine all lay in the same big bed, Elaine cuddled up between them. They would postpone their wedding night, for now, in favor of this special moment as a family. Ya yeah, godson's real sweet. Elaine told Magnolia. I wouldn't mind a wee brother or sister, actually. Naha whispered in Magnolia's ear so that Elaine couldn't hear. Well, ye will need get one if ye keep crawling into our bed. Magnolia elbowed him with a light laugh and said. Well, we shall see what happens by the grace of God, my sweetheart. Anna Fay. 
Elaine said sleepily. Ye ken me mommy helped all this to happen. You and she would be friends, I ken it. Magnolia smiled and kissed her hair, and Naha hugged them both close. Me we family. He said. It's time to finally start living again. Aye. Elaine agreed. But first, can ye tell me a wee story? Magnolia put on a serious face. Once upon a time, there was a nanny, and a cheeky, clever little girl, and her big brave laird of a father. The nanny had a secret that she couldn't tell anyone, but the little girl knew better, and slowly, she began to get into her heart. Elaine started to giggle. Stop, stop. She said. I ken this one, I day. Oh I? Naha asked, raising an eyebrow. Day ye ken, I think I have any ever heard it. Is that right? Magnolia teased, while Elaine looked impatient. I, Naha said. I, I dinny ken it. Tell me, Elaine, if ye ken the story so well, how does it end? Elaine rolled her eyes, obviously exasperated. It ends the only way it can when people love each other the way we all day, obviously. She said. Adults are so silly. And how is that? Magnolia asked her with a soft smile. Well, isn't it obvious? Elaine demanded. Happily and safely, forever after. Naha and Magnolia snuggled closer, the little girl between them. Is that right? Naha asked. Well, I quite like that we end in. Yes, me too. Magnolia agreed. And I swear to you, Elaine, I will do everything in my power for the rest of my life to make it come true. The end? Extended epilogue. The forever after. Maggie? Elaine called, brushing her red hair back from her face. Could ye please come and fetch the bairns before I sell them to the Fay? Magnolia laughed, approaching her stepdaughter as quickly as her swollen belly allowed. At three and ten, Elaine was turning into quite the little lady in her own right, and she simply had no patience for the antics of her younger siblings. The twins were seven years old, born a few years after Magnolia and Naha were wed, and they were quite the surprise after the sweet child Elaine had been. They were not identical, Nora, named for Magnolia's mother, looked just like Magnolia. Katie, full name Katrina, looked more like Naha and Elaine, but with her mother's blue eyes. And they were both wild. Maggie? Elaine warned. Magnolia honestly thought it was very sweet that the girl had never given up on that childhood nickname. They discussed Elaine calling her mommy, or even something like mammy, but it had felt wrong to them both. We just want to play. Katie argued. Elaine's our big sister, she's supposed to play we us. Aye. Nora hadded. Elaine should learn to share. Isn't it that what you're always telling us, mommy? Magnolia chuckled. You two are trouble. Leave your poor sister alone. She's trying to embroider, and she does not want you messing with her design again. Your father will be here soon, and I think Elaine wishes to finish her needlework first. Exactly. Elaine told them proudly. Our faith akens what a successful lady I'm gonna be. I need to be able to day a woman's accomplishments and the work of the lad. Nora stuck out her tongue. Unless the baby's a laddie. She teased. Katie's eyes sparkled. Aye. Then we'll have a wee brother, and you will need be the lady at all. And then you'll have to play with us at the time. A look of anger crossed Elaine's face, but before it could erupt, Magnolia intervened. Now, now. She said. That's quite enough. Your father. As if her words had summoned him, Naha was suddenly strolling around the corner to where they sat outside. Did I hear me name? He asked as he approached. He put his arms around his wife and kissed her lightly, while the twins made disgusted sick noises. Och, just cause you're too immature to understand love. Elaine scoffed. Magnolia bit her lip, trying not to laugh, 
and gave Naha a helpless look of amusement. Naha winked at her out of sight of the children and turned to the three girls. Are we bickering again, lassies? That isn't what your poor daddy wants to hear, when he's traveled the way back from Laird Taylor's lands alone. William wasn't with you? Magnolia asked, surprised, and a little concerned. As far as she'd known, the commander had accompanied her husband for the whole journey. Did something go wrong? Nay, nay. He assured her, one hand lightly on her waist. William was wee me all right, until we met an old soldier of ours in one of the taverns. He told me to go ahead, and he'd catch up. That was about a day and a half ago. Magnolia chuckled ruefully. Oh, dear. Abby's going to give him such a scalping when he gets back. Naha laughed, kissing her cheek again. Och, ye ken what it does to me when ye use Scots brogue like that, me love. Daddy, we're standing right here. Elaine told him, looking a little queasy. Please save ye flirtations till year in private. It is ne proper. Katie put her hands on her hips, and said in what was clearly a mockery of her older sister's voice. Och, but Elaine, just cause ye're too immature to understand love. Elaine glared at her while Nora giggled. Naha smiled at their antics, then focused on Magnolia once more. His hand moved from her waist to her belly, caressing it worshipfully. Magnolia couldn't help but smile. He had treated every moment of this pregnancy as though it was the very first, just as he had for the twins. And how are ye, Lady McFoyle? Any aches? Any pains? He asked. It was incredibly heartwarming to Magnolia how young he looked when he worried. All the hardy lairdliness seemed to melt away, leaving concern and love and nothing else behind. None. Magnolia told him, touching his hand gently. I told you, I would have sent one of William's runners if anything had happened too early. He's paranoid because of the twins coming early, no matter how often I tell him it was expected. And if he didn't he reach me on time? Nah harassed her, genuine anxiety in his voice. What if I missed the birth of me bairn? Things are different now, Daddy. Elaine told him gently, her previous anger forgotten. Maggie isn't gonna die like me mommy did. After her, the twins got here fine. In fact, we can get rid of them. Naha turned to hug his daughter. Of course you're right. He said, though Magnolia could still hear the worry in his tone. Well, you're here now, my darling. She told him gently. And I don't think the bairn is due until around when Betty and Connor will have their own. Naha nodded. I, of course. Of course. Elaine, why didn't ye take your sisters inside? It's nearly time for supper. But Daddy, I'm trying to. Elaine started to protest, but one look at his face changed her mind. She sighed, handing her project to Magnolia. Fine. She huffed. Wait, first. Daddy, am we gonna get a wee brother? Nora asked. I didn't want a wee sister. Elaine says we sisters are right annoying. I'm your wee sister. Katie protested. Am I real annoying? I. Elaine said dryly, but there was a smile on her face as she said it. Come on, ye wee troublemakers. Let's get inside before Cook has me heed. She took one sister in each hand and led them off leaving Magnolia and Naha alone. Naha waited a few moments, then took Magnolia's hand. Together, they walked in a seemingly aimless direction, but Magnolia knew where they'd end up. At the fountain. At the statue of the Gilly Do, where we knew for sure how we felt, though not how to proceed. Is she? Naha asked as they strolled through the grass. Is she what? Magnolia returned in an innocent tone. As though she didn't know what he was asking. Is Noro Goni have a wee brother? He responded, then made a face at her when he realized she'd been teasing. Magnolia laughed. Oh, Naha, how in the world am I supposed to know that already? 
It will be two months or more before the baby arrives. Dinny give me that. Naha protested. I can you women have your ways. Some muttering over a bucket of water or a toss in a an apple peel. You're a strange sort. The lady shoved at his arm. Don't tease me, husband. You know I put little stock in those kinds of folk traditions. I? Nah harassed with a smirk as they approached the fountain. He helped her to sit and said. So ye have any done any of them? I would never even have such an idea. Magnolia told him with false dignity as he took a seat next to her. True, maybe. Naha said. But your friend Greta Reed holds great stock by such things. Are you trying to tell me she hastily tempted ye even once? Magnolia considered dragging it out a little longer, then she shrugged. Well, all right, I'll admit it then. She did her apple test. She pleaded with me to let her, and I couldn't say no. An? Naha asked anxiously. What are we having? Naha. Magnolia protested. You're not telling me you believe such things? He grinned. Day I? She was right about the twins, wasn't she? Magnolia rolled her eyes. Oh, fine. She says I am to have another girl. Is that what you wish to hear? Naha stared at her for a moment, then shrugged, touching the water lightly with his hands. Ok. Well, who cares if she's right? Like he said, it's only superstition. Magnolia tilted her head. You'll be disappointed with another girl? She asked. The laird hesitated, choosing his words carefully. It is me that, me love. He told her. I love our three lassies to the moon and back, more than any man has ever loved a daughter. Except maybe your faith, uh, I'll allow. Magnolia smiled. She still loved how well her father and Naha had become friends, even exchanging correspondence themselves without any input from her. Indeed. But. She prompted. But. Naha sighed. If I didn't have a son, Klein McFoyle will likely pass out of the Irvin name. Elaine will be a good lady, talented and fair, but her bairns will bear the name of her husband. Magnolia nodded with a little frown. I remember the same used to concern my father. It was less of a worry for us, of course, the Winterborns have enough power that any man below me in rank would have taken my name. But a clan laird, that's a different thing. I. Naha said. I. They sat in silence for a few minutes, both lost in their own thoughts, then Naha shrugged. Ok, I'd have probably been disappointed no matter which way ye answered. He admitted. What do you mean? Magnolia asked, leaning against his shoulder. Well, most faithers want a son. He told her. But if ye'd have told me it's gonna be a lad, I'd have been sad for poor Elaine. She's worked so hard her whole life. It doesn't seem fair that her sex should change anything. Magnolia sighed. I agree, my love, but it is how it is. Elaine is more than aware that a little brother would change her future forever. Naha nodded. I, and so are Katie and Nora, apparently. I hope they didn't tease her too much. Oh, they're good girls really, all three of them. They'll survive and adapt, no matter what. Magnolia mused. Just like their father does. I, and their mother. Naha told her lifting her hand to his mouth and pressing his lips to the back of it. The most adaptable of all, the proper English earl's daughter who became the lady of a Scottish clan. Many things change. Magnolia agreed. But our family will always stay the same. Nay borders, just like my luck and booth says. Naha smiled at her warmly in a way that still made her heart flutter after all these years. He let go of her hand and put his arm around her shoulder instead, pulling her close into an embrace. She contentedly rested her head on his shoulder. If it is a boy, what should we call him? Daniel. Naha said instantly. 
If it was nay for your faith, none of us would be here. Magnolia felt her eyes well with happy tears, and her heart swelled with love for this man and how quickly he spoke. He honored her, honored her family, without even thinking about it. That is why we work so well. We complete each other but never overshadow. Anna girl? Naha asked her. We're running out of honor names. He teased. She smiled softly. We could still name her for your mother. Or, well, this might be silly. Eh? He prompted. Let me hear it anyway. Magnolia thought back to all those years ago, when she'd first traveled here. She thought of the little purple blossoms she'd seen on the fields, and the wild way they grew across the hills and valleys. She thought of the pixies that Elaine loved so much, and the wild stories she told of them for years. She thought of how her children were born of two worlds. How her love for Naha had grown from next to nothing. And she knew that if she had another daughter, she'd have a name to represent all of that. The country she loved, and its beauty and welcome, and how she and Naha had both grown. Well, she told him. If it's another girl, I was thinking. Heather. Heather. Naha repeated. He pressed his lips to her forehead. Or Daniel. Whichever Ben comes out, we'll be ready. And we'll love them all the same, with all of our hearts. Magnolia told him. I. Naha agreed. We're good at that part. Love. Dinny ye think so? Magnolia smiled. She looked out towards the setting sun, thinking of her stepdaughter and her twins, her friends, her godson, her father. And her husband, secure and warm and here. Aye. She said. Aye. The end. If you like our channel, please subscribe and make sure to click on the bell icon, so that you won't miss any future audiobooks we'll upload for free each week on YouTube.